Section 1 of Part 1 of Volume 1A of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1A, Part 1, Section 1. The Life of David Hume, Esquire, written by himself. My Own Life. It is difficult for a man to speak long of himself without vanity. Therefore I shall be short. It may be thought an instance of vanity that I pretend at all to write my life but this narrative shall contain little more than the history of my writings, as, indeed, almost all of my life has been spent in literary pursuits and occupations. The first success of most of my writings was not such as to be an object of vanity. I was born the 26th of April, 1711, Old Style, at Edinburgh. I was a good family, both by my father and mother, my father's family is a branch of the earls of Home, or Hume, and my ancestors have been proprietors of the estate which my brother possesses for several generations. My mother was daughter of Sir David Falconer, president of the College of Justice. The title of Lord Hallerkin came by succession to her brother. My family, however, was not rich, and being myself a younger brother, my patrimony, according to the mode of my country, was of course very slender. My father, who passed for a man of parts, died when I was an infant, leaving me with an elder brother and a sister, under the care of our mother, a woman of singular merit, who, though young and handsome, devoted herself entirely to the rearing and educating of her children. I passed through the ordinary course of education with success, and was seized very early with a passion for literature, which has been the ruling passion of my life, and the great source of my enjoyments. My studious disposition, my sobriety, and my industry gave my family a notion that the law was a proper profession for me, but I found an insurmountable aversion to everything but the pursuits of philosophy and general learning. And while they fancied I was poring over Boet and Vinius, Cicero and Virgil were the authors which I was secretly devouring. My very slender fortune, however, being unsuitable to this plan of life, and my health being a little broken by my ardent application, I was tempted, or rather forced, to make a very feeble trial for entering into a more active scene of life. In 1734 I went to Bristol, with some recommendations to several eminent merchants, but in a few months found that scene totally unsuitable to me. I went over to France with a view of prosecuting my studies in a country retreat, and I there laid that plan of life which I have steadily and successfully pursued. I resolved to make a very rigid frugality supply my deficiency of fortune, to maintain unimpaired my independency, to regard every object as contemptible except the improvement of my talents in literature. During my retreat in France, first at Reims, but chiefly at La Fleche in Anjou, I composed my Treatise of Human Nature. After passing three years very agreeably in that country, I came over to London in 1737. In the end of 1738, I published my treatise, and immediately went down to my mother and my brother, who lived at his country house, and was employing himself very judiciously and successfully in the improvement of his fortune. Never literary attempt was more unfortunate than my treatise of human nature. It fell dead-born from the press, without reaching such distinction as even to excite a murmur among the zealots. But being naturally of a cheerful and sanguine temper, I very soon recovered the blow, and prosecuted with great ardor my studies in the country. In 1742, I printed at Edinburgh the first part of my essays. The work was favorably received and soon made me entirely forget my former disappointment. I continued with my mother and brother in the country, and in that time recovered the knowledge of the Greek language, 
which I had too much neglected in my early youth. In 1745, I received a letter from the Marquis of Annandale, inviting me to come and live with him in England. I found also that the friends and family of that young nobleman were desirous of putting him under my care and direction, for the state of his mind and health required it. I lived with him a twelve-month. My appointments during that time made a considerable accession to my small fortune. I then received an invitation from General St. Clair to attend him as a secretary to his expedition, which was at first meant against Canada, but ended in an incursion on the coast of France. Next year to wit, 1747, I received an invitation from the general to attend him in the same station in his military embassy to the courts of Vienna and Turin. I then wore the uniform of an officer and was introduced at these courts as aide-de-camp to the general, along with Sir Harry Erskine and Captain Grant, now General Grant. These two years were almost the only interruptions which my studies have received during the course of my life. I passed them agreeably and in good company, and my appointments with my frugality had made me reach a fortune which I called independent, though most of my friends were inclined to smile when I said so. In short, I was now master of near a thousand pounds. I had always entertained a notion that my want of success in publishing the treatise of human nature had proceeded more from the manner than the matter and that I had been guilty of a very usual indiscretion in going to press too early. I therefore cast the first part of that work anew in the Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, which was published while I was at Turin. But this piece was at first little more successful than the Treatise of Human Nature. On my return from Italy, I had the mortification to find all England in a ferment on account of Dr. Middleton's free inquiry, while my performance was entirely overlooked and neglected. A new edition, which had been published at London, of my essays, Moral and Political, met not with a much better reception. Such is the force of natural temper, that these disappointments made little or no impression on me. I went down in 1749, and lived two years with my brother at his country house, for my mother was now dead. I there composed the second part of my essay, which I called Political Discourses, and also my inquiry concerning the principle of morals, which is another part of my treatise, which I cast anew. Meanwhile, my bookseller, A. Miller, informed me that my former publications, all but the unfortunate treatise, were beginning to be the subject of conversation that the sale of them was gradually increasing, and that new editions were demanded. Answers by reverends and right reverends came out two or three in a year, and I found by Dr. Warburton's railing that the books were beginning to be esteemed in good company. However, I had fixed a resolution, which I inflexibly maintained, never to reply to anybody, and not being very irascible in my temper, I have easily kept myself clear of all literary squabbles. These symptoms of a rising reputation gave me encouragement, as I was ever more disposed to see the favorable than unfavorable side of things, a turn of mind which is more happy to possess than to be born to an estate of ten thousand a year. In 1751 I removed from the country to the town, the true scene for a man of letters. In 1752 were published at Edinburgh, where I then lived, my political discourses, the only work of mine that was successful on first publication. It was well received at home and abroad. In the same year was published at London my inquiry concerning the principle of morals, which in my own opinion, who ought not to judge on that subject, is, of all my writings, historical, philosophical, or literary, incomparably the best. It came unnoticed and unobserved into the world. In 1752, the Faculty of Advocates chose me their librarian, an office from which I received little or no emolument, but which gave me the command of a large library. 
I then formed the plan of writing the history of England, but being frightened with the notion of continuing a narrative through a period of seventeen hundred years, I commenced with the accession of the House of Stuart, an epoch when, I thought, the misrepresentations of faction began chiefly to take place. I was, I own, sanguine in my expectations of the success of this work. I thought that I was the only historian that had at once neglected the present power, interest, and authority, and the cry of popular prejudices, and as the subject was suited to every capacity, I expected proportional applause. But miserable was my disappointment. I was assailed by one cry of reproach, disapprobation, and even detestation. English, Scotch, and Irish, Whig and Tory, churchman and secretary, free thinker and religionist, patriot and courtier, united in their rage against the man who had presumed to shed a generous tear for the fate of Charles I and the Earl of Stratford. And after the first ebullitions of their fury were over, what was still more mortifying, the book seemed to sink into oblivion. Mr. Miller told me that in a twelvemonth he sold only forty-five copies of it. I scarcely, indeed, heard of one man in three kingdoms, considerable for rank or letters, that could endure the book. I must only accept the primate of England, Dr. Herring, and the primate of Ireland, Dr. Stone, which seemed two odd exceptions. These dignified prelates separately sent me messages not to be discouraged. I was, however, I confess, discouraged, and had not the war been at that time breaking out between France and England, I had certainly retired to some provincial town of the former kingdom, have changed my name, and never more have returned to my native country. But as this scheme was not now practicable, and the subsequent volume was considerably advanced, I resolved to pick up courage and to persevere. In this interval, I published at London my natural history of religion, along with some other small pieces. Its public entry was rather obscure, except only that Dr. Hurd wrote a pamphlet against it, with all the illiberal petulance, arrogance, and scurrility which distinguished the Warburton school. This pamphlet gave me some consolation for the otherwise indifferent reception of my performance. In 1756, two years after the fall of the first volume, was published the second volume of my history, containing the period from the death of Charles I till the Revolution. This performance happened to give less displeasure to the Whigs and was better received. It not only rose itself, but helped buoy up its unfortunate brother. But though I had been taught by experience that the Whig party were in possession of bestowing all places both in the state and in literature, I was so little inclined to yield to their senseless clamor that in above a hundred alterations which further study, reading, or reflection engaged me to make in the reigns of the two first Stuarts, I have made all of them invariably to the Tory side. It is ridiculous to consider the English constitution before that period as a regular plan of liberty. In 1759, I published my history of the House of Tudor. The clamor against this performance was almost equal to that against the history of the two first Stuarts. The reign of Elizabeth was particularly obnoxious, but I was now callous against the impressions of public folly and continued very peaceably and contentedly in my retreat at Edinburgh to finish in two volumes the more early part of the English history, which I gave to the public in 1761, with tolerable, and but tolerable, success. But notwithstanding this variety of winds and seasons to which my writings had been exposed, they had still been making such advances that the copy money given me by the booksellers much exceeded anything formerly known in England. I was become not only independent, but opulent. I retired to my native country of Scotland, and determined never more to set my foot out of it, and retaining the satisfaction of never having preferred a request to one great man, or even making advances of friendship to any of them. As I was now turned fifty, 
I thought of passing all the rest of my life in this philosophical manner, when I received in 1763 an invitation from the Earl of Hertford, with whom I was not in the least acquainted, to attend him on his embassy to Paris, with a near prospect of being appointed secretary to the embassy, and in the meanwhile of performing the functions of that office. This offer, however inviting, I at first declined, both because I was reluctant to begin connections with the great, and because I was afraid that the civilities and gay company of Paris would prove disagreeable to a person of my age and humor. But on his lordship's repeating the invitation, I accepted of it. I have every reason, both of pleasure and interest, to think myself happy in my connections with that nobleman, as well as afterwards with his brother, General Conway. Those who have not seen the strange effects of modes will never imagine the reception I met with at Paris, from men and women of all ranks and stations. The more I resiled from their excessive civilities, the more I was loaded with them. There is, however, a real satisfaction in living at Paris, from the great number of sensible, knowing, and polite company with which that city abounds above all places in the universe. I thought once of settling there for life. I was appointed secretary to the embassy, and in the summer of 1765, Lord Hertford left me, being appointed Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. I was charged affairs till the arrival of the Duke of Richmond towards the end of the year. In the beginning of 1766, I left Paris, and next summer went to Edinburgh, with the same view as formerly of burying myself in a philosophical retreat. I returned to that place, not richer, but with much more money and a much larger income by means of Lord Hertford's friendship than I left it, and I was desirous of trying what superfluity could produce, as I had formerly made an experiment of a competency. But in 1767 I received from Mr. Conway an invitation to be under secretary, and this invitation, both the character of the person and my connections with Lord Hertford, prevented me from declining. I returned to Edinburgh in 1769, very opulent, for I possessed a revenue of one thousand pounds a year, healthy, and though somewhat stricken in years, with the prospect of enjoying long my ease, and of seeing the increase of my reputation. In the spring 1775 I was struck with a disorder in my bowels, which at first gave me no alarm, but has since, as I apprehend it, become mortal and incurable. I now reckon upon a speedy dissolution. I have suffered very little pain from my disorder, and what is more strange, have, notwithstanding the great decline of my person, never suffered a moment's abatement of my spirits, insomuch that, were I to name a period of my life which I should most choose to pass over again, I might be tempted to point to this latter period. I possess the same ardor as ever in study, the same gaiety in company, I consider, besides, that a man of sixty-five, by dying, cuts off only a few years of infirmities, and though I see many symptoms of my literary reputations breaking out at last with additional luster, I know that I could have but few years to enjoy it. It is difficult to be more detached from life than I am at present. To conclude historically with my own character, I am, or rather was, for that is the style I must now use in speaking of myself, which emboldens me the more to speak my sentiments. I was, I say, a man of mild disposition, of command of temper, of an open, social, and cheerful humor, capable of attachment, but little susceptible to enmity, and of great moderation in all my passions. Even my love of literary fame, my ruling passion, never soured my temper, notwithstanding my frequent disappointments. My company was not unacceptable to the young and careless, as well as to the studious and literary. And as I took a particular pleasure in the company of modest women, I had no reason to be displeased with the reception I met with from them. In a word, though most men, any wise eminent, have found reason to complain of calumny, I never was touched or even attacked by her baleful tooth, and though I wantonly 
expose myself to the rage of both civil and religious factions, they seem to be disarmed in my behalf of their wanted fury. My friends never had occasion to vindicate any one circumstance of my character and conduct, not but that the zealots, we may well suppose, would have been glad to invent and propagate any story to my disadvantage, but they could never find any which they thought would wear the face of probability. I cannot say there is no vanity in making this funeral oration of myself, but I hope it is not a misplaced one, and this is a matter of fact which is easily cleared and ascertained. April 18, 1776 End of section 1 Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington Section 2 of Part 1 of Volume 1A of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1A, Part 1, Section 2. Letter from Adam Smith, LL. Period, D. Period, to William Strawn, Esquire. Kirkcaldy, Fifeshire, November 9, 1778. Dear Sir, It is with a real, though a very melancholy pleasure, that I sit down to give you some account of the behavior of our late excellent friend, Mr. Hume, during his last illness. Though in his own judgment his disease was mortal and incurable, yet he allowed himself to be prevailed upon by the entreaty of his friends to try what might be the effects of a long journey. A few days before he set out, he wrote that account of his own life which, together with his other papers, he has left to your care. My account, therefore, shall begin where his ends. He set out for London towards the end of April, and at Morpeth met Mr. John Home and myself, who had both come down from London on the purpose of seeing him, expecting to have found him at Edinburgh. Mr. Home returned with him, and attended him during the whole of his stay in England, with that care and attention which might be expected from a temper so perfectly friendly and affectionate. As I had written to my mother that she might expect me in Scotland, I was under the necessity of continuing my journey. His disease seemed to yield to exercise and change of air, and when he arrived in London he was apparently in much better health than when he left Edinburgh. He was advised to go to Bath to drink the waters, which appeared for some time to have so good an effect upon him that even he himself began to entertain what he was not apt to do, a better opinion of his own health. His symptoms, however, soon returned with their usual violence, and from that moment he gave up all thoughts of recovery, but submitted with the utmost cheerfulness and the most perfect complacency and resignation. Upon his return to Edinburgh, though he found himself much weaker, yet his cheerfulness never abated, and he continued to divert himself, as usual, with correcting his own works for a new edition, with reading books of amusement, with the conversation of his friends, and sometimes in the evening with a party at his favorite game of whist. His cheerfulness was so great, and his conversation and amusements ran so much in their usual strain, that, notwithstanding all bad symptoms, many people could not believe he was dying. I should tell your friend, Colonel Edmondstone, said Dr. Dundas to him one day, that I left you much better and in a fair way of recovery. Doctor, said he, as I believe you would not choose to tell anything but the truth, you had better tell him that I am dying as fast as my enemies, if I had of any, could wish, and as easily and cheerfully as my best friends could desire. Colonel Edmondston soon afterward came to see him and to take leave of him, and on his way home he could not forbear writing him a letter bidding him once more an eternal adieu, and applying to him 
as to a dying man the beautiful French verses in which the Abbe Chaloux, in expectation of his own death, laments his approaching separation from his friend the Marquis de la Farre. Mr. Hume's magnanimity and firmness were such that his most affectionate friends knew that they hazarded nothing in talking or writing to him as to a dying man, and that so far from being hurt by this frankness, he was rather pleased and flattered by it. I happened to come into his room while he was reading this letter, which he had just received, and which he immediately showed to me. I told him that though I was sensible how very much he was weakened, and that appearances were in many respects very bad, yet his cheerfulness was still so great, the spirit of life seemed still to be so strong in him, that I could not help entertaining some faint hopes. He answered, Your hopes are groundless. An habitual diarrhea of more than a year's standing would be a very bad disease at any age. At my age it is a mortal one. When I lie down in the evening, I feel myself weaker than when I arose in the morning, and when I rise in the morning, weaker than when I lay down in the evening. I am sensible, besides, that some of my vital parts are affected, so that I must soon die. Well, said I, if it must be so, you have at least the satisfaction of leaving all your friends, your brother's family in particular, in great prosperity. He said that he felt that satisfaction so sensibly that when he was reading a few days before Lucian's Dialogues of the Dead, among all the excuses which are alleged to Charon for not entering readily into his boat, he could not find one that fitted him. He had no house to finish, he had no daughter to provide for, he had no enemies upon whom he wished to revenge himself. I could not well imagine, said he, what excuse I could make to Charon in order to obtain a little delay. I have done everything of consequence which I ever meant to do, and I could at no time expect to leave my relations and friends in a better situation than that in which I am now likely to leave them. I therefore have all reason to die contented. He then diverted himself with inventing several jocular excuses, which he supposed he might make to Charon, and with imagining the very surly answers which it might suit the character of Charon to return to them. Upon further consideration, said he, I thought I might say to him, Good Charon, I have been correcting my works for a new edition. Allow me a little time that I may see how the public receives the alterations. But Sharon would answer, When you have seen the effects of these, you will be making other alterations. There will be no end to such excuses. So, honest friend, please step into the boat. But I might still urge, Have a little patience, good Sharon. I have been endeavoring to open the eyes of the public. If I live a few years longer, I may have the satisfaction of seeing the downfall of some of the prevailing systems of superstition. But Sharon would then lose all temper and decency. You loitering rogue, that will not happen these many hundred years. Do you fancy I will grant you a lease for so long a term? Get into the boat this instant, you lazy loitering rogue. But though Mr. Hume always talked of his approaching dissolution with great cheerfulness, he never affected to make any parade of his magnanimity. He never mentioned the subject, but when the conversation naturally led to it, and never dwelt longer upon it than the course of the conversation happened to require. It was a subject, indeed, which occurred pretty frequently in the consequence of the inquiries of his friends, who came to see him, naturally made concerning the state of his health. The conversation which I have mentioned above and which passed on Thursday the 8th of August, was the last, except one, that I ever had with him. He had now become so weak that the company of his most intimate friends fatigued him, for his cheerfulness was still so great, his complacence and social disposition were still so entire, that when any friend was with him, he could not help talking more and with greater exertion than suited the weakness of his body. At his own desire, therefore, I agreed to leave Edinburgh, where I was staying partly upon his account, and returned to my mother's house here at Kirkcaldy, upon condition that he would send for me whenever he wished to see me, 
the physician who saw him most frequently dr black undertaking in the meantime to write me occasionally an account of the state of his health on the twenty second of august the doctor wrote me the following letter since my last mr hume has passed his time pretty easily but is much weaker he sits up goes downstairs once a day and amuses himself with reading but seldom sees anybody he finds that even the conversation of his most intimate friends fatigues and oppresses him and it is happy that he does not need it for he is quite free from anxiety impatient or low spirits and passes his time very well with the assistance of amusing books i received the day after a letter from mr hume himself of which the following is an extract edinburgh twenty third august seventeen seventy six my dearest friend i am obliged to make use of my nephew's hand in writing to you as i do not rise to-day i go very fast to decline and last night had a small fever which i hoped might put a quicker period to this tedious illness but unluckily it has in a great measure gone off i cannot submit to your coming over here on my account as it is possible for me to see you so small a part of the day but dr black can better inform you concerning the degree of strength which may from time to time remain with me adieu etc three days after i received the following letter from dr black edinburgh monday twenty sixth august seventeen seventy six dear sir yesterday about four o'clock afternoon mr hume expired the near approach of his death became evident in the night between thursday and friday when his disease became excessive and soon weakened him so much that he could no longer rise out of his bed he continued to the last perfectly sensible and free from much pain or feelings of distress he never dropped the smallest expression of impatience but when he had occasion to speak to the people about him always did it with affection and tenderness i thought it improper to write to bring you over especially as i had heard that he had dictated a letter to you desiring you not to come when he became very weak it cost him an effort to speak and he died in such a happy composure of mind that nothing could exceed it thus died our most excellent and never to be gotten friend concerning whose philosophical opinions men will no doubt judge variously every one approving or condemning them according as they happen to coincide or disagree with his own but concerning whose character and conduct there can scarce be a difference of opinion his temper indeed seemed to be more happily balanced if i may be allowed such an expression than perhaps any other man i have ever known even in the lowest state of his fortune his great and necessary frugality never hindered him from exercising upon proper occasions acts both of charity and generosity it was a frugality founded not upon avarice but upon the love of independency the extreme gentleness of his nature never weakened either the firmness of his mind or the steadiness of his resolutions his constant pleasantry was the genuine effusion of good nature and good humour tempered with delicacy and modesty and without even the slightest tincture of malignity so frequently the disagreeable source of what is called wit in other men it never was the meaning of his raillery to mortify and therefore far from offending it seldom failed to please and delight even those who were the objects of it to his friends who were frequently the objects of it there was not perhaps any one of all his great and amiable qualities which contributed more to endear his conversation and that gaiety of temper so agreeable in society but which is so often accompanied with frivolous and superficial qualities was in him certainly attended with the most severe application the most extensive learning the greatest depth of thought and a capacity in every respect the most comprehensive upon the whole i have always considered him both in his lifetime and since his death as approaching as nearly to the idea of a perfectly wise and virtuous man as perhaps the nature of human frailty will permit i ever am dear sir most affectionately yours adam smith 
End of section two. Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington. Section three of part one of volume one A of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of sixteen eighty eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1A, Section 3. Chapter 1. The Britons. The curiosity entertained by all civilized nations of inquiring into the exploits and adventures of their ancestors commonly excites a regret that the history of remote ages should always be so much involved in obscurity, uncertainty, and contradiction. Ingenious men possessed of leisure are apt to push their researches beyond the period in which literary monuments are framed or preserved, without reflecting that the history of past events is immediately lost or disfigured when entrusted to memory and oral tradition, and that the adventures of barbarous nations, even if they were recorded, could afford little or no entertainment to men born in a more cultivated age. The convulsions of a civilized state usually compose the most instructive and most interesting part of its history. But the sudden, violent, and unprepared revolutions incident to barbarians are so much guided by caprice and terminate so often in cruelty that they disgust us by the uniformity of their appearance. And it is rather fortunate for letters that they are buried in silence and oblivion. The only certain means by which nations can indulge their curiosity in researches concerning their remote origin is to consider the language, manners, and customs of their ancestors, and to compare them with those of the neighboring nations. The fables which are commonly employed to supply the place of true history ought entirely to be disregarded or if any exception be admitted to this general rule, it can only be in favour of the ancient Grecian fictions, which are so celebrated and so agreeable, that they will ever be the objects of the attention of mankind. Neglecting, therefore, all traditions, or rather tales concerning the more early history of Britain, we shall only consider the state of the inhabitants as it appears to the Romans on their invasion of this country. We shall briefly run over the events which attended the conquest made by that empire, as belonging more to Roman than British story. We shall hasten through the obscure and uninteresting period of Saxon annals, and shall reserve a more full narration for those times when the truth is both so well ascertained and so complete as to promise entertainment and instruction to the reader. All Greek writers agree in representing the first inhabitants of Britain as a tribe of the Gauls, or Celte, who peopled that island from the neighboring continent. Their language was the same, their manners, their government, their superstition, varied only by those small differences which time or a communication with the bordering nations must necessarily introduce. The inhabitants of Gaul, especially in those parts which lie contiguous to Italy, had acquired from a commerce with their southern neighbours some refinement in the arts, which gradually diffused themselves northwards and spread but a very faint light over this island. The Greek and Roman navigators or merchants, for there were scarcely any other travellers in those ages, brought back the most shocking accounts of the ferocity of the people, 
which they magnified as usual in order to excite the admiration of their countrymen. The southeast parts, however, of Britain had already, before the age of Caesar, made the first and most requisite step toward a civil settlement, and the Britons, by tillage and agriculture, had there increased to a great multitude. The other inhabitants of the island still maintained themselves by pasture. They were clothed with skins of beasts. They dwelt in huts, which they reared in the forests and marshes with which the country was covered. They shifted easily their habitation, when actuated either by the hopes of plunder or the fear of an enemy. The convenience of feeding their cattle was even a sufficient motive for removing their seats, and as they were ignorant of all the refinements of life, their wants and their possessions were equally scanty and limited. The Britons were divided into many small nations or tribes, and being a military people, whose sole property was then arms and their cattle. It was impossible, after they had acquired a relish of liberty, for their princes or chieftains to establish any despotic authority over them. Their governments, though monarchical, were free, as well as those of all the Celtic nations, and the common people seem even to have enjoyed more liberty among them than among the nations of Gaul, from whom they were descended. Each state was divided into factions within itself. It was agitated with jealousy or animosity against the neighboring states, and while the arts of peace were yet unknown, wars were the chief occupation and formed the chief object of ambition among the people. The religion of the Britons was one of the most considerable part of their government and the Druids, who were their priests, possessed great authority among them. Besides ministering at the altar and directing all religious duties, they presided over the education of youth, they enjoyed an immunity from wars and taxes, they possessed both the civil and criminal jurisdiction, they decided all controversies among states as well as among private persons, and whoever refused to submit to their decree was exposed to the most severe penalties. The sentence of excommunication was pronounced against him. He was forbidden access to the sacrifices or public worship. He was debarred all intercourse with his fellow citizens, even in the common affairs of life. His company was universally shunned as profane and dangerous. He was refused the protection of law, and death itself became an acceptable relief from the misery and infamy to which he was exposed. Thus the bands of government which were naturally loose among that rude and turbulent people were happily corroborated by the terrors of their superstition. No species of superstition was ever more terrible than that of the Druids. Besides the severe penalties, which it was in the power of the ecclesiastics to inflict in this world, they inculcated the eternal transmigration of souls, and thereby extended their authority as far as the fears of their timorous votaries. They practised their rites in dark groves or other secret recesses, and in order to throw a greater mystery over their religion, they communicated their doctrines only to the initiated, and strictly forbade the committing of them to writing, lest they should at any time be exposed to the examination of the profane vulgar. Human sacrifices were practised among them. The spoils of war were often devoted to their divinities, and they punished with the severest tortures whoever dared to secrete any part of the consecrated offering. These treasures they kept in woods and forests, secured by no other guard than the terrors of their religion. And this steady conquest over human avidity may be regarded as more signal than their prompting men to the most extraordinary and most violent efforts. 
no idolatrous worship ever attained such an ascendant over mankind as that of the ancient gauls and britons and the romans after their conquest finding it impossible to reconcile those nations to the laws and institutions of their masters while it maintained its authority were at last obliged to abolish it by penal statutes a violence which had never in any other instance been practised by those tolerating conquerors the romans the britons had long remained in this rude but independent state when caesar having overrun all gaul by his victories first cast his eye on their island he was not allured either by its riches or its renown but being ambitious of carrying the roman arms into a new world then mostly unknown he took advantage of a short interval in his gallic wars and made an invasion on britain the natives informed of his intention were sensible of the unequal contest and endeavoured to appease him by submissions which however retarded not the execution of his design after some resistance he landed as is supposed at deal and having obtained several advantages over the britons and obliged them to promise hostages for their future obedience he was constrained by the necessity of his affairs and the approach of winter to withdraw his forces into gaul the britons relieved from the terror of his arms neglected the performance of their stipulations and that haughty conqueror resolved next summer to chastise them for this breach of treaty he landed with a greater force and though he found a more regular resistance from the britons who had united under cassivolaunus one of their petty princes he discomfited them in every action he advanced into the country passed the thames in the face of the enemy took and burned the capital of cassivolaunus established his ally mandubratius in the sovereignty of the trinobantes and having obliged the inhabitants to make him new submissions he again returned with his army into gaul and left the authority of the romans more nominal than real in this island the civil wars which ensued and which prepared the way for the establishment of monarchy in rome saved the britons from that yoke which was ready to be imposed upon them augustus the successor of caesar content with the victory obtained over the liberties of his own country was little ambitious of acquiring fame by foreign wars and being apprehensive lest the same unlimited extent of dominion which had subverted the republic might also overwhelm the empire he recommended it to his successors never to enlarge the territories of the romans tiberius jealous of the fame which might be acquired by his generals made this advice of augustus a pretence for his inactivity the mad sallies of caligula in which he menaced britain with an invasion served only to expose himself and the empire to ridicule and the britons had now during almost a century enjoyed their liberty unmolested when the romans in the reign of claudius began to think seriously of reducing them under their dominion without seeking any more justifiable reasons of hostility than were employed by the late europeans in subjecting the africans and americans they sent over an army under the command of plautius an able general who gained some victories and made a considerable progress in subduing the inhabitants claudius himself finding matters sufficiently prepared for his reception made a journey into britain and received the submission of several british states the cantii atrobates regni and trinobantes who inhabited the south-east parts of the island 
and whom their possessions and more cultivated manner of life rendered willing to purchase peace at the expense of their liberty. The other Britons, under the command of Caractacus, still maintained an obstinate resistance, and the Romans made little progress against them, till Ostorius Scapula was sent over to command their armies. This general advanced the Roman conquests over the Britons, pierced into the country of the Silures, a warlike nation who inhabited the banks of the Severn, defeated Caractacus in a great battle, took him prisoner and sent him to Rome, where his magnanimous behavior produced him better treatment than those conquerors usually bestowed on captive princes. Notwithstanding these misfortunes, the Britons were not subdued, and this island was regarded by the ambitious Romans as a field in which military honor might still be acquired. Under the reign of Nero, Suetonius Paulinus was invested with the command, and prepared to signalize his name by victories over those barbarians. Finding that the Isle of Mona, now Anglesey, was the chief seat of the Druids, he resolved to attack it, and to subject a place which was the centre of their superstition, and which afforded protection to all their baffled forces. The Britons endeavoured to obstruct his landing on this sacred island, both by the force of their arms and the terrors of their religion. The women and priests were intermingled with the soldiers upon the shore, and running about with flaming torches in their hands, and tossing their dishevelled hair, they struck greater terror into the astonished Romans by their bowlings, cries, and execrations than the real danger from the armed forces was able to inspire. But Suetonius, exhorting his troops to despise the menaces of a superstition which they despised, impelled them to the attack, drove the Britons off the field, burned the Druids in the same fires which those priests had prepared for their captive enemies, destroyed all the consecrated groves and altars, and having thus triumphed over the religion of the Britons, he thought his future progress would be easy in reducing the people to subjection. But he was disappointed in his expectations. The Britons, taking advantage of his absence, were all in arms, and headed by Boudica, queen of the Iceni, who had been treated in the most ignominious manner by the Roman tribunes, had already attacked, with success, several settlements of their insulting conquerors. Suetonius hastened to the protection of London, which was already a flourishing Roman colony, but found on his arrival that it would be requisite for the general safety to abandon that place to the merciless fury of the enemy. London was reduced to ashes. Some of the inhabitants as remained in it were cruelly massacred. The Romans and all strangers to the number of seventy thousand were everywhere put to the sword without distinction and the Britons, by rendering the war thus bloody, seemed determined to cut off all hopes of peace or composition with the enemy. But this cruelty was revenged by Suetonius in a great and decisive battle, where eighty thousand of the Britons are said to have perished, and Boudicca herself, rather than fall into the hands of the enraged victor, put an end to her own life by poison. Nero soon after recalled Suetonius from a government where, by suffering and inflicting so many severities, he was judged improper for composing the angry and alarmed minds of the inhabitants. After some interval, Cerealis received the command from Vespasian, and by his bravery propagated the terror of the Roman arms. Julius Frontinus, succeeded Cerealis both in authority and in reputation, 
but the general who finally established the dominion of the Romans in this island was Julius Agricola, who governed it in the reigns of Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian, and distinguished himself in that scene of action. The great commander formed a regular plan for subduing Britain, and rendering the acquisition useful to the conquerors. He carried his victorious arms northwards, defeated the Britons in every encounter, pierced into the inaccessible forests and mountains of Caledonia, reduced every state to subjection in the southern parts of the island, and chased before him all the men of fiercer and more intractable spirits, who deemed war and death less intolerable than servitude under the victors. He even defeated them in a decisive action, which they fought under Galgasus, their leader, and having fixed a chain of garrisons between the friths of Clyde and Forth, he thereby cut off the ruder and more barren parts of the island, and secured the Roman province from the incursions of the barbarous inhabitants. During these military enterprises he neglected not the arts of peace. He introduced laws and civility among the Britons, taught them to desire and raise all the conveniences of life, reconciled them to the Roman language and manners, instructed them in letters and science, and employed every expedient to render those chains which he had forged both easy and agreeable to them. The inhabitants, having experienced how unequal their own force was to resist that of the Romans, acquiesced in the dominion of their masters, and were gradually incorporated as a part of that mighty empire. This was the last durable conquest made by the Romans, and Britain, once subdued, gave no further inquietude to the victor. Caledonia alone, defended by its barren mountains, and by the contempt which the Romans entertained for it, sometimes infested the more cultivated parts of the island by the incursions of its inhabitants. The better to secure the frontiers of the empire, Adrian, who visited this island, built a rampart between the river Tyne and the frith of Solway. Lollius Urbicus, under Antoninus Pius, erected one in the place where Agricola had formerly established his garrisons. Severus, who made an expedition into Britain, and carried his arms to the most northern extremity of it, added new fortifications to the wall of Adrian and during the reigns of all the Roman emperors, such a profound tranquillity prevailed in Britain that little mention is made of the affairs of that island by any historian. The only incidents which occur are some seditions or rebellions of the Roman legions quartered there, and some usurpations of the imperial dignity by the Roman governors. The natives, disarmed, dispirited, and submissive, had lost all desire and even idea of their former liberty and independence. But the period was now come, when that enormous fabric of the Roman Empire, which had diffused slavery and oppression, together with peace and civility, over so considerable a part of the globe, was approaching towards its final dissolution. Italy, and the centre of the empire, removed during so many ages from all concern in the wars, had entirely lost the military spirit, and were peopled by an enervated race, equally disposed to submit to a foreign yoke, or to the tyranny of their own rulers. The emperors found themselves obliged to recruit their legions from the frontier provinces, where the genius of war, though languishing, was not totally extinct, and these mercenary forces, careless of laws and civil institutions, established a military government no less dangerous to the sovereign than to the people. 
the further progress of the same disorders introduced the bordering barbarians into the service of the romans and those fierce nations having now added discipline to their native bravery could no longer be restrained by the impotent policy of the emperors who were accustomed to employ one in the destruction of the others sensible of their own force and allured by the prospect of so rich a prize the northern barbarians in the reign of arcadius and honorius assailed at once all the frontiers of the roman empire and having first satiated their avidity by plunder began to think of fixing a settlement in the wasted provinces the more distant barbarians who occupied the deserted habitations of the former advanced in their acquisitions and pressed with their incumbent weight the roman state already unequal to the load which it sustained instead of arming the people in their own defence the emperors recalled all the distant legions in whom alone they could repose confidence and collected the whole military force for the defence of the capital and centre of the empire the necessity of self-preservation had superseded the ambition of power and the ancient point of honour never to contract the limits of the empire could no longer be attended to in this desperate extremity britain by its situation was removed from the fury of these barbarous incursions and being also a remote province not much valued by the romans the legions which defended it were carried over to the protection of italy and gaul but that province though secured by the sea against the inroads of the greater tribes of barbarians found enemies on its frontiers who took advantage of its present defenceless situation the picts and the scots who dwelt in the northern parts beyond the wall of antoninus made incursions upon their peaceable and effeminate neighbours and besides the temporary depredations which they committed these combined nations threatened the whole province with subjection or what the inhabitants more dreaded with plunder and devastation the picts seem to have been a tribe of the native british race who having been chased into the northern parts by the conquests of agricola had there intermingled with the ancient inhabitants the scots were derived from the same celtic origin had first been established in ireland had migrated to the northwest coasts of this island and had long been accustomed as well from their old as their new seats to infest the roman province by piracy and rapine these tribes finding their more opulent neighbours exposed to invasion soon broke over the roman wall no longer defended by the roman arms and though a contemptible enemy in themselves met with no resistance from the unwarlike inhabitants the britons accustomed to have recourse to the emperors for defence as well as government made supplications to rome and one legion was sent over for their protection the force was an overmatch for the barbarians repelled their invasion touted them in every engagement and having chased them into their ancient limits returned in triumph to the defence of the southern provinces of the empire their retreat brought on a new invasion of the enemy the britons made again an application to rome and again obtained the assistance of a legion which proved effectual for their relief but the romans reduced to extremities at home and fatigued with these distant expeditions informed the britons that they must no longer look to them for succour exhorted them to arm in their own defence and urged that as they were now their own masters it became them to protect by their valour that independence which their ancient lords had conferred upon them that they might leave the island with the better grace 
the Romans assisted them in erecting anew the wall of Severus, which was built entirely of stone, and which the Britons had not at that time artificers skilful enough to repair. And having done this last good office to the inhabitants, they bade a final adieu to Britain, about the year 448, after being masters of the more considerable part of it during the course of near four centuries. End of section 3《Part I of Part One of Volume One A of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1A, Section 4, Chapter 1, Part 2, The Britons. The abject Britons regarded this present of liberty as fatal to them, and were in no condition to put in practice the prudent counsel given them by the Romans, to arm in their own defence. Unaccustomed both to the perils of war and to the cares of civil government, they found themselves incapable of forming or executing any measures for resisting the incursions of the barbarians. Gratian also and Constantine, two Romans who had a little before assumed the purple in Britain, had carried over to the continent the flower of the British youth and having perished in their unsuccessful attempts on the imperial throne, had despoiled the island of those who, in this desperate extremity, were best able to defend it. The Picts and the Scots, finding that the Romans had finally relinquished Britain, now regarded the whole as their prey, and attacked the northern wall with redoubled forces, the Britons, already subdued by their own fears, found the ramparts but a weak defence for them, and, deserting their station, left the country entirely open to the inroads of the barbarous enemy. The invaders carried devastation and ruin along with them, and exerted to the utmost their native ferocity, which was not mitigated by the helpless condition and submissive behaviour of the inhabitants. The unhappy Britons had a third time recourse to Rome, which had declared its resolution forever to abandon them. Aetius the patrician, sustained at that time by his valour and magnanimity the tottering ruins of the empire, and revived for a moment among the degenerate Romans the spirit as well as discipline of their ancestors. The British ambassadors carried to him the letter of their countrymen, which was inscribed, The Groans of the Britons. The tenor of the epistle was suitable to its superscription. The barbarians, they say, on the one hand chase us into the sea. The sea, on the other, throws us back upon the barbarians, and we have only the hard choice left us of perishing by the sword or by the waves. But Aetius, pressed by the arms of Attila, the most terrible enemy that ever assailed the empire, had no leisure to attend to the complaints of allies, whom generosity alone could induce him to assist. The Britons, thus rejected, were reduced to despair, deserted their habitations, abandoned tillage, and flying for protection to the forests and mountains, suffered equally from hunger and from the enemy. The barbarians themselves began to feel the pressures of famine in a country which they had ravaged, and being harassed by the dispersed Britons, who had not dared to resist them in a body, they retreated with their spoils into their own country. 
the Britons, taking advantage of this interval, returned to their usual occupations, and the favorable seasons which succeeded, seconding their industry, made them soon forget their past miseries, and restored to them great plenty of all the necessaries of life. No more can be imagined to have been possessed by a people so rude, who had not, without the assistance of the Romans, art of masonry sufficient to raise a stone rampart for their own defence. Yet the monkish historians, who treat of these events, complain of the luxury of the Britons during this period, and ascribe to that vice, not to their cowardice or improvident counsels, all their subsequent calamities. The Britons, entirely occupied in the enjoyment of the present interval of peace, made no provision for resisting the enemy, who, invited by their former timid behaviour, soon threatened them with a new invasion. We are not exactly informed what species of civil government the Romans on their departure had left among the Britons, but it appears probable that the great men in the different districts assumed a kind of regal, though precarious authority, and lived in a great measure independent of each other. To this disunion of councils were also added the disputes of theology, and the disciples of Pelagius, who was himself a native of Britain, having increased to a great multitude, gave alarm to the clergy who seemed to have been more intent on suppressing them than on opposing the public enemy. Laboring under these domestic evils, and menaced with a foreign invasion, the Britons attended only to the suggestions of their present fears, and following the counsels of Vortigern, prince of Dumnonian, who, though stained with every vice, possessed the chief authority among them, they sent into Germany a deputation to invite over the Saxons for their protection and assistance. The Saxons Of all the barbarous nations, known either in ancient or modern times, the Germans seem to have been the most distinguished both by their manners and political institutions and to have carried to the highest pitch the virtues of valour and love of liberty, the only virtues which can have place among an uncivilised people, where justice and humanity are commonly neglected. Kingly government, even when established among the Germans, for it was not universal, possessed a very limited authority, and though the sovereign was usually chosen from among the royal family, he was directed in every measure by the common consent of the nation over whom he presided. When any important affairs were transacted, all the warriors met in arms. The men of greatest authority employed persuasion to engage their consent. The people expressed their approbation by rattling their armor, or their dissent by murmurs. There was no necessity for a nice scrutiny of votes among a multitude, who were usually carried with a strong current to one side or the other, and the measure thus suddenly chosen by general agreement was executed with alacrity and prosecuted with vigor. Even in war the princes governed more by example than by authority, but in peace the civil union was in a great measure dissolved, and the inferior leaders administered justice after an independent manner, each in his particular district. These were elected by the votes of the people in their great councils, and though regard was paid to nobility in the choice, their personal qualities, chiefly their valour, procured them from the suffrages of their fellow citizens that honourable but dangerous distinction. The warriors of each tribe attached themselves to their leader with the most devoted affection and most unshaken constancy. They attended him as his ornament in peace, as his defence in war, 
as his counsel in the administration of justice, their constant emulation in military renown dissolved not that inviolable friendship which they professed to their chieftain and to each other. To die for the honour of their band was their chief ambition. To survive its disgrace or the death of their leader was infamous. They even carried into the field their women and children, who adopted all the martial sentiments of the men, and thus being impelled by every human motive, they were invincible where they were not opposed, either by the similar manners and institutions of the neighbouring Germans, or by the superior discipline, arms, and numbers of the Romans. The leaders and their military companions were maintained by the labour of their slaves, or by that of the weaker and less warlike part of the community whom they defended. The contributions which they levied went not beyond a bare subsistence, and the honours acquired by a superior rank were the only reward of their superior dangers and fatigues. All the refined arts of life were unknown among the Germans. Tillage itself was almost wholly neglected. They even seem to have been anxious to prevent any improvements of that nature, and the leaders, by annually distributing anew all the land among the inhabitants of each village, kept them from attaching themselves to particular possessions, or making such progress in agriculture as might divert their attention from military expeditions, the chief occupation of the community. The Saxons had been for some time regarded as one of the most warlike tribes of this fierce people, and had become the terror of the neighboring nations. They had diffused themselves from the northern parts of Germany and the Cimbrian Chersonesus, and had taken possession of all the sea-coast from the mouth of the Rhine to Jutland, whence they had long infested by their piracies all the eastern and southern parts of Britain and the northern of Gaul. In order to oppose their inroads, the Romans had established an officer, whom they called Count of the Saxon Shore, and as the naval arts can flourish among a civilized people alone, they seem to have been more successful in repelling the Saxons than any of the other barbarians by whom they were invaded. The dissolution of the Roman power invited them to renew their inroads, and it was an acceptable circumstance that the deputies of the Britons appeared among them, and prompted them to undertake an enterprise to which they were of themselves sufficiently inclined. Hengist and Horsa, two brothers, possessed great credit among the Saxons, and were much celebrated both for their valour and nobility. They were reputed, as most of the Saxon princes, to be sprung from Woden, who was worshipped as a god among those nations, and they are said to be his great-grandsons, a circumstance which added much to their authority. We shall not attempt to trace any higher the origin of those princes and nations. It is evident what fruitless labour it must be to search in those barbarous and illiterate ages for the annals of a people when their first leaders, known in any true history, were believed by them to be the fourth in descent from a fabulous deity or from a man exalted by ignorance into that character. The dark industry of antiquaries, led by imaginary analogies of names or by uncertain traditions, would in vain attempt to pierce into that deep obscurity which covers the remote history of those nations. These two brothers, observing the other provinces of Germany to be occupied by a warlike and necessitous people, and the rich provinces of Gaul already conquered or overrun by other German tribes, found it easy to persuade their countrymen to embrace the sole enterprise which promised a favourable opportunity of displaying their valour and gratifying their avidity. 
they embarked their troops in three vessels, and about the year 449 or 450, earned over 1,600 men who landed in the Isle of Thanet, and immediately marched to the defense of the Britons against the northern invaders. The Scots and Picts were unable to resist the valor of these auxiliaries, and the Britons, applauding their own wisdom in calling over the Saxons, hoped thenceforth to enjoy peace and security under the powerful protection of that warlike people. But Hengist and Horsa, perceiving from their easy victory over the Scots and Picts, with what facility they might subdue the Britons themselves, who had not been able to resist those feeble invaders, were determined to conquer and fight for their own grandeur, not for the defence of their degenerate allies. They sent intelligence to Saxony of the fertility and riches of Britain, and represented as certain the subjection of a people so long disused to arms, who, being now cut off from the Roman Empire of which they had been a province during so many ages, had not yet acquired any union among themselves, and were destitute of all affection to their new liberties, and of all national attachments and regards. The vices and pusillanimity of Vortigern, the British leader, were a new ground of hope, and the Saxons in Germany, following such agreeable proposals, soon reinforced Hengist and Horsa with five thousand men, who came over in seventeen vessels. The Britons now began to entertain apprehensions of their allies, whose numbers they found continually augmenting, but thought of no remedy except a passive submission and connivance. This weak expedient soon failed them. The Saxons sought a quarrel, and by complaining that their subsidies were ill-paid and their provisions withdrawn, and immediately taking off the mask, they formed an alliance with the Picts and Scots, and proceeded to open hostility against the Britons. The Britons, impelled by these violent extremities, and roused to indignation against their treacherous auxiliaries, were necessitated to take arms, and having deposed Vortigern, who had become odious from his vices, and from the bad event of his rash counsels, they put themselves under the command of his son, Vortimer. They fought many battles with their enemies, and though the victories in these actions be disputed between the British and Saxon analysts, the progress still made by the Saxons proves that the advantage was commonly on their side. In one battle, however, fought at Fagelsford, now Aylesford, Horsa, the Saxon general, was slain, and left the sole command over his countrymen in the hands of Hengist. This active general, continually reinforced by fresh numbers from Germany, carried devastation into the most remote corners of Britain, and being chiefly anxious to spread the terror of his arms, he spared neither age, nor sex, nor condition, wherever he marched with his victorious forces. The private and public edifices of the Britons were reduced to ashes. The priests were slaughtered on the altars by those idolatrous ravagers. The bishops and nobility shared the same fate of the vulgar. The people, flying to the mountains and deserts, were intercepted and butchered in heaps. Some were glad to accept of life and servitude under their victors. Others, deserting their native country, took shelter in the province of Armorica, where, being charitably received by a people of the same language and manners, they settled in great numbers, and gave the country the name of Brittany. The British writers assign one cause which facilitated the entrance of the Saxon into this island. 
the love with which vortigern was at first seized for rovina the daughter of hengist and which that artful warrior made use of to blind the eyes of the imprudent monarch the same historians add that vortimer died and that vortigern being restored to the throne accepted of a banquet from hengist at stonehenge where three hundred of his nobility were treacherously slaughtered and himself detained captive but these stories seem to have been invented by the welsh authors in order to palliate the weak resistance made at first by their countrymen and to account for the rapid progress and licentious devastations of the saxons after the death of vortimer ambrosius a briton though of roman descent was invested with the commander over his countrymen and endeavoured not without success to unite them in their resistance against the saxons those contests increased the animosity between the two nations and roused the military spirit of the ancient inhabitants which had before been sunk into a fatal lethargy hengist however notwithstanding their opposition still maintained his ground in britain and in order to divide the forces and attention of the natives he called over a new tribe of saxons under the command of his brother octa and of ebissa the son of octa and he settled them in northumberland he himself remained in the southern parts of the island and laid the foundation of their kingdom of kent comprehending the county of that name middlesex essex and part of surrey he fixed his royal seat at canterbury where he governed about forty years and he died in or near the year four eighty eight leaving his new acquired dominions to his posterity the success of hengist excited the avidity of the other northern germans and at different times and under different leaders they flocked over in multitudes to the invasion of this island these conquerors were chiefly composed of three tribes the saxons angles and jutes who all passed under the common appellation sometimes of saxons sometimes of angles and speaking the same language and being governed by the same institutions they were naturally led from these causes as well as from their common interest to unite themselves against the ancient inhabitants the resistance however though unequal was still maintained by the britons but became every day more feeble and their calamities admitted of few intervals till they were driven into cornwall and wales and received protection from the remote situation or inaccessible mountains of those countries the first saxon state after that of kent which was established in britain was the kingdom of south saxony in the year 477 aella a saxon chief brought over an army from germany and landing on the southern coast proceeded to take possession of the neighboring territory the britons now armed did not tamely abandon their possessions nor were they expelled till defeated in many battles by their warlike invaders the most memorable action mentioned by historians is that of mircrades burn where though the saxons seem to have obtained the victory they suffered so considerable a loss as somewhat retarded the progress of their conquests but aella reinforced by fresh numbers of his countrymen again took the field against the britons and laid siege to ansirad siaster which was defended by the garrison and inhabitants with desperate valour the saxons enraged by this resistance and by the fatigues and dangers which they had sustained redoubled their efforts against the place and when masters of it 
put all their enemies to the sword without distinction. This decisive advantage secured the conquests of Ayala, who assumed the name of king and extended his dominion over Sussex and a great part of Surrey. He was stopped in his progress to the east by the kingdom of Kent, in that to the west by another tribe of Saxons who had taken possession of that territory. These Saxons, from the situation of the country in which they settled, were called the West Saxons, and landed in the year 495, under the command of Serdic, and of his son, Kenric. The Britons were, by past experience, so much on their guard, and so well prepared to receive the enemy, that they gave battle to Serdic the very day of his landing, and though vanquished, still defended for some time their liberties against the invaders. None of the other tribes of Saxons met with such vigorous resistance or exerted such valor and perseverance in pushing their conquests. Serdic was even obliged to call for the assistance of his countrymen from the kingdoms of Kent and Sussex, as well as from Germany, and he was thence joined by a fresh army under the command of Porte, and of his sons Bleda and Megla. Strengthened by these succors, he fought, and in the year 508, a desperate battle with the Britons, commanded by Nazan Liaud, who was victorious in the beginning of the action, and routed the wing in which Serdic himself commanded. But Kenric, who had prevailed in the other wing, brought timely assistance to his father, and restored the battle which ended in a complete victory gained by the Saxons. Nazan Liaud perished with five thousand of his army, but left the Britons more weakened than discouraged by his death. The war still continued, though the success was commonly on the side of the Saxons, whose short swords and manner of fighting gave them great advantage over the missile weapons of the Britons. Serdic was not wanting to in good fortune, and in order to extend his conquests, he laid siege to Mount Baden, or Baines Down, near Bath, whither the most obstinate of the discomfited Britons had retired. The southern Britons in this extremity applied for assistance to Arthur, prince of the Silures, whose heroic valour now sustained the declining fate of his country. This is that Arthur so much celebrated in the songs of Thalysen, and the other British bards, and whose military achievements have been blended with so many fables, as even to give occasion for entertaining a doubt of his real existence. But poets, though they disfigure the most certain history by their fictions, and use strange liberties with truth where they are the sole historians, as among the Britons, have commonly some foundation for their wildest exaggerations. Certain it is that the siege of Baden was raised by the Britons in the year 520, and the Saxons were there discomfited in a great battle. This misfortune stopped the progress of Serdic, but was not sufficient to wrest from him the conquests which he had already made. He and his son Kenric, who succeeded him, established the kingdom of the West Saxons, or of Wessex, over the counties of Hants, Dorset, Wilts, Barks, and the Isle of Wight, and left their new acquired dominions to their posterity. Serdic died in 534, Kenric in 560. While the Saxons made this progress in the south, their countrymen were not less active in other quarters. In the year 527, a great tribe of adventurers, under several leaders, landed on the east coast of Britain, and after fighting many battles, of which history has preserved no particular account, they established three new kingdoms in this island. Ufa assumed the title of king 
of the East Angles in 575, Creda that of Mercia in 585, and Erkenwin that of East Saxony or Essex nearly about the same time, but the year is uncertain. This latter kingdom was dismembered from that of Kent, and comprehended Essex, Middlesex, and part of Hertfordshire. That of the East Angles, the counties of Cambridge, Suffolk, and Norfolk. Mercia was extended over all the middle counties, from the banks of the Severn to the frontiers of these two kingdoms. The Saxons, soon after the landing of Hengist, had been planted in Northumberland, but as they met with obstinate resistance and made but small progress in subduing the inhabitants, their affairs were in so unsettled a condition that none of their princes for a long time assumed the appellation of king. At last, in 547, Ida, a Saxon prince of great valour, who claimed a descent, as did all the other princes of that nation from Woden, brought over a reinforcement from Germany, and enabled the Northumbrians to carry on their conquests over the Britons. He entirely subdued the county now called Northumberland, the bishopric of Durham, as well as some of the southeast counties of Scotland, and he assumed the crown under the title of King of Bernicia. Nearly about the same time, Aella, another Saxon prince, having conquered Lancashire and the greater part of Yorkshire, received the appellation of King of Deiri. The two kingdoms were united in the person of Ethelfrid, grandson of Ida, who married Aka, the daughter of Aella, and, expelling her brother Edwin, established one of the most powerful of the Saxon kingdoms, by the title of Northumberland. How far his dominions extended into the country now called Scotland is uncertain, but it cannot be doubted that all the lowlands, especially the east coast of that country, were peopled in a great measure from Germany, though the expeditions made by the several Saxon adventurers have escaped the records of history. The language spoken in these countries, which is purely Saxon, is a stronger proof of this event than can be opposed by the imperfect, or rather fabulous, annals, which are obtruded on us by the Scottish historians. End of section 4《セクション5 of Part 1 of Volume 1a of A History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688, by David Hume, Volume 1a, Section 5, Chapter 1, Part 3. The Heptarchy. Thus was established, after a violent contest of nearly a hundred and fifty years, the Heptarchy, or seven Saxon kingdoms in Britain, and the whole southern part of the island except Wales and Cornwall, had totally changed its inhabitants, language, customs, and political institutions. The Britons, under the Roman dominion, had made such advances towards arts and civil manners, that they had built twenty-eight considerable cities within their province, besides a great number of villages and country seats. But the fierce conquerors, by whom they were now subdued, threw everything back into ancient barbarity, and those few natives who were not either massacred or expelled their habitations were reduced to the most abject slavery. 
none of the other northern conquerors the franks goths vandals or burgundians though they overran the southern provinces of the empire like a mighty torrent made such devastations in the conquered territories or were inflamed into so violent an animosity against the ancient inhabitants as the saxons came over at intervals in separate bodies the britons however at first unwarlike were tempted to make resistance and hostilities being thereby prolonged proved more destructive to both parties especially to the vanquished the first invaders from germany instead of excluding other adventurers who must share with them the spoils of the ancient inhabitants were obliged to solicit fresh supplies from their own country and a total extermination of the britons became the sole expedient for providing a settlement and subsistence to the new planters hence there have been found in history few conquests more ruinous than that of the saxons and few revolutions more violent than that which they introduced so long as the contest was maintained with the natives the several saxon princes preserved a union of councils and interests but after the britons were shut up in the barren countries of cornwall and wales and gave no further disturbance to the conquerors the band of alliance was in a great measure dissolved among the princes of the heptarchy though one prince seems still to have been allowed or to have assumed an ascendant over the whole his authority if it ought ever to be deemed regular or legal was extremely limited and each state acted as if it had been independent and wholly separate from the rest wars therefore and revolutions and dissensions were unavoidable among a turbulent and military people and these events however intricate or confused ought now to become the objects of our attention but added to the difficulty of carrying on at once the history of seven independent kingdoms there is great discouragement to a writer arising from the uncertainty at least barrenness of the accounts transmitted to us the monks who were the only analysts during those ages lived remote from public affairs considered the civil transactions as entirely subordinate the ecclesiastical and besides partaking of the ignorance and barbarity which were then universal were strongly infected with credulity with the love of wonder and with a propensity to imposture vices almost inseparable from their profession and manner of life the history of that period abounds in names but is extremely barren of events or the events are related so much without circumstances and causes that the most profound or most eloquent writer must despair of rendering them either instructive or entertaining to the reader even the great learning and vigorous imagination of milton sunk under the weight and this author scruples not to declare that the skirmishes of kites or crows as much merited a particular narrative as the confused transactions and battles of the saxon heptarchy in order however to connect the events in some tolerable measure we shall give a succinct account of the successions of kings and of the more remarkable revolutions in each particular kingdom beginning with that of kent which was the first established the kingdom of kent escus succeeded his father hengist in the kingdom of kent but seems not to have possessed the military genius of that conqueror who first made way for the entrance of the saxon arms into britain all the saxons who sought either the fame of valor or new establishments by arms flocked to the standard of Aella, 
king of Sussex, who was carrying on successful war against the Britons, and laying the foundations of a new kingdom. Escus was content to possess in tranquillity the kingdom of Kent, which he left in 512 to his son Octet, in whose time the East Saxons established their monarchy, and dismembered the provinces of Essex and Middlesex from that of Kent. His death, after a reign of twenty-two years, made room for his son Hermenric in 534, who performed nothing memorable during a reign of thirty-two years, excepting associating with him his son Ethelbert in the government, that he might secure the succession of his family, and prevent such revolutions as are incident to a turbulent and barbarous monarchy. Ethelbert revived the reputation of his family, which had languished for some generations. The inactivity of his predecessors, and the situation of his country secured from all hostility with the Britons, seemed to have much enfeebled the warlike genius of the Kentish Saxons, and Ethelbert, in his first attempt to aggrandize his country and distinguish his own name, was unsuccessful. He was twice discomfited in battle by Suolin, king of Wessex, and obliged to yield the superiority in the heptarchy to that ambitious monarch, who preserved no moderation in his victory, and by reducing the kingdom of Sussex to subjection, excited jealousy in all the other princes. An association was formed against him, and Ethelbert, entrusted with the command of the allies, gave him battle, and obtained a decisive victory. Siolin died soon after, and Ethelbert succeeded as well to his ascendant among the Saxon states as to his other ambitious projects. He reduced all the princes, except the king of Northumberland, to a strict dependence upon him, and even established himself by force on the throne of Mercia, the most extensive of the Saxon kingdoms. Apprehensive, however, of a dangerous league against him, like that by which he himself had been enabled to overthrow Siolin, he had the prudence to resign the kingdom of Mercia to Weba, the rightful heir, the son of Creda, who had first founded that monarchy. But governed still by ambition more than justice, he gave Weber possession of the crown on such conditions as rendered him little better than a tributary prince under his artful benefactor. But the most memorable event which distinguished the reign of this great prince was the introduction of the Christian religion among the English Saxons. The superstition of the Germans, particularly that of the Saxons, was of the grossest and most barbaric kind, and being founded on traditional tales, received from their ancestors, not reduced to any system, not supported by political institutions, like that of the Druids, it seems to have made little impression on its votaries, and to have easily resigned its place to the new doctrine promulgated to them. Woden, whom they deemed the ancestors of all their princes, was regarded as the god of war, and by a natural consequence became their supreme deity, and the chief object of their religious worship. They believed that, if they obtained the favour of this divinity by their valour, for they made less account of the other virtues, they should be admitted after their death into his hall, and reposing on couches, should satiate themselves with ale from the skulls of their enemies, whom they had slain in battle. Incited by this idea of paradise, which gratified at once the passion of revenge and that of intemperance, the ruling inclination of barbarians, they despised the dangers of war, and increased their native ferocity against the vanquished by their religious prejudices. We know little of the other theological tenets of the Saxons. We only learn that they were polytheists, that they worshipped the sun and the moon, 
that they adored the god of thunder under the name of Thor, that they had images in their temples, that they practiced sacrifices, believed firmly in spells and enchantments, and admitted in general a system of doctrines which they held as sacred, but which, like all other superstition, must carry the air of the wildest extravagance, if propounded to those who are not familiarized to it from their earliest infancy. The constant hostilities which the Saxons maintained against the Britons would naturally indispose them for receiving the Christian faith when preached to them by such inveterate enemies, and perhaps the Britons, as is objected to them by Gildas and Bede, were not over-fond of communicating to their cruel invaders the doctrine of eternal life and salvation. But as a civilized people, however subdued by arms, still maintain a sensible superiority over barbarous and ignorant nations, all the other northern conquerors of Europe had been already induced to embrace the Christian faith, which they found established in the empire and it was impossible but the Saxons, informed of this event, must have regarded with some degree of veneration a doctrine which had acquired the ascendant over all their brethren. However limited in their news, they could not but have perceived a degree of cultivation in the southern countries beyond what they themselves possessed, and it was natural for them to yield to that superior knowledge as well as zeal, by which the inhabitants of the Christian kingdoms were even at that time distinguished. But these causes might long have failed of producing any considerable effect, had not a favorable incident prepared the means of introducing Christianity into Kent. Ethelbert, in his father's lifetime, had married Bertha, the only daughter of Cariben, king of Paris, one of the descendants of Clovis, the conqueror of Gaul. But before he was admitted to this alliance, he was obliged to stipulate that the princess should enjoy the free exercise of her religion, a concession not difficult to be obtained from the idolatrous Saxons. Bertha brought over a French bishop to the court of Canterbury, and being zealous for the propagation of her religion, she had been very assiduous in her devotional exercises, had supported the credit of her faith by an irreproachable conduct, and had employed every art of insinuation and address to reconcile her husband to her religious principles. Her popularity in the court, and her influence over Ethelbert, had so well paved the way for the reception of the Christian doctrine, that Gregory, surnamed the Great, then Roman Pontiff, began to entertain hopes of effecting a project which he himself, before he mounted the papal throne, had once embraced, of converting the British Saxons. It happened that this prelate, at that time in a private station, had observed in the market-place of Rome some Saxon youth exposed to sale, whom the Roman merchants in their trading voyages to Britain had bought of their mercenary parents. Struck with the beauty of their fair complexions and blooming countenances, Gregory asked to what country they belonged, and being told they were Angles, he replied that they ought more properly to be denominated angels. It were a pity that the Prince of Darkness should enjoy so fair a prey, and that so beautiful a frontispiece should cover a mind destitute of internal grace and righteousness. Inquiring further concerning the name of their province, he was informed that it was Deiri, a district of Northumberland. Deiri replied he, that is good. They are called to the mercy of God from his anger, de ira. But what is the name of the king of that province? He was told it was Aella, or Alia, 
Alleluia, cried he, we must endeavor that the praises of God be sung in their country. Moved by these allusions, which appeared to him so happy, he determined to undertake himself a mission into Britain, and having obtained the Pope's approbation, he prepared for that perilous journey. But his popularity at home was so great that the Romans, unwilling to expose him to such dangers, opposed his design, and he was obliged for the present to lay aside all further thoughts of executing that pious purpose. The controversy between the pagans and the Christians was not entirely cooled in that age, and no pontiff before Gregory had ever carried to greater excess an intemperate zeal against the former religion. He had waged war with all the precious monuments of the ancients, and even with their writings, which, as appears from the strain of his own wit, as well as from the style of his compositions, he had not taste or genius sufficient to comprehend. Ambitious to distinguish his pontificate by the conversion of the British Saxons, he pitched on Augustine a Roman monk, and sent him with forty associates to preach the gospel in this island. These missionaries, terrified with the dangers which might attend their proposing a new doctrine to so fierce a people, of whose language they were ignorant, stopped some time in France, and sent back Augustine to lay the hazards and difficulties before the Pope, and crave his permission to desist from the undertaking. But Gregory exhorted them to persevere in their purpose, advised them to choose some interpreters from among the Franks, who still spoke the same language with the Saxons, and recommended them to the good offices of Queen Brunehoit, who had at this time usurped the sovereign power in France. This princess, though stained with every vice of treachery and cruelty, either possessed or pretended great zeal for the cause, and Gregory acknowledged that to her friendly assistance was, in a great measure, owing the success of that undertaking. Augustine, on his arrival in Kent in the year 597, found the danger much less than he had apprehended. Ethelbert, already well disposed towards the Christian faith, assigned him a habitation in the Isle of Thanet, and soon after admitted him to a conference. Apprehensive, however, lest spells or enchantments might be employed against him by priests, who brought an unknown worship from a distant country, he had the precaution to receive them in the open air, where, he believed, the force of their magic would be more easily dissipated. Here Augustine, by means of his interpreters, delivered to him the tenets of the Christian faith, and promised him eternal joys above and a kingdom in heaven without end, if he would be persuaded to receive that salutary doctrine. Our words and promises, replied Ethelbert, are fair, but because they are new and uncertain, I cannot entirely yield to them, and relinquish the principles which I and my ancestors have so long maintained. You are welcome, however, to remain here in peace, and as you have undertaken so long a journey, solely as it appears for what you believe to be for our advantage, I will supply you with all necessaries and permit you to deliver your doctrine to my subjects. Augustine, encouraged by this favourable reception and seeing now a prospect of success, proceeded with redoubled zeal to preach the gospel to the Kentish Saxons. He attracted their attention by the austerity of his manners, by the severe penances to which he subjected himself, by the abstinence and self-denial which he had practised, and having excited their wonder by a course of life which appeared so contrary to nature, he procured more easily their belief of miracles, which it was pretended he wrought for their conversion. Influenced by these motives and by the declared favour of the court, numbers of the Kentish men were baptised, 
and the king himself was persuaded to submit to that right of Christianity. His example had great influence with his subjects, but he employed no force to bring them over to the new doctrine. Augustine thought proper in the commencement of his mission to assume the appearance of the greatest lenity. He told Ethelbert that the service of Christ must be entirely voluntary, and that no violence ought ever to be used in propagating so salutary a doctrine. The intelligence received of these spiritual conquests afforded great joy to the Romans, who now exulted as much in those peaceful trophies as their ancestors had ever done in their most sanguinary triumphs and most splendid victories. Gregory wrote a letter to Ethelbert in which, after informing him that the end of the world was approaching, he exhorted him to display his zeal in the conversion of his subjects, to exert rigour against the worship of idols, and to build up the good work of holiness by every expedient of exhortation, terror, blandishment, or correction, a doctrine more suitable to that age and to the usual papal maxims than the tolerating principles which Augustine had thought it prudent to inculcate. The pontiff also answered some questions which the missionary had put concerning the government of the new church of Kent. Besides other queries which it is not material here to relate, Augustine asked whether cousins German might be allowed to marry. Gregory answered that liberty had indeed been formally granted by the Roman law, but that experience had shown that no issue could ever come from such marriages, and he therefore prohibited them. Augustine asked whether a woman pregnant might be baptized. Gregory answered that he saw no objection. How soon after the birth the child might receive baptism? It was answered immediately, if necessary. How soon might a husband have commerce with his wife after her delivery? Not till she had given suck to her child, a practice to which Gregory exhorts all women. How soon a man might enter the church or receive the sacrament after having had commerce with his wife? It was replied that, unless he had approached her without desire, merely for the sake of propagating his species, he was not without sin, but in all cases it was requisite for him before he entered the church or communicated to purge himself by prayer and ablution, and he ought not, even after using these precautions, to participate immediately of the sacred duties. There are some other questions and replies still more indecent and more ridiculous, and on the whole it appears that Gregory and his missionary, if sympathy of manners have any influence, were better calculated than men of more refined understandings for making a progress with the ignorant and barbarous Saxons. The more to facilitate the reception of Christianity, Gregory enjoined Augustine to remove the idols from the heathen altars, but not to destroy the altars themselves, because the people, he said, would be allured to frequent the Christian worship when they found it celebrated in a place which they were accustomed to revere. And as the pagans practised sacrifices and feasted with the priests on their offerings, he also exhorted the missionary to persuade them on Christian festivals to kill their cattle in the neighbourhood of the church and to indulge themselves in those cheerful entertainments to which they had been habituated. These political compliances show that notwithstanding his ignorance and prejudices, he was not unacquainted with the arts of governing mankind. Augustine was concentrated Archbishop of Canterbury, was endowed by Gregory with authority over all the British churches, and received the pall, a badge of ecclesiastical honour from Rome. Gregory also advised him not to be too much elated with his gift of working miracles, and as Augustine, proud of the success of his mission, 
seemed to think himself entitled to extend his authority over the bishops of Gaul, the Pope informed him that they lay entirely without the bounds of his jurisdiction. The marriage of Ethelbert with Bertha, and much more his embracing Christianity, begat a connection of his subjects with the French, Italians, and other nations on the continent, and tended to reclaim them from that gross ignorance and barbarity in which all the Saxon tribes had been hitherto involved. Ethelbert also enacted, with the consent of the states of his kingdom, a body of laws, the first written laws promulgated by any of the northern conquerors, and his reign was in every respect glorious to himself and beneficial to his people. He governed the kingdom of Kent fifty years, and dying in 616, left the succession to his son, Eadbald. This prince, seduced by a passion for his mother-in-law, deserted for some time the Christian faith, which permitted not these incestuous marriages. His whole people immediately returned with him to idolatry. Laurentius, the successor of Augustine, found the Christian worship wholly abandoned, and was prepared to return to France in order to escape the mortification of preaching the gospel without fruit to the infidels. Melitus and Justus, who had been consecrated bishops of London and Rochester, had already departed the kingdom, when Laurentius, before he should entirely abandon his dignity, made one effort to reclaim the king. He appeared before that prince, and throwing off his vestments, showed his body all torn with bruises and stripes which he had received. Eadbald, wondering that any man should have dared to treat in that manner a person of his rank, was told by Laurentius that he had received this chastisement from St. Peter, the prince of the apostles who had appeared to him in a vision, and severely reproving him for his intention to desert his charge, had inflicted on him these visible marks of his displeasure. Whether Eadbald was struck with the miracle, or influenced by some other motive, he divorced himself from his mother-in-law, and returned to the profession of Christianity. His whole people returned with him. Eadbald reached not the fame or authority of his father, and died in 640 after a reign of twenty-five years, leaving two sons, Erminfried and Erkombert. Erkombert, though the younger son by Emma, a French princess, found means to mount the throne. He is celebrated by Bede for two exploits, for establishing the fast of Lent in his kingdom, and for utterly extirpating idolatry, which, notwithstanding the prevalence of Christianity, had hitherto been tolerated by the two preceding monarchs. He reigned twenty-four years and left the crown to Egbert, his son, who reigned nine years. This prince is renowned for his encouragement of learning, but infamous for putting to death his two cousins German, sons of Erminfrid, his uncle, the ecclesiastical writers praise him for his bestowing on his sister, Domnona, some lands in the Isle of Thanet, where she founded a monastery. The bloody precaution of Egbert could not fix the crown on the head of his son Edric. Lothair, brother of the deceased prince, took possession of the kingdom, and in order to secure the power in his family, he associated with him Richard, his son, in the administration of the government. Edric, the dispossessed prince, had recourse to Edilwack, king of Sussex, for assistance, and being supported by that prince, fought a battle with his uncle, who was defeated and slain. Richard fled into Germany, and afterwards died in Lucca, a city of Tuscany. William of Malmesbury ascribes Lothair's bad fortune to two crimes. 
his concurrence in the murder of his cousins, and his contempt for relics. Lothair reigned eleven years, Edric his successor only two. Upon the death of the latter, which happened in 686, Widred, his brother, obtained possession of the crown. But as the succession had been of late so much disjointed by revolutions and usurpations, faction began to prevail among the nobility, which invited Kedwalla, king of Wessex, with his brother Molo, to attack the kingdom. These invaders committed great devastations in Kent, but the death of Molo, who was slain in a skirmish, gave a short breathing time to that kingdom. Widred restored the affairs of Kent, and after a reign of thirty-two years left the crown to his posterity. Edbert, Ethelbert, and Ulric, his descendants, successively mounted the throne. After the death of the last, which happened in 794, the royal family of Kent was extinguished, and every factious leader who could entertain hopes of ascending the throne threw the state into confusion. Egbert, who first succeeded, reigned but two years. Cuthred, brother to the king of Mercia, six years. Baldred, an illegitimate branch of the royal family, eighteen, and after a troublesome and precarious reign, he was in the year 823 expelled by Egbert, king of Wessex, who dissolved the Saxon heptarchy and united the several kingdoms under his dominion. End of section 5《パート1》の Part 1の Volume 1A の History of England、From the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688。This is a LibriVox recording.All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume One A, Section Six, Chapter One, Part Four, The Kingdom of Northumberland. Adelfred, King of Bernicia, having married Acca, the daughter of Aella, King of Deiri, and expelled her infant brother Edwin, had united all the counties north of Humber into one monarchy. And acquired a great ascendant in the heptarchy. He also spread the terror of the Saxon arms to the neighboring people, and by his victories over the Scots and Picts, as well as Welsh, extended on all sides the bounds of his dominions. Having laid siege to Chester, the Britons marched out with all their forces to engage him. And they were attended by a body of twelve hundred and fifty monks from the monastery of Bangor, who stood at a small distance from the field of battle, in order to encourage the combatants by their presence and exhortations. Adelfred, inquiring into the purpose of this unusual appearance, was told that these priests had come to pray against him. Then are they as much our enemies, said he, as those who intend to fight against us, and he immediately sent a detachment who fell upon them and did such execution that only fifty escaped with their lives. The Britons, astonished at this event, received a total defeat. Chester was obliged to surrender, and Adelfred, pursuing his victory, made himself master of Bangor, and entirely demolished the monastery. A building so extensive that there was a mile's distance from one gate of it to another, and it contained two thousand one hundred monks, who are said to have been maintained by their own labor. Notwithstanding Adelfred's success in war, he lived in inquietude on account of young Edwin, 
whom he had unjustly dispossessed of the crown of Deiri. This prince, now grown to man's estate, wandered from place to place, in continual danger from the attempts of Adelfrid, and received at last protection in the court of Redwald, king of the East Angles, where his engaging and gallant deportment procured him general esteem and affection. Redwald, however, was strongly solicited by the king of Northumberland to kill or deliver up his guest. Rich presents were promised him if he would comply, and war denounced against him in case of his refusal. After rejecting several messages of this kind, his generosity began to yield to the motives of interest, and he retained the last ambassador till he should come to a resolution in a case of such importance. Edwin, informed of his friend's perplexity, was yet determined at all hazards to remain in East Anglia, and thought that if the protection of that court failed him, it were better to die than prolong a life so much exposed to the persecutions of his powerful rival. This confidence in Redwald's honour and friendship, with his other accomplishments, engaged the Queen on his side, and she effectually represented to her husband the infamy of delivering up to certain destruction their royal guest, who had fled to them for protection against his cruel and jealous enemies. Redwald, embracing more generous resolutions, thought it safest to prevent Adelfrid, before that prince was aware of his intention, and to attack him while he was yet unprepared for defence. He marched suddenly with an army into the kingdom of Northumberland, and fought a battle with Adelfrid, in which that monarch was defeated and killed, after revenging himself by the death of Regner, son of Redwald. His own sons, Eanfrid, Oswald, and Oswy, yet infants, were carried into Scotland, and Edwin obtained possession of the crown of Northumberland. Edwin was the greatest prince of the Heptarchy in that age, and distinguished himself both by his influence over the other kingdoms, and by the strict execution of justice in his own dominions. He reclaimed his subjects from the licentious life to which they had been accustomed, and it was a common saying that during his reign a woman or child might openly carry everywhere a purse of gold without any danger of violence or robbery. There is a remarkable instance transmitted to us of the affection borne him by his servants. Quichhelm, king of Wessex, was his enemy but finding himself unable to maintain open war against so gallant and powerful a prince, he determined to use treachery against him, and he employed one humour for that criminal purpose. The assassin, having gained admittance by pretending to deliver a message from Quichhelm, drew his dagger and rushed upon the king. Lilla, an officer of his army, seeing his master's danger, and having no other means of defence, interposed with his own body between the king and Eumer's dagger, which was pushed with such violence that after piercing Lilla it even wounded Edwin. But before the assassin could renew his blow, he was dispatched by the king's attendants. The East Angles conspired against Redwald, their king, and having put him to death, they offered their crown to Edwin, of whose valour and capacity they had had experience while he resided among them. But Edwin, from a sense of gratitude towards his benefactor, obliged them to submit to Erpwald, the son of Redwald, and that prince preserved his authority, though on a precarious footing under the protection of the Northumbrian monarch. Edwin, after his accession to the crown, married Ethelburga, the daughter of Ethelbert, king of Kent. This princess, emulating the glory of her mother Bertha, who had been the instrument for converting her husband and his people to Christianity, carried Paulinus, 
a learned bishop along with her, and besides stipulating a toleration for the exercise of her own religion, which was readily granted her, she used every reason to persuade the king to embrace it. Edwin, like a prudent prince, hesitated on the proposal, but promised to examine the foundations of that doctrine, and declared that, if he found them satisfactory, he was willing to be converted. Accordingly, he held several conferences with Paulinus, canvassed the arguments propounded with the wisest of his counsellors, retired frequently from company in order to revolve alone that important question, and after a serious and long inquiry, declared in favour of the Christian religion. The people soon after imitated his example. Besides the authority and influence of the king, they were moved by another striking example. Coifi, the high priest, being converted after a public conference with Paulinus, led the way in destroying the images which he had so long worshipped, and was forward in making this atonement for his past idolatry. This able prince perished with his son Osfrid in a great battle which he fought against Penda, king of Mercia, and Caedwalla, king of the Britons. That event which happened in the forty-eighth year of Edwin's age and seventeenth of his reign divided the monarchy of Northumberland, which that prince had united in his person. Eanfrid, the son of Adelfrid, returned with his brothers Oswald and Oswy from Scotland, and took possession of Bernicia, his paternal kingdom. Osric, Edwin's cousin German, established himself in Deiri, the inheritance of his family, but to which the sons of Edwin had a preferable title. Eanfrid, the elder surviving son, fled to Penda, by whom he was treacherously slain. The younger son, Vusfraia, with Ifi, the grandson of Edwin by Osfrid, sought protection in Kent, and not finding themselves in safety there, retired into France to King Dagobert, where they died. Osric, king of Deiri, and Eanfrid of Bernicia, returned to paganism, and the whole people seemed to have returned with them since Paulinus, who was the first Archbishop of York, and who had converted them, thought proper to retire with Ethelberger, the Queen Dowager, into Kent. Both these Northumbrian kings perished soon after, the first in battle against Caedwalla, the Briton, the second by the treachery of that prince. Oswald, the brother of Eanfrid, of the race of Bernicia, united again the kingdom of Northumbria in the year 634, and restored the Christian religion in his dominions. He gained a bloody and well-disputed battle against Caedwalla, the last vigorous effort which the Britons made against the Saxons. Oswald is much celebrated for his sanctity and charity by the monkish historians, and they pretend that his relics wrought miracles, particularly the curing of a sick horse, which had approached the place of his interment. He died in battle against Penda, king of Mercia, and was succeeded by his brother Oswy, who established himself in the government of the whole Northumbrian kingdom, by putting to death Oswin, the son of Osric, the last king of the race of Deiri. His son Egfrid, succeeded him, who perishing in battle against the Picts, without leaving any children, because Adelthrid, his wife, refused to violate her vow of chastity, Alfred, his natural brother, acquired possession of the kingdom, which he governed for nineteen years, and he left it to Osred, his son, a boy of eight years of age. This prince, after a reign of eleven years, was murdered by Kenred, his kinsman, who, after enjoying the crown only a year, 
perished by a like fate. Osric and after him Selwulf, the son of Kenred, next mounted the throne, which the latter relinquished in the year 738 in favour of Edbert, his cousin German, who, imitating his predecessor, abdicated the crown and retired into a monastery. Oswulf, the son of Edbert, was slain in a sedition a year after his accession to the crown, and Mollo, who was not of the royal family, seized the crown. He perished by the treachery of Eilred, a prince of the blood, and Eilred, having succeeded in his design upon the throne, was soon after expelled by his subjects. Ethelred, his successor, the son of Mollo, underwent a like fate. Selwold, the next king, the brother of Eilred, was deposed and slain by the people, and his place was filled by Osred, his nephew, who, after a short reign of a year, made way for Ethelbert, another son of Mollo, whose death was equally tragical with that of almost all his predecessors. After Ethelbert's death, a universal anarchy prevailed in Northumberland, and the people having, by so many fatal revolutions, lost all attachment to their government and princes, were well prepared for subjection to a foreign yoke, which Egbert, king of Wessex, finally imposed upon them. THE KINGDOM OF EAST ANGLIA The history of this kingdom contains nothing memorable except the conversion of Erpwald, the fourth king and great-grandson of Una, the founder of the monarchy. The authority of Edwin, king of Northumberland, on whom that prince entirely depended, engaged him to take this step, but soon after his wife, who was an idolatress, brought him back to her religion, and he was found unable to resist those allurements which have seduced the wisest of mankind. After his death, which was violent, like that of most of the Saxon princes that did not early retire into monasteries, Sigebert, his successor and half-brother, who had been educated in France, restored Christianity, and introduced learning among the East Angles. Some pretend that he founded the University of Cambridge, or rather some schools in that place. It is almost impossible and quite needless to be more particular in relating the transactions of the East Angles. What instruction or entertainment can it give the reader to hear a long bead-roll of barbarous names, Egric, Annas, Ethelbert, Ethelwald, Aldulf, Elfwald, Bjorn, Ethelred, Ethelbert, who successively murdered, expelled, or inherited from each other, and obscurely filled the throne of that kingdom. Ethelbert, the last of these princes, was treacherously murdered by Offa, king of Mercia, in the year 792, and his state was thenceforth with that of Offa, as we shall relate presently. THE KINGDOM OF MERCIA Mercia, the largest, if not the most powerful kingdom of the Heptarchy, comprehended all the middle counties of England, and as its frontiers extended to those of all the other kingdoms as well as to Wales, it received its name from that circumstance. Wibba, the son of Creda, founder of the monarchy, being placed on the throne by Ethelbert, king of Kent, governed his paternal dominions by a precarious authority, and after his death, Seorl, his kinsman, was by the influence of the Kentish monarch, preferred to his son Penda, whose turbulent character appeared dangerous to that prince. Penda was thus fifty years of age before he mounted the throne, and his temerity and restless disposition were found nowise abated by time, experience, or reflection. He engaged in continual hostilities against all the neighbouring states, 
and by his injustice and violence rendered himself equally odious to his own subjects and to strangers. Sigebert, Egric, and Annas, three kings of East Anglia, perished successively in battles against him, as did also Edwin and Oswald, the two greatest princes that had reigned over Northumberland. At last, Oswy, brother to Oswald, having defeated and slain him in a decisive battle, freed the world from this sanguinary tyrant. Peida, his son, mounted the throne of Mercia in 655, and lived under the protection of Oswy, whose daughter he had espoused. This princess was educated in the Christian faith, and she employed her influence with success in converting her husband and his subjects to that religion. Thus the fair sex have had the merit of introducing the Christian doctrine into all the most considerable kingdoms of the Saxon heptarchy. Peda died a violent death. His son Wolfhere succeeded to the government, and after having reduced to dependence the kingdoms of Essex and East Anglia, he left the crown to his brother Ethelred, who, though a lover of peace, showed himself not unfit for military enterprises. Besides making a successful expedition into Kent, he repulsed Egfrid, king of Northumberland, who had invaded his dominions, and he slew in battle Elswin, the brother of that prince. Desirous, however, of composing all animosities with Egfrid, he paid him a sum of money as a compensation for the loss of his brother. After a prosperous reign of thirty years, he resigned the crown to Kendred, son of Wolfhere, and retired into the monastery of Bardney. This prince, who mounted the throne in 755, had some great qualities, and was successful in his warlike enterprises against Lothair, king of Kent, and Kenwulf, king of Wessex. He defeated the former in a bloody battle at Otford upon the Darent, and reduced his kingdom to a state of dependence. He gained a victory over the latter at Bensington in Oxfordshire, and conquering that county together with that of Gloucester, annexed both to his dominions. But all these successes were stained by his treacherous murder of Ethelbert, king of the East Angles, and his violent seizing of that kingdom. This young prince, who is said to have possessed great merit, had paid his addresses to Elfrida, the daughter of Offa, and was invited with all his retinue to Hereford, in order to solemnize the nuptials. Amidst the joy and festivity of these entertainments, he was seized by Offa, and secretly beheaded, and though Elfrida, who abhorred her father's treachery, had time to give warning to the East Anglian nobility, who escaped into their own country, Offa, having extinguished the royal family, succeeded in his design of subduing that kingdom. The perfidious prince, desirous of re-establishing his character in the world, and perhaps of appeasing the remorses of his own conscience, paid great court to the clergy, and practised all the monkish devotion so much esteemed in that ignorant and superstitious age. He gave the tenth of his goods to the church, bestowed rich donations on the cathedral of Hereford, and even made a pilgrimage to Rome, where his great power and riches could not fail of procuring him the papal absolution. The better to ingratiate himself with the sovereign pontiff, he engaged to pay him a yearly donation for the support of an English college at Rome, and in order to raise the sum, he imposed a tax of a penny on each house possessed of thirty pence a year. This imposition, being afterwards levied on all England, was commonly denominated Peter's Pence, and though conferred at first as a gift, was afterwards claimed as a tribute by the Roman pontiff. Carrying his hypocrisy still further, 
offer feigning to be directed by a vision from heaven discovered at verulam the relics of saint alban the martyr and endowed a magnificent monastery in that place moved by all these acts of piety malmesbury one of the best of the old english historians declares himself at a loss to determine whether the merits or crimes of this prince preponderated offa died after a reign of thirty-nine years in seven ninety four this prince was become so considerable in the heptarchy that the emperor charlemagne entered into an alliance and friendship with him a circumstance which did honour to offa as distant princes at that time had usually little communication with each other that emperor being a great lover of learning and learned men in an age very barren of that ornament offa at his desire sent him over alsuin a clergyman much celebrated for his knowledge who received great honours from charlemagne and even became his preceptor in the sciences the chief reason why he had at first desired the company of alsuin was that he might oppose his learning to the heresy of felix bishop of urgel in catalonia who maintained that jesus christ considered in his human nature could more properly be denominated the adoptive than the natural son of god this heresy was condemned in the council of frankfort held in seven ninety four and consisting of three hundred bishops such were the questions which were agitated in that age and which employed the attention not only of cloistered scholars but of the wisest and greatest princes egfrith succeeded to his father offa but survived him only five months when he made way for kenulf a descendant of the royal family this prince waged war against kent and taking egbert the king prisoner he cut off his hands and put out his eyes leaving cuthred his own brother in possession of the crown of that kingdom kenulf was killed in an insurrection of the east anglians whose crown his predecessor uffa had usurped he left his son kenelm a minor who was murdered the same year by his sister quendraid who had entertained the ambitious views of assuming the government but she was supplanted by her uncle seolulf who two years after was dethroned by beornulf the reign of this usurper who was not of the royal family was short and unfortunate he was defeated by the west saxons and killed by his own subjects the east angles ludicon his successor underwent the same fate and wiglaf who mounted this unstable throne and found everything in the utmost confusion could not withstand the fortune of egbert who united all the saxon kingdoms into one great monarchy the kingdom of essex this kingdom made no great figure in the heptarchy and the history of it is very imperfect sleda succeeded to his father erkenwin the founder of the monarchy and made way for his son siebert who being nephew to ethelbert king of kent was persuaded by that prince to embrace the christian faith his sons and conjunct successors sexted and seaward relapsed into idolatry and were soon after slain in a battle against the west saxons to show the rude manner of living in that age bede tells us that these two kings expressed great desire to eat the white bread distributed by mellitus the bishop at the communion but on his refusing them unless they would submit to be baptized they expelled him their dominions the names of the other princes who reigned successively in essex are sigebert the little sigebert the good who restored christianity swithem sigeri offa 
This last prince, having made a vow of chastity, notwithstanding his marriage with Kenesuitha, a Mercian princess, daughter to Penda, went in pilgrimage to Rome and shut himself up during the rest of his life in a cloister. Selred, his successor, reigned thirty-eight years and was the last of the royal line, the failure of which threw the kingdom into great confusion and reduced it to dependence under Mercia. Swithard first acquired the crown by the concession of the Mercian princes, and his death made way for Sigaric, who ended his life in a pilgrimage to Rome. His successor, Sigared, unable to defend his kingdom, submitted to the victorious arms of Egbert. End of section 6《Section 7 of Volume 1A of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Raimundo. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1A, Section 7. Chapter 1, Part 5. The Kingdom of Sussex. The history of this kingdom, the smallest in the Heptarchy, is still more imperfect than that of Essex. Alla, the founder of the monarchy, left the crown to his son Chisa, who is chiefly remarkable for his long reign of seventy-six years. During his time, the South Saxons fell almost into a total dependence on the kingdom of Wessex, and we scarcely know the names of the princes who were possessed of this titular sovereignty. Adelwalk, the last of them, was subdued in battle by Cadwalla, king of Wessex, and was slain in the action, leaving two infant sons, who, falling into the hand of the conqueror, were murdered by him. The abbot of Bedford opposed the order for this execution, but could only prevail on Cadwalla to suspend it till they should be baptized. Berkthan and Aurhum, two noblemen of character, resisted some of the violence of the West Saxons, but their opposition served only to prolong the miseries of their country, and the subduing of this kingdom was the first step which the West Saxons made towards acquiring the sole monarchy of England. The Kingdom of Wessex The Kingdom of Wessex, which finally swallowed up all the other Saxon states, met with great resistance on its first establishment, and the Britons, who were now inured to arms, yielded not tamely their possessions to those invaders. Cerdic, the founder of the monarchy, and his son Cainric, fought many successful and some unsuccessful battles against the natives, and the martial spirit, common to all the Saxons, was, by means of these hostilities, carried to the greatest height among this tribe. Cullen, who was the son and successor of Cainric, and who began his reign in 560, was still more ambitious and enterprising than his predecessors, and by waging continual war against the Britons, he added a great part of the counties of Devon and Somerset to his other dominions. Carried along by the tide of success, he invaded the other Saxon states in his neighborhood, and, becoming terrible to all, he provoked a general confederacy against him. This alliance proved successful under the conduct of Ethelbert, king of Kent, and Cowan, who had lost the affection of his own subjects by his violent disposition, and had now fallen into contempt from his misfortunes, was expelled from the throne and died in exile and misery. Quickhelm and Cuthwin, his sons, governed jointly the kingdom till the expulsion of the latter in 591 and the death of the former in 593 made way for Calric, to whom succeeded Kebade in 593, by whose death, which happened in 611, Kinegils inherited the crown. This prince embraced Christianity through the persuasion of Oswald, king of Northumberland, who had married his daughter, and who had attained a great ascendant in the Heptarchy. Cainwalk next succeeded to the monarchy, and dying in 672, left the succession so much disputed that Sexburga, his widow, a woman of spirit, kept possession of the government till her death, which happened two years after. Aishwin then peaceably acquired the crown, and after a short reign of two years, made way for Kentwin, who governed nine years. Kedwalla, his successor, mounted not the throne without opposition, but proved a great prince, according to the ideas of those times. That is, he was enterprising, warlike, and successful. He entirely subdued the kingdom of Sussex, and annexed it to his own dominions. 
he made inroads into kent but met with resistance from widred the king who proved successful against molo brother to kedwalla and slew him in a skirmish kedwalla at last tired with wars and bloodshed was seized with a fit of devotion bestowed several endowments on the church and made a pilgrimage to rome where he received baptism and died in 689 Ina, his successor, inherited the military virtues of Kedwalla, and added to them the more valuable ones of justice, policy, and prudence. He made war upon the Britons in Somerset, and, having finally subdued that province, he treated the vanquished with a humanity hitherto unknown to the Saxon conquerors. He allowed the proprietors to retain possession of their lands, encouraged marriages and alliances between them and his ancient subjects, and gave them the privilege of being governed by the same laws. These laws he augmented and ascertained, and though he was disturbed by some insurrections at home, his long reign of thirty-seven years may be regarded as one of the most glorious and most prosperous of the Heptarchy. In the decline of his age he made a pilgrimage to Rome, and after his return shut himself up in a cloister where he died. Though the kings of Wessex had always been princes of the blood, descended from Cerdic, the founder of the monarchy, the order of succession had been far from exact, and a more remote prince had often found means to mount the throne, in preference to one descended from a nearer branch of the royal family. Ina, therefore, having no children of his own, and lying much under the influence of Ethelburga, his queen, left by will the succession to Adelard, her brother, who was his remote kinsman. But this destination did not take place without some difficulty. Oswald, a prince more nearly allied to the crown, took arms against Adelard, but he being suppressed, and dying soon after, the title of Adelard was not any further disputed, and in the year 741 he was succeeded by his son Cudred. The reign of this prince was distinguished by a great victory, which he obtained by means of Edelhun, his general, over Ethelbod, king of Mercia. His death made way for Siegbert, his kinsman, who governed so ill that his people rose in an insurrection and dethroned him, crowning Canulf in his stead. The exiled prince found a refuge with Duke Cumbrun, governor of Hampshire, who, that he might add new obligations to Siegbert, gave him many salutary counsels for his future conduct, accompanied with some reprehensions for the past. But these were so much resented by the ungrateful prince that he conspired against the life of his protector and treacherously murdered him. After this infamous action, he was forsaken by all the world, and skulking about in the wilds and forests, was at last discovered by a servant of Cumbrin's, who instantly took revenge upon him for the murder of his master. Cainulf, who had obtained the crown on the expulsion of Siegbert, was fortunate in many expeditions against the Britons of Cornwall, but afterwards lost some reputation by his ill success against Ofa, king of Mercia. Cunhard, also, brother to the deposed Siegbert, gave him disturbance, and though expelled the kingdom, he hovered on the frontiers and watched an opportunity for attacking his rival. The king had an intrigue with a young woman, who lived at Merton in Surrey, whither having secretly retired, he was on a sudden environed in the night-time by Keenhard and his followers, and after making a vigorous resistance, was murdered with all his attendants. The nobility and people of the neighborhood, rising next day in arms, took revenge on Cunhard for the slaughter of their king, and put every one to the sword who had been engaged in that criminal enterprise. This event happened in 784. Berthric next obtained possession of the government, though remotely descended from the royal family, but he enjoyed not that dignity without inquietude. Epa, nephew to King Ina, by his brother Ingild, who died before that prince, had begot Atta, father of Alcmund, from whom sprung Egbert, a young man of the most promising hopes, who gave great jealousy to Brithric, the reigning prince, both because he seemed by his birth better entitled to the crown, and because he had acquired, to an eminent degree, the affections of the people. Egbert, sensible of his danger from the suspicions of Brithric, secretly withdrew into France, where he was well received by Charlemagne. By living in the court and serving in the armies of that prince, the most able and most generous that had appeared in Europe during several ages, he acquired those accomplishments which afterwards enabled him to make such a shining figure on the throne, and familiarizing himself to the manners of the French, who, as Malmesbury observes, were eminent both for valor and civility above all the western nations, he learned to polish the rudeness and barbarity of the Saxon character. His early misfortunes thus proved of singular advantage to him. It was not long ere Egbert had opportunities of displaying his natural and acquired talents. Brethric, king of Wessex, had married Adberga, natural daughter of Ofa, king of Mercia, 
a profligate woman, equally infamous for cruelty and for incontinence. Having great influence over her husband, she often instigated him to destroy such of the nobility as were obnoxious to her, and where this expedient failed, she scrupled not being herself active in traitorous attempts against them. She had mixed a cup of poison for a young nobleman, who had acquired her husband's friendship, and had on that account become the object of her jealousy, but unfortunately the king drank of the fatal cup along with his favourite, and soon after expired. This tragical incident, joined to her other crimes, rendered Adberga so odious that she was obliged to fly into France, whence Egbert was at the same time recalled by the nobility, in order to ascend the throne of his ancestors. He attained that dignity in the last year of the 8th century. In the kingdoms of the Heptarchy, an exact rule of succession was either unknown or not strictly observed, and thence the reigning prince was continually agitated with jealousy against all the princes of the blood, whom he still considered as rivals, and whose death alone could give him entire security in his possession of the throne. From this fatal cause, together with the admiration of the monastic life, and the opinion of merit attending the preservation of chastity, even in a married state, the royal families had been entirely extinguished in all the kingdoms except that of Wessex, and the emulations, suspicions, and conspiracies, which had formerly been confined to the princes of the blood alone, were now diffused among all the nobility in the several Saxon states. Egbert was the sole descendant of those first conquerors who subdued Britain, and to enhance their authority by claiming a pedigree from Woden, the supreme divinity of all their ancestors. But that prince, though invited by this favourable circumstance to make attempts on the neighbouring Saxons, gave them for some time no disturbance, and rather chose to turn his arms against the Britons in Cornwall, whom he defeated in several battles. He was recalled from the conquest of that country by an invasion made upon his dominions by Bernulf, king of Mercia. The Mercians, before the accession of Egbert, had very nearly attained the absolute sovereignty in the Heptarchy, they had reduced the East Angles under subjection, and established tributary princes in the kingdoms of Kent and Essex. Northumberland was involved in anarchy, and no state of any consequence remained but that of Wessex, which, much inferior in extent to Mercia, was supported solely by the great qualities of its sovereign. Egbert led his army against the invaders, and encountering them at Elandum in Wiltshire, obtained a complete victory, and by the great slaughter which he made of them in their flight, gave a mortal blow to the power of the Mercians, whilst he himself, in prosecution of his victory, entered their country on the side of Oxfordshire, and threatened the heart of their dominions, he sent an army into Kent, commanded by Aethelwulf, his eldest son, and expelling Baldred. The tributary king soon made himself master of that county. The kingdom of Essex was conquered with equal facility, and the East Angles, from their hatred to the Mercian government, which had been established over them by treachery and violence, and probably exercised with tyranny, immediately rose in arms, and craved the protection of Egbert. Bernulf, the Mercian king, who marched against them, was defeated and slain, and two years after, Ludican, his successor, met with the same fate. These insurrections and calamities facilitated the enterprises of Egbert, who advanced into the centre of the Mercian territories, and made easy conquests over a dispirited and divided people. In order to engage them more easily to submission, he allowed Wiglef, their countryman, to retain the title of king, whilst he himself exercised the real powers of sovereignty. The anarchy which prevailed in Northumberland tempted him to carry still farther his victorious arms, and the inhabitants, unable to resist his power, and desirous of possessing some established form of government, were forward on his first appearance to send deputies, who submitted to his authority and swore allegiance to him as their sovereign. Egbert, however, still allowed to Northumberland, as he had done to Mercia and East Anglia, the power of electing a king, who paid him tribute and was dependent on him. Thus were united all the kingdoms of the Heptarchy in one great state, near four hundred years after the first arrival of the Saxons in Britain, and the fortunate arms and prudent policy of Egbert at last effected what had been so often attempted in vain by so many princes. Kent, Northumberland, and Mercia, which had successively aspired to general dominion, were now incorporated in his empire, and the other subordinate kingdoms seemed willingly to share the same fate. His territories were nearly of the same extent with what is now properly called England, and a favourable prospect was afforded to the Anglo-Saxons of establishing a civilised monarchy possessed of tranquillity within itself and secure against foreign invasion. This great event happened in the year 827. 
the saxons though they had been so long settled in the island seem not as yet to have been much improved beyond their german ancestors either in arts civility knowledge humanity justice or obedience to the laws even christianity though it opened the way to connections between their and the more polished states of europe had not hitherto been very effectual in banishing their ignorance or softening their barbarous manners as they received that doctrine through the corrupted channels of rome it carried along with it a great mixture of credulity and superstition equally destructive to the understanding and to morals the reverence toward saints and relics seems to have almost supplanted the adoration of the supreme being monastic observances were esteemed more meritorious than the active virtues the knowledge of natural causes was neglected from the universal belief of miraculous interpositions and judgments bounty to the church atoned for every violence against society and the remorses for cruelty murder treachery assassination and the more robust vices were appeased not by amendment of life but by penances servility to the monks and an abject and illiberal devotion the reverence for the clergy had been carried to such a height that wherever a person appeared in a sacerdotal habit though on the highway the people flocked around him and showing him all marks of profound respect received every word he uttered as the most sacred oracle even the military virtues so inherent in all the saxon tribes began to be neglected and the nobility preferring the security and sloth of the cloister to the tumults and glory of war valued themselves chiefly on endowing monasteries of which they assumed the government the several kings too being extremely impoverished by continual benefactions to the church to which the states of their kingdoms had weakly assented could bestow no rewards on valour or military services and retained not even sufficient influence to support their government another inconvenience which attained this corrupt species of christianity was the superstitious attachment to rome and the gradual subjection of the kingdom to a foreign jurisdiction the britons having never acknowledged any subordination to the roman pontiff had conducted all ecclesiastical government by their domestic synods and councils but the saxons receiving their religion from roman monks were taught at the same time a profound reverence for that see and were naturally led to regard it as the capital of their religion pilgrimages to rome were represented as the most meritorious acts of devotion not only noblemen and ladies of rank undertook this tedious journey but kings themselves abdicating their crowns sought for a secure passport to heaven at the feet of the roman pontiff new relics perpetually sent from that endless mint of superstition and magnified by lying miracles invented in convents operated on the astonished minds of the multitude and every prince has attained the eulogies of the monks the only historians of those ages not in proportion to his civil and military virtues but to his devoted attachment towards their order and his superstitious reverence for rome the sovereign pontiff encouraged by this blindness and submissive disposition of the people advanced every day in his encroachments on the independence of the english churches wilfrid bishop of lindisfarne the sole prelate of the northumbrian kingdom increased his subjection in the eighth century by his making an appeal to rome against the decisions of an english synod which had abridged his diocese by the erection of some new bishoprics agatho the pope readily embraced this precedent of an appeal to his court and wilfrid though the haughtiest and most luxurious prelate of his age having obtained with the people of the character of sanctity was thus able to lay the foundation of this papal pretension the great topic by which wilfrid confounded the imaginations of men was that st peter to whose custody the keys of heaven were entrusted would certainly refuse admittance to every one who should be wanting in respect to his successor this conceit well suited to vulgar conceptions made great impression on the people during several ages and has not even at present lost all influence in the catholic countries had this abject superstition produced general peace and tranquillity it had made some atonement for the ills attending it but besides the usual avidity of men for power and riches frivolous controversies in theology were engendered by it which were so much the more fatal as they admitted not like the others of any final determination from established possession the disputes excited in britain were of the most ridiculous kind and entirely worthy of those ignorant and barbarous ages 
there were some intricacies observed by all the christian churches in adjusting the day of keeping easter which depended on a complicated consideration of the course of the sun and moon and it happened that the missionaries who had converted the scots and britons had followed a different calendar from that which was observed at rome in the age when augustine converted the saxons the priests also of all the christian churches were accustomed to shave part of their head but the form given to this tonsure was different in the former from what was practised in the latter the scots and britons pleaded the antiquity of their usages the romans and their disciples the saxons insisted on the universality of theirs that easter must necessarily be kept by a rule which comprehended both the day of the year and the age of the moon was agreed by all that the tantra of a priest could not be omitted without the utmost impiety was a point undisputed but the romans and saxons called their antagonists schismatics because they celebrated easter on the very day of the full moon in march if that day fell on a sunday instead of waiting till the sunday following and because they shaved the fore part of their head from ear to ear instead of making that tonsure on the crown of the head and in a circular form in order to render their antagonists odious they affirmed that once in seven years they concurred with the jews in the time of celebrating that festival and that they might recommend their own form of tonsure they maintained that it imitated symbolically the crown of thorns worn by christ in his passion whereas the other form was invented by simon magus without any regard to that representation these controversies had from the beginning excited such animosity between the british and romish priests that instead of concurring in their endeavours to convert the idolatrous saxons they refused all communion together and each regarded his opponent as no better than a pagan the dispute lasted more than a century and was at last finished not by men's discovering the folly of it which would have been too great an effort for human reason to accomplish but by the entire prevalence of the romish ritual over the scotch and british Wilfried, British of Leningsfern, acquired great merit, both with the court of Rome and with all the southern Saxons, by expelling the Quadresimen Schism, as it was called, from the Northumbrian kingdom, into which the neighbourhood of the Scots had formerly introduced it. Theodore, Archbishop of Canterbury, called in the year of 680 a synod at Hatfield, consisting of all the bishops in Britain, where was accepted and ratified the decree of the Lateran Council, summoned by Martin, against the heresy of the Monothelites the council and synod maintained in opposition to these heretics that though the divine and human nature in christ made but one person yet they had different inclinations wills acts and sentiments and that the unity of the person implied not any unity in the consciousness this opinion it seems somewhat difficult to comprehend and no one unacquainted with the ecclesiastical history of those ages could imagine the height of zeal and violence with which it was then inculcated the decree of the Lateran Council calls the Monothelites impious, execrable, wicked, abominable, and even diabolical, and curses and anathematizes them to all eternity. End of section 7. Recording by Jen Raimundo. Section 8 of Volume 1A of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Raimundo. History of England, from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688, by David Hume. Volume 1A, Section 8. Chapter 2, Part 1. The Saxons, from the first introduction of Christianity among them, had admitted the use of images, and perhaps that religion, without some of those exterior ornaments, had not made so quick a progress with these idolaters, but they had not paid any species of worship or address to images, and this abuse never prevailed among Christians, till it received the sanction of the Second Council of Nice. Egbert. The kingdoms of the Heptarchy, though united by a recent conquest, seemed to be firmly cemented into one state under Egbert, and the inhabitants of the several provinces had lost all desire of revolting from that monarch or of restoring their former independent governments their language was everywhere nearly the same their customs laws institutions civil and religious and as the race of the ancient kings was totally extinct in all the subjected states the people readily transferred their allegiance to a prince who seemed to merit it by the splendour of his victories the vigour of his administration and the superior nobility of his birth 
a union also in government opened to them the agreeable prospect of future tranquillity and it appeared more probable that they would thenceforth become formidable to their neighbours than be exposed to their inroads and devastations but these flattering views were soon overcast by the appearance of the danes who during some centuries kept the anglo-saxons in perpetual inquietude committed the most barbarous ravages upon them and at last reduced them to grievous servitude the emperor charlemagne though naturally generous and humane had been induced by bigotry to exercise great severities upon the pagan saxons in germany whom he subdued and besides often ravaging their country with fire and sword he had in cool blood decimated all the inhabitants for their revolts and had obliged them by the most rigorous edicts to make a seeming compliance with the christian doctrine that religion, which had easily made its way among the British Saxons by insinuation and address, appeared shocking to their German brethren when opposed on them by the violence of Charlemagne, and the more generous and warlike of these pagans had fled northward into Jutland, in order to escape the fury of his persecutions. Meeting there with the people of similar manners, they were readily received among them, and they soon stimulated the natives to concur in enterprises which both promised revenge on the haughty conqueror, and afforded subsistence to those numerous inhabitants with which the northern countries were now overburdened. They invaded the provinces of France, which were exposed by the degeneracy and dissensions of Charlemagne's posterity, and being there known under the general name of Normans, which they received from their northern situation, they became the terror of all the maritime and even of the inland countries. They were also tempted to visit England in their frequent excursions, and being able by sudden inroads to make great progress over a people who were not defended by any naval force, who had relaxed their military institutions, and who were sunk into a superstition which had become odious to the Danes and ancient Saxons, they made no distinction in their hostilities between the French and English kingdoms. Their first appearance in this island was in the year 787, when Breathreek reigned in Wessex. A small body of them landed in that kingdom, with the view of learning the state of the country, and when the magistrate of the place questioned them concerning their enterprise, and summoned them to appear before the king and account for their intentions, they killed him, and, flying to their ships, escaped in their own country. The next alarm was given to Northumberland in the year 794, when a body of these pirates pillaged a monastery but their ships being much damaged by a storm, and their leader slain in a skirmish, they were at last defeated by the inhabitants, and the remainder of them put to the sword. Side note 832. Five years after Egbert had established his monarchy over England, the Danes landed in the Isle of Chepe, and having pillaged it, escaped with impunity. They were not so fortunate in their next year's enterprise, when they disembarked from thirty-five ships and were encountered by Egbert at Charmouth in Dorsetshire. The battle was bloody, but though the Danes lost great numbers, they maintained the post which they had taken, and thence made good their retreat to their ships. Having learned by experience that they must expect a vigorous resistance from this warlike prince, they entered into an alliance with the Britons of Cornwall, and landing two years after in that country, made an inroad with their confederates into the county of Devon, but were met at Hendsdown by Egbert, and totally defeated. While England remained in this state of anxiety, and defended itself more by temporary expedience than by any regular plan of administration, Egbert, who alone was able to provide effectually against this new evil, unfortunately died, and left the government to his son Aethelwulf. Aethelwulf. This prince had neither the abilities nor the vigour of his father, and was better qualified for governing a convent than a kingdom. He began his reign with making a partition of his dominions, and delivering over to his eldest son, athelstan the new conquered provinces of essex kent and sussex but no inconveniences seem to have arisen from this partition as the continual terror of the danish invasions prevented all domestic dissension a fleet of these ravagers consisting of thirty-three sail appeared at southampton but were repulsed with loss by wolfhair governor of the neighbouring country the same year Athelham, governor of Dorsetshire, routed another band, which had disembarked at Portsmouth, but he obtained the victory after a furious engagement, and he bought it with the loss of his life. Next year, the Danes made several inroads into England, and fought battles, or rather skirmishes, in East Anglia and Lindsay and Kent, where, though they were sometimes repulsed and defeated, they always obtained their end, of committing spoil upon the country, and carrying off their booty they avoided coming to a general engagement, which was not suited to their plan of operations. Their vessels were small, and ran easily up the creeks and rivers, where they drew them ashore, and, having formed an entrenchment round them, which they guarded with part of their number, the remainder scattered themselves everywhere, and carrying off the inhabitants and cattle and goods, they hastened to their ships and quickly disappeared. If the military force of the county were assembled, 
for there was no time for troops to march from a distance, the Danes either were able to repulse them, and to continue their ravages with impunity, or they betook themselves to their vessels, and, setting sail, suddenly invaded some distant quarter, which was not prepared for their reception. Every part of England was held in continual alarm, and the inhabitants of one county durst not give assistance to those of another, lest their own families and property should in the meantime be exposed by their absence to the fury of these barbarous ravagers. All orders of men were involved in this calamity, and the priests and monks, who had been commonly spared in the domestic quarrels of the Heptarchy, were the chief objects on which the Danish idolaters exercised their rage and animosity. Every season of the year was dangerous, and the absence of the enemy was no reason why any man could esteem himself a moment in safety. These incursions had now become almost annual, when the Danes, encouraged by their successes against France as well as England, for both kingdoms were alike exposed to this dreadful calamity, invaded the last in so numerous a body as seemed to threaten it with universal subjection. But the English, more military than the Britons, whom a few centuries before they had treated with like violence, roused themselves with a vigor proportioned to the exigency. Cyril, governor of Devonshire, fought a battle with one of the body of the Danes at Vigenburg and put them to rout with great slaughter. King Athelstan attacked another at sea, near Sandwich, sunk nine of their ships, and put the rest to flight. A body of them, however, ventured for the first time to take up winter quarters in England, and receiving in the spring a strong reinforcement of their countrymen in three hundred and fifty vessels, they advanced from the Isle of Thanet, where they had stationed themselves, burnt the cities of London and Canterbury, and having put to flight Breathreek, who now governed Mercia under the title of king, they marched into the heart of Surrey, and laid every place waste around them. Aethelwulf, impelled by the urgency of the danger, marched against them at the head of the West Saxons, and, carrying with him his second son, Aethelbald, gave them battle at Oakley, and gained a bloody victory over them. This advantage procured but a short respite to the English, the Danes still maintained their settlement in the Isle of Thanet, and, being attacked by Elher and Huda, governors of Kent and Surrey, though defeated in the beginning of the action, they finally repulsed the assailants, and killed both the governors, removed thence to the Isle of Shepe, where they took up their winter quarters, that they might further extend their devastation and ravages. This unsettled state of England hindered not Aethelwulf from making a pilgrimage to Rome, whither he carried his fourth and favorite son, Alfred, then only six years of age. He passed there a twelvemonth in exercises of devotion, and failed not in that most essential part of devotion, liberality to the Church of Rome. Besides giving presents to the more distinguished ecclesiastics, he made a perpetual grant of three hundred mancuses a year to that see, one-third to support the lamps of St. Peter's, another those of St. Paul's, a third to the Pope himself. In his return home he married Judith, daughter of the Emperor Charles the Bald, but on his landing in England he met with an opposition which he little looked for. His eldest son, Athelstan, being dead, Athelbald, his second, who had assumed the government, formed, in concert with many of the nobles, the project of excluding his father from a throne which his weakness and superstition seemed to have rendered him so ill-qualified to fill. The people were divided between the two princes, and a bloody civil war, joined to all the other calamities under which the English laboured, appeared inevitable, when Aethelwulf had the facility to yield to the greater part of his son's pretensions. He made with him a partition of the kingdom, and taking to himself the eastern part, which was always, at that time, esteemed the least considerable, as well as the most exposed, he delivered over to Aethelbald the sovereignty of the western. Immediately after, he summoned the states of the whole kingdom, and with the same facility conferred a perpetual and important donation on the church. The ecclesiastics, in those days of ignorance, made rapid advances in the acquisition of power and grandeur, and, inculcating the most absurd and most interested doctrines, though they sometimes met, from the contrary interests of the laity, with an opposition which it required time and address to overcome, they found no obstacle in their reason or understanding. Not content with the donations of land made them by the Saxon princes and nobles, and with temporary oblations from the devotion of the people, they had cast a wishful eye on a vast revenue, which they claimed as belonging to them by a sacred and indefeasible title. However little versed in the scriptures, they had been able to discover that, under the Jewish law, a tenth of all the produce of land was conferred on the priesthood, and, forgetting what they themselves taught, that the moral part only of that law was obligatory on Christians, they insisted that this donation conveyed a perpetual property inherent by divine right in those who officiated at the altar. 
During some centuries, the whole scope of sermons and homilies was directed to this purpose, and one would have imagined, from the general tenor of these discourses, that all the practical parts of Christianity were comprised in the exact and faithful payment of tithes to the clergy. Encouraged by their success in inculcating these doctrines, they ventured farther than they were warranted even by the Levitical law, and pretended to draw the tenth of all industry, merchandise, wages of laborers, and pay of soldiers. Nay, some canonists went so far as to affirm that the clergy were entitled to the tithe of the profits made by courtesans in the exercise of their profession. Though parishes had been instituted in England by Honorius, Archbishop of Canterbury, near two centuries before, the ecclesiastics had never yet been able to get possession of the tithes. They therefore seized the present favorable opportunity of making that acquisition, when a weak, superstitious prince filled the throne, and when the people, discouraged by their losses from the Danes, and terrified with the fear of future invasions, were susceptible of any impression which bore the appearance of religion. So meritorious was this concession deemed by the English, that, trusting entirely to supernatural assistance, they neglected the ordinary means of safety, and agreed, even in the present desperate extremity, that the revenues of the church should be exempted from all burdens, though imposed for national defense and security. Ethelbald and Ethelbert Ethelwolf lived only two years after making this grant, and by his will he shared England between his two eldest sons, Ethelbald and Ethelbert, the west being assigned to the former, the east to the latter. Ethelbald was a profligate prince, and marrying Judith, his mother-in-law, gave great offence to the people. But, moved by the remonstrances of Suithune, bishop of Winchester, he was at last prevailed on to divorce her. His reign was short, and Ethelbert, his brother, succeeded to the government, behaved himself, during a reign of five years, in a manner more worthy of his birth and station. The kingdom, however, was still infested by the Danes, who made an inroad and sacked Winchester, but they were defeated. A body also of these pirates, who were quartered in the Isle of Thanet, having deceived the English by a treaty, unexpectedly broke into Kent and committed great outrages. Aethelred Aethelbert was succeeded by his brother Aethelred, who, though he defended himself with bravery, enjoyed, during his whole reign, no tranquillity from those Danish eruptions. His younger brother, Alfred, seconded him in all his enterprises, and generously sacrificed to the public good all resentment which he might entertain on account of his being excluded by Aethelred from a large patrimony which had been left him by his father. The first landing of the Danes in the reign of Aethelred was among the East Angles, who, more anxious for their present safety than for the common interest, entered into a separate treaty with the enemy, and furnished them with horses, which enabled them to make an eruption by land into the kingdom of Northumberland. There they seized the city of York, and defended it against Osbricht and Alia, two Northumbrian princes, who perished in the assault. Encouraged by these successes, and by the superiority which they had acquired in arms, they now ventured, under the command of Hinguar and Huba, to leave the sea-coast, and penetrating into Mercia, they took up their winter quarters at Nottingham, where they threatened the kingdom with a final subjection. The Mercians, in this extremity, applied to Aethelred for succor, and that prince, with his brother Alfred, conducting a great army to Nottingham, obliged the enemy to dislodge, and to retreat into Northumberland. Their restless disposition, and their avidity for plunder, allowed them not to remain long in those quarters. They broke into East Anglia, defeated and took prisoner Edmund, the king of that country, whom they afterwards murdered in cool blood, and committing the most barbarous ravages on the people, particularly on the monasteries, they gave the East Angles cause to regret the temporary relief which they had obtained, by assisting the common enemy. The next station of the Danes was at Reading, whence they infested the neighboring country by their incursions. The Mercians, desirous of shaking off their dependence on Aethelred, refused to join him with their forces, and that prince, attended by Alfred, was obliged to march against the enemy with the West Saxons alone, his hereditary subjects. The Danes, being defeated in an action, shut themselves up in their garrison, but quickly making thence an eruption, they routed the West Saxons and obliged them to raise the siege. An action soon after ensued at Aston, in Berkshire, where the English, in the beginning of the day, were in danger of a total defeat. Alfred, advancing with one division of the army, was surrounded by the enemy in disadvantageous ground, and Aethelred, who was at the time hearing mass, refused to march to his assistance till prayers should be finished. But, as he afterwards obtained the victory, this success, not the danger of Alfred, was ascribed by the monks to the piety of that monarch.
End of section 8. Recording by Jen Raimundo. Section 9 of Volume 1A of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Raimundo. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1A, Section 9. Chapter 2, Part 2. Alfred. This battle of Aston did not terminate the war. Another battle was a little after fought at Bassing, where the Danes were more successful, and being reinforced by a new army from their own country, they became every day more terrible to the English. Amidst these confusions, Aethelred died of a wound which he had received in an action with the Danes, and left the inheritance of his cares and misfortunes, rather than of his grandeur, to his brother Alfred, who was now twenty-two years of age. This prince gave very early marks of those great virtues and shining talents by which, during the most difficult times, he saved his country from utter ruin and subversion. Ethelwulf, his father, the year after his return with Alfred from Rome, had again sent the young prince thither with a numerous retinue, and a report being spread of the king's death, the Pope Leo III gave Alfred the royal unction whether prognosticating his future greatness from the appearances of his pregnant genius, or willing to pretend, even in that age, to the right of conferring kingdoms. Alfred, on his return home, became every day more the object of his father's affections, but being indulged in all youthful pleasures, he was much neglected in his education, and he had already reached his twelfth year, when he was yet totally ignorant of the lowest elements of literature. His genius was first roused by the recital of Saxon poems, in which the queen took delight, and this species of erudition, which is sometimes able to make a considerable progress even among barbarians, expanded those noble and elevated sentiments which he had received from nature. Encouraged by the queen, and stimulated by his own ardent inclination, he soon learned to read those compositions, and proceeded thence to acquire the knowledge of the Latin tongue, in which he met with authors that better prompted his heroic spirit, and directed his generous views. Absorbed in these elegant pursuits, he regarded his accession to royalty rather as an object of regret than of triumph, but being called to the throne, in preference to his brother's children, as well by the will of his father, a circumstance which had great authority with the Anglo-Saxons, as by the vows of the whole nation, and the urgency of public affairs, he shook off his literary indolence, and exerted himself in the defense of his people. He had scarcely buried his brother when he was obliged to take the field in order to oppose the Danes, who had seized Wilton, and were exercising their usual ravages on the countries around. He marched against them with the few troops which he could assemble on a sudden, and, giving them battle, gained at first an advantage, but, by his pursuing the victory too far, the superiority of the enemy's numbers prevailed, and recovered them the day. Their loss, however, in the action was so considerable that, fearing Alfred would receive daily reinforcements from his subjects, they were content to stipulate for a safe retreat, and promised to depart the kingdom. For that purpose they were conducted to London, and allowed to take up winter quarters there, but, careless of their engagements, they immediately set themselves to the committing of spoil on the neighbouring country. Beardhead, king of Mercia, in whose territories London was situated, made a new stipulation with them, and engaged them, by presence of money, to remove to Lindsay, in Lincolnshire, a country which they had already reduced to ruin and desolation. Finding, therefore, no object in that place, either for their rapine or violence, they suddenly turned back upon Mercia, in a quarter where they expected to find it without defence, and, fixing their station at Repton, in Derbyshire, they laid the whole country desolate with fire and sword. Beerhead, despairing of success against an enemy whom no force could resist and no treaties bind abandoned his kingdom and flying to rome took shelter in a cloister he was brother-in-law to alfred and the last who bore the title of king in mercia the west saxons were now the only remaining power in england and though supported by the vigour and abilities of alfred they were unable to sustain the efforts of those ravagers who from all quarters invaded them a new swarm of danes came over this year under three princes Guthrum, Ossetal, and Armand, and having first joined their countrymen at Repton, they soon found the necessity of separating, in order to provide for their subsistence. Part of them, under the command of Haldane, their chieftain, marched into Northumberland, where they fixed their residence, 
part of them took quarters at cambridge whence they dislodged in the ensuing summer and seized wareham in the county of dorset the very centre of alfred's dominions that prince so straitened them in these quarters that they were content to come to a treaty with him and stipulated to depart his country alfred well acquainted with their usual perfidy obliged them to swear upon the holy relics to the observance of the treaty not that he expected they would pay any veneration to the relics but he hoped that if they now violated this oath their impiety would infallibly draw down upon them the vengeance of heaven but the danes little apprehensive of the danger suddenly without seeking any pretence fell upon alfred's army and having put it to rout marched westward and took possession of exeter the prince collected new forces and exerted such vigour that he fought in one year eight battles with the enemy and reduced them to the utmost extremity he hearkened however to new proposals of peace and was satisfied to stipulate with them that they would settle somewhere in england and would not permit the entrance of more ravagers into the kingdom but while he was expecting the execution of this treaty which it seemed the interest of the danes themselves to fulfil he heard that another body had landed and having collected all the scattered troops of their countrymen had surprised chippenham then a considerable town and were exercising their usual ravages all around them this last incident quite broke the spirit of the saxons and reduced them to despair finding that after all the miserable havoc which they had undergone in their persons and in their property after all the vigorous actions which they had exerted in their own defence a new band equally greedy of spoil and slaughter had disembarked among them they believed themselves abandoned by heaven to destruction and delivered over to those swarms of robbers which the fertile north thus incessantly poured forth against them some left their country and retired into wales or fled beyond the sea others submitted to the conquerors in hopes of appeasing their fury by a servile obedience and every man's attention being now engrossed in concern for his own preservation no one would hearken to the exhortations of the king who summoned them to make under his conduct one effort more in defence of their prince their country and their liberties alfred himself was obliged to relinquish the ensigns of his dignity to dismiss his servants and to seek shelter in the meanest disguises from the pursuit and fury of his enemies he concealed himself under a peasant's habit and lived some time in the house of a neat herd who had been entrusted with the care of some of his cows there passed here an incident which has been recorded by all the historians and was long preserved by popular tradition though it contains nothing memorable in itself except so far as every circumstance is interesting which attends so much virtue and dignity reduced to such distress the wife of the neat herd was ignorant of the condition of her royal guest and observing him one day busy by the fireside and trimming his bows and arrows she desired him to take care of some cakes which were toasting while she was employed elsewhere in other domestic affairs but alfred whose thoughts were otherwise engaged neglected this injunction and the good woman on her return finding her cakes all burnt rated the king very severely and upbraided him that he always seemed very well pleased to eat her warm cakes though he was thus negligent in toasting them by degrees alfred as he found the search of the enemy become more remiss collected some of his retainers and retired into the centre of a bog formed by the stagnating waters of the thone and parrot in somersetshire here he found two acres of firm ground and building a habitation on them rendered himself secure by its fortifications and still more by the unknown and inaccessible roads which led to it and by the forests and morasses with which it was every way environed this place he called athelingay or the isle of nobles and it now bears the name of athelney he thence made frequent and unexpected sallies upon the danes who often felt the vigour of his arm but knew not from what quarter the blow came he subsisted himself and his followers by the plunder which he acquired he procured them consolation by revenge and from small successes he opened their minds to hope that notwithstanding his present low condition more important victories might at length attend his valour alfred lay here concealed but not inactive during a twelvemonth when the news of a prosperous event reached his ears and called him to the field who by the dane having spread devastation fire and slaughter over wales had landed in devonshire from twenty-three vessels and laid siege to the castle of keenwith a place situated near the mouth of the small river tow odun earl of devonshire with his followers had taken shelter there and being ill supplied with provisions and even with water he determined by some vigorous blow to prevent the necessity of submitting to the barbarous enemy 
he made a sudden sally on the Danes before sunrising, and taking them unprepared, he put them to rout, pursued them with great slaughter, killed Huba himself, and got possession of the famous Reafin, or enchanted standard, in which the Danes put great confidence. It contained the figure of a raven, which had been woven by the three sisters of Hinguar and Huba, with many magical incantations, and which, by its different movements, prognosticated, as the Danes believed, the good or bad success of any enterprise. When Alfred observed the symptom of successful resistance in his subjects, he left his retreat, but before he would assemble them in arms, or urge them to any attempt which, if unfortunate, might, in their present despondency, prove fatal, he resolved to inspect himself the situation of the enemy, and to judge of the probability of success. For this purpose he entered their camp under the disguise of a harper, and passed unsuspected through every quarter. He so entertained them with his music and facetious humours, that he met with a welcome reception, and was even introduced to the tent of Guthrum, their prince, where he remained some days. He remarked the supine security of the Danes, their contempt of the English, their negligence in foraging and plundering, and their dissolute wasting of what they gained by rapine and violence. Encouraged by these favourable appearances, he secretly sent emissaries to the most considerable of his subjects, and summoned them to a rendezvous, attended by their warlike followers, at Brixton, on the borders of Selwood Forest. The English, who had hoped to put an end to their calamities by servile submission, now found the insolence and rapine of the conqueror more intolerable than all past fatigues and dangers, and at the appointed day they joyfully resorted to their prince. On his appearance, they received him with shouts of applause, and could not satiate their eyes with the sight of this beloved monarch, whom they had long regarded as dead, and who now, with voice and looks expressing his confidence of success, called them to liberty and to vengeance. He instantly conducted them to Eddington, where the Danes were encamped, and taking advantage of his previous knowledge of the place, he directed his attack against the most unguarded quarter of the enemy. The Danes, surprised to see an army of English, whom they considered as totally subdued, and still more astonished to hear that Alfred was at their head, made but a faint resistance, notwithstanding their superiority of number, and were soon put to flight with great slaughter. The remainder of the routed army, with their prince, was besieged by Alfred in a fortified camp to which they fled, but being reduced to extremity by want and hunger, they had recourse to the clemency of the victor, and offered to submit on any conditions." The king, no less generous than brave, gave them their lives, and even formed a scheme for converting them from mortal enemies into faithful subjects and confederates. He knew that the kingdoms of East Anglia and Northumberland were totally desolated by the frequent inroads of the Danes, and he now proposed to repeople them by settling their Guthrum and his followers. He hoped that the new planters would at last betake themselves to industry, when, by reason of his resistance and the exhausted condition of the country, they could no longer subsist by plunder, and that they might serve him as a rampart against any future incursions of their countrymen. But before he ratified these mild conditions with the Danes, he required that they should give him one pledge of their submission and of their inclination to incorporate with the English by declaring their conversion to Christianity. Guthrum and his army had no aversion to the proposal, and, without much instruction, or argument, or conference, they were all admitted to baptism. The king answered for Guthrum at the front, gave him the name of Athelstan, and received him as his adopted son. The success of this expedient seemed to correspond to Alfred's hopes. The greater part of the Danes settled peaceably in their new quarters. Some smaller bodies of the same nation, which were dispersed in Mercia, were distributed into the five cities of Derby, Leicester, Stamford, Lincoln, and Nottingham, and were thence called the Fief, or Five Burghers. The more turbulent and unquiet made an expedition into France under the command of Hastings, and except by a short incursion of Danes, who sailed up the Thames and landed at Fulham, but suddenly retreated to their ships on finding the country in a posture of defence, Alfred was not for some years infested by the inroads of those barbarians. The king employed this interval of tranquillity in restoring order to the state, which had been shaken by so many violent convulsions, in establishing civil and military institutions, in composing the minds of men to industry and justice, and in providing against the return of like calamities. He was, more properly than his grandfather Egbert, the sole monarch of the English, for so the Saxons were now universally called, because the kingdom of Mercia was at last incorporated in his state, and was governed by Ethelbert, his brother-in-law, who bore the title of Earl, 
and though the Danes, who peopled East Anglia and Northumberland, were for some time ruled immediately by their own princes, they all acknowledged a subordination to Alfred, and submitted to his superior authority. As equality among subjects is the great source of concord, Alfred gave the same laws to the Danes and English, and put them entirely on a like footing in the administration both of civil and criminal justice. The fine for the murder of a Dane was the same with that for the murder of an Englishman, the great symbol of equality in those ages. The king, after rebuilding the ruined cities, particularly London, which had been destroyed by the Danes in the reign of Aethelwulf, established a regular militia for the defence of the kingdom. He ordained that all his people should be armed and registered. He assigned them a regular rotation of duty. He distributed part into the castles and fortresses, which he built at proper places. He required another part to take the field on any alarm, and to assemble at stated places of rendezvous and he left a sufficient number at home, who were employed in the cultivation of the land, and who afterwards took their turn in military service. The whole kingdom was like one great garrison, and the Danes could no sooner appear in one place than a sufficient number was assembled to oppose them, without leaving the other quarters defenceless or disarmed. But Alfred, sensible that the proper method of opposing an enemy who made incursions by sea was to meet them on their own element, took care to provide himself with a naval force, which, though the most natural defence of an island, had hitherto been totally neglected by the English. He increased the shipping of his kingdom both in number and strength, and trained his subjects in the practice as well of sailing as of naval action. He distributed his armed vessels in proper stations around the island, and was sure to meet the Danish ships, either before or after they had landed their troops, and to pursue them in all their incursions. Though the Danes might suddenly, by surprise, disembark on the coast, which was generally become desolate by their frequent ravages, they were encountered by the English fleet in their retreat, and escaped not, as formerly, by abandoning their booty, but paid, by their total destruction, the penalty of the disorders which they had committed. In this manner Alfred repelled several inroads of these piratical Danes, and maintained his kingdom, during some years, in safety and tranquillity. A fleet of a hundred and twenty ships of war was stationed upon the coast, and being provided with warlike engines, as well as with expert seamen, both Frisians and English, for Alfred supplied the defects of his own subjects by engaging able foreigners in his service, maintained a superiority over those smaller bands with which England had so often been infested. But at last Hastings, the famous Danish chief, Having ravaged all the provinces of France, both along the sea-coast and the Loire and the Seine, and being obliged to quit that country, more by the desolation which he himself had occasioned than by the resistance of the inhabitants, appeared off the coast of Kent with a fleet of three hundred and thirty sail. The greater part of the enemy disembarked in the Rother and seized the fort of Appledore. Hastings himself, commanding a fleet of eighty sail, entered the Thames, and fortifying Milton in Kent, began to spread his forces over the country, and to commit the most destructive ravages. But Alfred, on the first alarm of this descent, flew to the defence of his people, at the head of a select band of soldiers, whom he always kept about his person, and, gathering to him the armed militia from all quarters, appeared in the field with a force superior to the enemy all straggling parties whom necessity or love of plunder had drawn to a distance from their chief encampment were cut off by the english and these pirates instead of increasing their spoil found themselves cooped up in their fortifications and obliged to subsist by the plunder which they had brought from france tired of the situation which must in the end prove ruinous to them the danes at appledore rose suddenly from their encampment with an intention of marching towards the thames and passing over into essex but they escaped not the vigilance of Alfred, who encountered them at Farnham, put them to rout, seized all their horses and baggage, and chased the runaways on board their ships, which carried them up the Colne to Mercy in Essex, where they entrenched themselves. Hastings, at the same time, and probably by concert, made a like movement, and, deserting Milton, took possession of Bamfleet, near the Isle of Canvey, in the same county, where he hastily threw up fortifications for his defence against the power of Alfred. Unfortunately for the English, Guthrum, prince of the East Anglian Danes, was now dead, as was also Guthred, whom the king had appointed governor of the Northumbrians, and those restless tribes, being no longer restrained by the authority of their princes, and being encouraged by the appearance of so great a body of their countrymen, broke into rebellion, shook off the authority of Alfred, and yielding to their inveterate habits of war and depredation, embarked on board two hundred and forty vessels, and appeared before Exeter in the west of England. Alfred lost not a moment in opposing this new enemy. 
having left some forces at london to make head against hastings and the other danes he marched suddenly to the west and falling on the rebels before they were aware pursued them to their ships with great slaughter end of section nine recording by jen raimundo section ten of volume one a of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Hoffman. History of England, from the invasion of Julius Caesar to the revolution of 1688, by David Hume. Volume 1A, Section 10. Chapter 2, Part 3. These ravagers, sailing next to Sussex, began to plunder the country near Chichester, but the order which Alfred had everywhere established sufficed here, without his presence, for the defense of the place, and the rebels, meeting with a new repulse, in which many of them were killed, and some of their ships taken, were obliged to put again to sea, and were discouraged from attempting any other enterprise. Meanwhile the Danish invaders in Essex, having united their force under the command of Hastings, advanced into the inland country, and made spoil of all around them, but soon had reason to repent of their temerity. The English army left in London, assisted by a body of the citizens, attacked the enemy's entrenchments at Bamfleet, overpowered the garrison, and, having done great execution upon them, carried off the wife and two sons of Hastings. Alfred generously spared these captives, and even restored them to Hastings, on condition that he should depart the kingdom. But, though the king had thus honorably rid himself of this dangerous enemy, he had not entirely subdued or expelled the invaders. The piratical Danes willingly followed in an excursion any prosperous leader who gave them hopes of booty, but were not so easily induced to relinquish their enterprise or submit to return, baffled without plunder, into their native country. Great numbers of them, after the departure of Hastings, seized and fortified Chobury, at the mouth of the Thames, and, having left a garrison there, they marched along the river till they came to Boddington, in the country of Gloucester, where, being reinforced by some Welsh, they threw up entrenchments and prepared for their defense. The king here surrounded them with the whole force of his dominions, and, as he had now a certain prospect of victory, he resolved to trust nothing to chance, but rather to master his enemies by famine than assault they were reduced to such extremities that having eaten their own horses and having many of them perished with hunger they made a desperate sally upon the english and though the greater number fell in the action a considerable body made their escape these roved about for some time in england still pursued by the vigilance of alfred they attacked leicester with success defended themselves in hartford and then fled to quatford where they were finally broken and subdued the small remains of them either dispersed themselves among their countrymen in Northumberland and East Anglia, or had recourse again to the sea, where they exercised piracy under the command of Sigefert, a Northumbrian. This freebooter, well acquainted with Alfred's naval preparations, had framed vessels of a new construction, higher and longer and swifter than those of the English. But the king soon discovered his superior skill by building vessels still higher and longer and swifter than those of the Northumbrians, and, falling upon them while they were exercising their ravages in the west, he took twenty of their ships, and, having tried all the prisoners at Winchester, he hanged them as pirates, the common enemies of mankind. The well-timed severity of this execution, together with the excellent posture of defense established everywhere, restored full tranquility in England, and provided for the future security of the government. The East Anglian and Northumbrian Danes, on the first appearance of Alfred upon their frontiers, made anew the most humble submissions to him, and he thought it prudent to take them under his immediate government, without establishing over them a viceroy of their own nation. The Welsh also acknowledged his authority, and this great prince had now, by prudence and justice and valor, established his sovereignty over all the southern parts of the island from the english channel to the frontiers of scotland when he died in the vigor of his age and the full strength of his faculties 
after a glorious reign of twenty-nine years and a half, in which he deservedly attained the appellation of Alfred the Great, and the title of founder of the English monarchy. The merit of this prince, both in private and public life, may with advantage be set in opposition to that of any monarch or citizen which the annals of any age or any nation can present to us. He seems indeed to be the model of that perfect character which, under the denomination of a sage or wise man, philosophers have been fond of delineating, rather as a fiction of their imagination than in hopes of ever seeing it really existing. So happily were all his virtues tempered together, so justly were they blended, and so powerfully did each prevent the other from exceeding its proper boundaries. He knew how to reconcile the most enterprising spirit with the coolest moderation, the most obstinate perseverance with the easiest flexibility, the most severe justice with the gentlest lenity, the greatest vigor in commanding with the most perfect affability of deportment, the highest capacity and inclination for science with the most shining talents for action. His civil and his military virtues are almost equally the objects of our admiration, excepting only that the former, being more rare among princes, as well as more useful, seem chiefly to challenge our applause. Nature also, as if desirous that so bright a production of her skill should be set in the fairest light, had bestowed on him every bodily accomplishment, vigor of limbs, dignity of shape and air, with a pleasing, engaging, and open countenance. Fortune alone, by throwing him into that barbarous age, deprived him of historians worthy to transmit his fame to posterity, and we wish to see him delineated in more lively colors, and with more particular strokes, that we may at least perceive some of those small specks and blemishes from which, as a man, it is impossible he could be entirely exempted. But we should give but an imperfect idea of Alfred's merit, were we to confine our narration to his military exploits, and were not more particular in our account of his institutions for the execution of justice, and of his zeal for the encouragement of arts and sciences. After Alfred had subdued, and had settled or expelled the Danes, he found the kingdom in the most wretched condition desolated by the ravages of those barbarians, and thrown into disorders which were calculated to perpetuate its misery. Though the great armies of the Danes were broken, the country was full of straggling troops of that nation, who, being accustomed to live by plunder, were become incapable of industry, and who, from the natural ferocity of their manners, indulged themselves in committing violence, even beyond what was requisite to supply their necessities. The English themselves, reduced to the most extreme indigence by those continued depredations, had shaken off all bands of government, and those who had been plundered to-day betook themselves next day to a like disorderly life, and, from despair, joined the robbers in pillaging and ruining their fellow citizens. These were the evils for which it was necessary that the vigilance and activity of Alfred should provide a remedy." that he might render the execution of justice strict and regular he divided all england into counties these counties he subdivided into hundreds and the hundreds into tithings every householder was answerable for the behavior of his family and slaves and even of his guests if they lived above three days in his house ten neighboring householders were formed into one corporation who under the name of a tithing decenary or Freeburg, were answerable for each other's conduct, and over whom one person, called a tithing man, Hedberg, or Bushholder, was appointed to preside. Every man was punished as an outlaw who did not register himself in some tithing, and no man could change his habitation without a warrant or certificate from the Bushholder of the tithing to which he formerly belonged. When any person, in any tithing or decenary, was guilty of a crime, the Borsholder was summoned to answer for him, and, if he were not willing to be surety for his appearance, and his clearing himself, the criminal was committed to prison, and there detained till his trial. If he fled, either before or after finding sureties, the Borsholder and Decenary became liable to inquiry, and were exposed to the penalties of law. Thirty-one days were allowed them for producing the criminal, and, if that time elapsed without their being able to find him, the Borsholder, with two other members of the decenary, was obliged to appear, and, together with three chief members of the three neighboring decenaries, 
making twelve in all, to swear that his decenary was free from all privity, both of the crime committed and of the escape of the criminal. If the Borsholder could not find such a number to answer for their innocence, the decenary was compelled by fine to make satisfaction to the king, according to the degree of the offense. By this institution, every man was obliged, from his own interest, to keep a watchful eye over the conduct of his neighbors, and was in a manner surety for the behavior of those who were placed under the division to which he belonged, whence these decenaries received the name of Frank Pledges. Such a regular distribution of the people, with such a strict confinement in their habitation, may not be necessary in times when men are more inured to obedience and justice, and it might perhaps be regarded as destructive of liberty and commerce in a polished state, but it was well calculated to reduce that fierce and licentious people under the salutary restraint of law and government. But Alfred took care to temper these rigors by other institutions favorable to the freedom of the citizens, and nothing could be more popular and liberal than his plan for the administration of justice. The Borsholder summoned together his whole decenary to assist him in deciding any lesser differences which occurred among the members of this small community, in affairs of greater moment, in appeals from the decenary, or in controversies arising between members of different decenaries, the cause was brought before the hundred, which consisted of ten decenaries, or a hundred families of freemen, and which was regularly assembled once in four weeks, for the deciding of causes. Their method of decision deserves to be noted as being the origin of juries, an institution admirable in itself, and the best calculated for the preservation of liberty and the administration of justice that ever was devised by the wit of man. Twelve freeholders were chosen, who, having sworn, together with the hundreder, or presiding magistrate of that division, to administer impartial justice, proceeded to the examination of that cause which was submitted to their jurisdiction. And beside these monthly meetings of the hundred, there was an annual meeting, appointed for a more general inspection of the police of the district, for the inquiry into crimes, the correction of abuses in magistrates, and the obliging of every person to show the decenary in which he was registered. The people, in imitation of their ancestors, the ancient Germans, assembled there in arms, whence a hundred was sometimes called a wapentake, and its court served both for the support of military discipline and for the administration of civil justice. The next superior court to that of the hundred was the county court, which met twice a year, after Michaelmas and Easter, and consisted of the freeholders of the county, who possessed an equal vote in the decision of causes. The bishop presided in this court, together with the aldermen, and the proper object of the court was the receiving of appeals from the hundreds and decenaries, and the deciding of such controversies as arose between men of different hundreds. Formerly, the aldermen possessed both the civil and military authority, but Alfred, sensible that this conjunction of powers rendered the nobility dangerous and independent, appointed also a sheriff in each county, who enjoyed a coordinate authority with the former in the judicial function. His office also empowered him to guard the rights of the crown in the county, and to levy the fines imposed, which in that age formed no contemptible part of the public revenue. There lay an appeal, in default of justice, from all these courts, to the king himself in council, and as the people, sensible of the equity and great talents of Alfred, placed their chief confidence in him, he was soon overwhelmed with appeals from all parts of England. He was indefatigable in the dispatch of these causes but, finding that his time must be entirely engrossed by this branch of duty, he resolved to obviate the inconvenience by correcting the ignorance or corruption of the inferior magistrates from which it arose. He took care to have his nobility instructed in letters and the laws. He chose the earls and sheriffs from among the men most celebrated for probity and knowledge, he punished severely all malversation in office, and he removed all the earls whom he found unequal to the trust, allowing only some of the more elderly to serve by a deputy till their death should make room for more worthy successors. The better to guide the magistrates in the administration of justice, Alfred framed a body of laws, which, though now lost, served long as the basis of English jurisprudence, and is generally deemed the origin of what is denominated the common law. 
he appointed regular meetings of the states of england twice a year in london a city which he himself had repaired and beautified and which he thus rendered the capital of the kingdom the similarity of these institutions to the customs of the ancient germans to the practice of the other northern conquerors and to the saxon laws during the heptarchy prevents us from regarding alfred as the sole author of this plan of government and leads us rather to think that like a wise man he contented himself with reforming extending and executing the institutions which he found previously established but on the whole such success attended his legislation that everything bore suddenly a new face in england robberies and iniquities of all kinds were repressed by the punishment or reformation of the criminals and so exact was the general police that alfred it is said hung up by way of bravado golden bracelets near the highways and no man dared to touch them yet amidst these rigors of justice this great prince preserved the most sacred regard to the liberty of his people and it is a memorable sentiment preserved in his will that it was just the english should forever remain as free as their own thoughts as good morals and knowledge are almost inseparable in every age though not in every individual the care of alfred for the encouragement of learning among his subjects was another useful branch of his legislation and tended to reclaim the english from their former dissolute and ferocious manners but the king was guided in this pursuit less by political views than by his natural bent and propensity towards letters when he came to the throne he found the nation sunk into the grossest ignorance and barbarism proceeding from the continued disorders in the government and from the ravages of the danes the monasteries were destroyed the monks butchered or dispersed their libraries burnt and thus the only seats of erudition in those ages were totally subverted alfred himself complains that on his accession he knew not one person south of the thames who could so much as interpret the latin service and very few in the northern parts who had reached even that pitch of erudition but this prince invited over the most celebrated scholars from all parts of europe he established schools everywhere for the instruction of his people he founded at least repaired the university of oxford and endowed it with many privileges revenues and immunities he enjoined by law all freeholders possessed of two hides of land or more to send their children to school for their instruction he gave preferment both in church and state to such only as had made some proficiency in knowledge and by all these expedients he had the satisfaction before his death to see a great change in the face of affairs and in a work of his which is still extant he congratulates himself on the progress which learning under his patronage had already made in england but the most effectual expedient employed by alfred for the encouragement of learning was his own example and the constant assiduity with which notwithstanding the multiplicity and urgency of his affairs he employed himself in the pursuits of knowledge he usually divided his time into three equal portions one was employed in sleep and the refection of his body by diet and exercise another in the dispatch of business a third in study and devotion and that he might more exactly measure the hours he made use of burning tapers of equal length which he fixed in lanterns an expedient suited to that rude age when the geometry of dialing and the mechanism of clocks and watches were totally unknown and by such a regular distribution of his time though he often labored under great bodily infirmities this martial hero who fought in person fifty-six battles by sea and land was able during a life of no extraordinary length to acquire more knowledge and even to compose more books than most studious men though blessed with the greatest leisure and application have in more fortunate ages made the object of their uninterrupted industry sensible that the people at all times especially when their understandings are obstructed by ignorance and bad education are not much susceptible of speculative instruction alfred endeavored to convey his morality by apologues parables stories apothegms couched in poetry and besides propagating among his subjects former compositions of that kind which he found in the saxon tongue he exercised his genius in inventing work of a like nature as well as in translating from the greek the elegant fables of aesop he also gave saxon translations of orosius's and bede's histories 
and of Boethius concerning the consolation of philosophy, and he deemed it no wise derogatory from his other great characters of sovereign, legislator, warrior, and politician, thus to lead the way to his people in the pursuits of literature. Meanwhile, this prince was not negligent in encouraging the vulgar and mechanical arts, which have a more sensible, though not a closer connection with the interests of society. He invited, from all quarters, industrious foreigners to repeople his country, which had been desolated by the ravages of the Danes. He introduced and encouraged manufacturers of all kinds, and no inventor or improver of any ingenious art did he suffer to go unrewarded. He prompted men of activity to betake themselves to navigation, to push commerce into the most remote countries, and to acquire riches by propagating industry among their fellow citizens. He set apart a seventh portion of his own revenue for maintaining a number of workmen, whom he constantly employed in rebuilding the ruined cities, castles, palaces, and monasteries. Even the elegances of life were brought to him from the Mediterranean and the Indies and his subjects, by seeing those productions of the peaceful arts, were taught to respect the virtues of justice and industry from which alone they could arise. Both living and dead, Alfred was regarded by foreigners, no less than by his own subjects, as the greatest prince, after Charlemagne, that had ever appeared in Europe during several ages, and as one of the wisest and best that had ever adorned the annals of any nation. Alfred had, by his wife Ethelswitha, daughter of a Mercian earl, three sons and three daughters. The eldest son, Edmund, died without issue in his father's lifetime. The third, Ethelward, inherited his father's passion for letters and lived a private life. The second, Edward, succeeded to his power and passes by the appellation of Edward the Elder, being the first of that name who sat on the English throne. End of section 10 Recording by Robert Hoffman Section 11 of Part 1 of Volume 1A of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Fisher History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume Volume 1A, Section 11 Chapter 11, Part 4 Edward the Elder The prince, who equaled his father in military talents, though inferior to him in knowledge and erudition, found immediately on his accession a specimen of that turbulent life to which all princes and even all individuals were exposed in any age when men less restrained by law or justice and less occupied by industry had no ailment for their inadequate outwars insurrections convulsions rapine and depression ethelwald his cousin german son of king ethelbert the elder brother of alfred insisted on his preferable title and arming his partisans took possession of winburn where he seemed determined to defend himself to the last extremity and to await the issue of his pretensions but when the king approached the town with a great army ethelwald having the prospect of certain destruction made his escape and fled first into normandy thence into northumberland where he hoped that the people who had been recently subdued by alfred and who were impatient of peace would on the intelligence of that great prince's death seize the first pretense or opportunity of rebellion the event did not disappoint his expectations the northumbrians declared for him and ethelwald having thus connected his interests with the danish tribes went beyond sea, and collecting a body of these freebooters, he excited the hopes of all those who had been accustomed to subsist by rapine and violence. East Anglican Danes joined his party, the Five Burgers, who were seated in the heart of Mercia, began to put themselves in motion. 
and the English found that they were again menaced with these convulsions from which the valor and policy of Alfred had so lately rescued them. The rebels, headed by Ethelwald, an incursion into the counties of Gloucester, Oxford, and Wilts, and having exercised their ravages in these places, they retired with their booty before the king, who had assembled an army, was able to approach them. Edward, however, who was determined that his preparations should not be fruitless, conducted his forces into East Anglia, and retaliated the injuries which the inhabitants had committed by spreading the like devastation among them. Satiated with revenge and loaded with booty, he gave orders to retire, but the authority of those ancient kings, which was feeble in peace, was not much better established in the field. The Kentish men, greedy of more spoil, ventured contrary to repeated orders to stay behind him, and to take up their quarters in Bury. This disobedience proved, in the issue, fortunate to Edward. The Danes assaulted the Kentish men, but met so vigorous a resistance, that though they gained the field of battle, they bought that advantage by the loss of their bravest leaders, and among the rest, by that Ethelwald who perceived in the action. The king, freed from the fear of so dangerous a competitor, made peace on advantageous terms with the East Angles. In order to restore England to such a state of tranquillity as it was then capable of attaining, naught was wanting but the subjection of the Northumbrians, who, assisted by the scattered Danes in Mercia, continually infested the bowels of the kingdom. Edward, in order to divert the force of these enemies, prepared a fleet to attack them by sea, hoping that when his ships appeared on their coast, they must at least remain at home and provide for their defense but the northumbrians were less anxious to secure their own property than greedy to commit spoil on their enemy and concluding that the chief strength of the english was embarked on board the fleet they thought the opportunity favorable and entered edward's territories with all their forces the king who was prepared against this event attacked them on their return at Teton Hill in the county of Stafford, put them to root, recovered all the booty, and pursued them with great slaughter into their own country. All the rest of Edward's reign was the scene of continued and successful action against the Northumbrians, the East Angles, the Five Burgers, and the Foreign Danes, who invaded him from Normandy and Brittany. Nor was he let provident in putting his kingdom in a posture of defense, than vigorous in assaulting the enemy. He forfeited the towns of Chester, Edisbury, Warwick, Sherbury, Buckingham, Towcester, Malden, Huntingdon, and Colchester. He fought two signal battles at Thamesford and Malden. He vanquished Thurket Hill, a great Danish chief, and obliged him to retire with his followers into France in quest of spoil and adventures he subdued the east angles and forced them to swear allegiance to him he expelled the two rival princes of northumberland reginald and sidruck and acquired for the present the dominion of that province several tribes of the britons were subjected by him and even the scots who during the reign of egbert had under the conduct of kenneth their king increased their power by the final subjection of the picts were nevertheless obliged to give him marks of submission. In all these fortunate achievements, he was ass assisted by the activity and prudence of his sister, Ethelfelda, who was widow of Ethelbert, Earl of Mercia, and who, after her husband's death, retained the government of that province. This princess, who had been reduced to extremity in childbed, refused afterwards all commerce with her husband not from any weak superstition as was common in that age but because she deemed all domestic occupations unworthy of her masculine and ambitious spirit she died before her brother and edward during the remainder of his reign took upon himself the immediate government of mercia which before had been entrusted to the authority of a governor 
the saxon chronicle fixes the death of this prince in nine twenty five his kingdom devolved to athelstan his natural son athelstan the stan in his prince's birth was not in those times deemed so considerable as to exclude him from the throne and athelstan being of age as well as of a capacity fitted for government obtained the preference to edward's younger children who though legitimate were of two tender years to rule the nation so much exposed both to foreign invasion and to domestic convulsions some discontents however prevailed on his accession and alfred a nobleman of considerable power was thence encouraged to enter into con a conspiracy against him this incident is related by historians with circumstances which the reader according to the degree of credit he is disposed to give them may impute either by the invention of monks who forged them or their artifice who found means of making them real alfred it is said being seized upon strong suspicions but without any certain proof firmly denied the conspiracy imputed to him and in order to justify himself he offered to swear to his innocence before the pope whose person it was supposed contained such superior sanctity that no one could presume to give a false oath in his presence and yet hoped to escape the immediate vengeance of heaven the king accepted of the condition and alfred was conducted to rome where either conscious of his innocence or neglecting the suspicion to which he appealed he ventured to make the oath required of him before john who then filed papal chair but no sooner had he pronounced the fatal words than he fell into convulsions of which three days after he expired the king as if the guilt of the conspirator were now fully ascertained confiscated his estate and made a present of it to the monastery of malmesbury secure that no doubts would ever thenceforth be entertained concerning the justice of his proceeding the dominion of athelstan was no sooner established over his english subjects than he endeavoured to give security to the government by providing against the insurrections of the danes which had created so much disturbance to his predecessors he marched into northumberland and finding that the inhabitants bore with impatience the english yoke he thought it prudent to confer on sithric a danish nobleman the title of king and to attach him to his interests by giving him his sister editha in marriage but this policy proved by accident the source of dangerous consequences sithric died in a twelve month after and his two sons by a former marriage anlaf and godfred founding pretensions on their father's elevation assumed the sovereignty without waiting for athelstan's constant they were soon expelled by the power of that monarch and the former took shelter in ireland as the latter did in scotland where he received during some time protection from constantine who then enjoyed the crown of that kingdom the scottish prince however continually solicited and even menaced by athelstan at last promised to deliver up his guest but secretly detesting the treachery he gave godfrey a warning to make his escape and that fugitive after subsisting by piracy for some years freed the king by his death from any further anxiety athelstan resenting constantine's behaviour entered scotland with an army in ravaging the country with impunity he reduced the scots to such distress that their king was content to preserve his crown by making submissions to the enemy the english historians assert that constantine did homage to athelstan for his kingdom and they add that the later prince being urged by his courtiers to push the present favourable opportunity and entirely subdue scotland replied that it was more glorious to confer than conquer kingdoms but those annals so uncertain and imperfect in themselves lost all credit on national prepositions and animosities of place and on that account the scotch historians who without having any more knowledge of the matter strenuously deny the fact seem more worthy of belief 
Constantine, whether he owned the retaining of his crown to the moderation of Athelstan, who was unwilling to employ all his advantages against him, or to the policy of that prince who esteemed the humiliation of an enemy, a greater acquisition than the subjection of disconnected and mutinous people thought the behavior of the English monarch more an object of resentment than of gratitude. He entered into a confederacy with Enal and Enlaf, who had collected a great body of Danish pirates, whom he found hovering in the Irish seas, and with some Welsh princes, who were terrified at the growing power of Athelstan, and all these allies made by concert an eruption with a great army into England. Athelstan, collecting his forces, met the enemy near Brunsbury in Northumberland, and defeated them in a general engagement. This victory was chiefly ascribed to the valor of Turpetel, the English Chancellor, for in those turbulent ages no one was so much occupied in civil employments as wholly to lay aside in the military character. There is a circumstance, not unworthy of notice, which historians relate, with regard to the transactions of this war. And Laff, on the approach of the English army, thought that he could not venture too much to ensure a fortunate event and employing the artifice formerly practised by alfred against the danes he entered the enemy's camp in the habit of a minstrel the stratagem was for the present attended with like success he gave such satisfaction to the soldiers who flocked about him that they introduced him to the king's tent and anlaf having played before the prince and his nobles during their repast was dismissed with a handsome reward his prudence kept him from refusing the present. Doubt his pride determined him on his departure to bury it, while he fancied that he was espied by all the world. But a soldier in Athelstan's camp, who had formerly served under Anlaf, had been struck with some suspicion on the first appearance of the minstrel, and was engaged by curiosity to observe all his motions. He regarded this last action as a full proof of Anlaf's disguise, and he immediately carried the intelligence to Athelstan, who blamed him for not sooner giving him information that he might have seized the enemy. Then the soldier told him that as he had formerly sworn felthy to Anlaf, he could never have pardoned himself the treachery of betraying and ruining his ancient master, and that Athelstan himself, after such an instance of his criminal conduct, would have an equal reason to distrust his, distrust his allegiance. Athelstan, having praised the generosity of the soldier's principles, reflected on the incident, which he foresaw might be attended with important consequences. He removed his station in the camp, and as a bishop arrived that evening with a reinforcement of troops, for the ecclesiastics were then no less warlike than the civil magistrates, he occupied with his train that very place, which had been left vacant by the king's removal. The precaution of Athelstan was found prudent, for no sooner had darkness fallen than Anlaf broke into the camp, and hastening directly to the place where he had left the king's tent, put the bishop to death before he had time to prepare for his defense. There fell several Danish and Welsh princes in the action of Burnsbury, and Constantine and Anlaf made their escape with difficulty leaving the greater part of the army on the field of battle. After this success, Athelstan enjoyed his crown in tranquility, and he is regarded as one of the ablest and most active of those ancient princes. He passed a remarkable law, which was calculated for the encouragement of commerce, and which it required some liberality of mind in that age to have devised, that a merchant who had made three long sea voyages on his own account should be admitted to the rank of a thane or gentleman. This prince died in Gloucester in the year 941, after a reign of sixteen years, and was succeeded by Edmund, his legitimate brother. Edmund. Edmund, on his accession, made with disturbance from the restless Northumbrians, who lay in wait for every opportunity of breaking into rebellion, but marching suddenly with his forces into their country, he so overawed the rebels that they endeavored to appease him by the most humble submissions. In order to give him the surer pledge of their obedience, they offered to embrace Christianity, a religion which the English Danes had frequently professed 
when reduced to difficulties, but which, for that very reason, they regarded as a badge of servitude, and shook off as soon as a favorable opportunity offered. Edmund, trusting little to their sincerity in this forced submission, used the precaution of removing the five burghers from the towns of Mercia, in which they had been allowed to settle, because it was always found that they took advantage of every commotion, and introduced their rebellious or foreign Danes into the heart of the kingdom. He also conquered Cumberland from the Britons, and conferred the, the territory of Malcolm, king of Scotland, on condition that he should do him homage for it, and protect the north from all future incursions of the Danes. Edmund was young when he came to the crown, yet his reign short as his death was violent. One day he was solemnizing a festival in the country of Gloucester. He remarked that Leolf, a notorious robber, whom he had sentenced to banishment, had yet the boldness to enter the hall where he himself dined, and to sit at table with his attendants. Enraged at this insolence, he offered him to leave the room, but on his refusing to obey the king, whose temper, naturally choleric, was inflamed by this additional insult, leaped on himself and seized him by the hair, but the ruffian pushed to extremity drew his dagger and gave edmund a wound of which he immediately expired this event happened in the year nine forty six and in the sixth year of the king's reign edmund left male issue but so young that they were incapable of governing the kingdom and his brother edward was promoted to the throne end of section eleven recording by aaron fisher if you would like you can visit my website at Critical Thinkers, that's Critical Thinkers with a Z, T-H-I-N-K-E-R-Z dot com. Section 12 of Part 1 of Volume 1A of the History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.T. Macduff. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1A, Section 12. Chapter 2, Part 5. Edred. The reign of this prince, as those of his predecessors, was disturbed by the rebellions and incursions of the Northumbrian Danes, who, though frequently quelled, were never entirely subdued, nor had ever paid a sincere allegiance to the crown of England. The accession of a new king seemed to them a favorable opportunity for shaking off the yoke, but on Edred's appearance with an army, they made him their wanted submissions, and the king, having wasted the country with fire and sword as a punishment of their rebellion, obliged them to renew their oaths of allegiance, and he straight retired with his forces. The obedience of the Danes lasted no longer than the present terror. Provoked at the devastations of Edred, and even reduced by necessities to subsist on plunder, they broke into a new rebellion and were again subdued, but the king, now instructed by experience, took greater precautions against their future revolt. He fixed English garrisons in their most considerable towns, and placed over them an English governor who might watch all their motions and suppress any insurrection on its first appearance. He obliged also Malcolm, king of Scotland, to renew his homage for the lands which he held in England. Edred, though not unwarlike nor unfit for active life, lay under the influence of the lowest superstition, and had blindly delivered over his conscience to the guidance of Dunstan, commonly called St. Dunstan, abbot of Glastonbury, whom he advanced to the highest offices, and who covered, under the appearance of sanctity, the most violent and most insolent ambition. Taking advantage of the implicit confidence reposed in him by the king, this churchman imported into England a new order of monks, who much changed the state of ecclesiastical affairs, and excited on their first establishment the most violent commotions. From the introduction of Christianity among the Saxons, there had been monasteries in England, and these establishments had extremely multiplied by the donations of the princes and nobles, whose superstition, derived from their ignorance and precarious life, and increased by remorses for the crimes into which they were so frequently betrayed, knew no other expedient for appeasing the deity than a profuse liberality toward the ecclesiastics. 
but the monks had hitherto been a species of secular priests, who lived after the manner of the present canons or prebendaries, and were both intermingled in some degree with the world, and endeavored to render themselves useful to it. They were employed in the education of youth, they had the disposal of their own time and industry, they were not subject to the rigid rules of an order, they had made no vows of implicit to their superiors, and they still retained the choice, without quitting the convent, either of a married life or a single life. But a mistaken piety had produced in Italy a new species of monks, called Benedictines, who, carrying farther the planned sibyl principles of mortification, secluded themselves entirely from the world, renounced all claim to liberty, and made a merit of the most inviolable chastity. These practices and principles, which superstition at first engendered, were greedily embraced and promoted by the policy of the court of Rome. The Roman pontiff, who was making every day great advances toward an absolute sovereignty over the ecclesiastics, perceived that the celibacy of the clergy alone could break off entirely their connection with the civil power, and depriving them of every other object of ambition, engaged them to promote with unceasing industry the grandeur of their own order. He was sensible that so long as the monks were indulged in marriage and were permitted to rear families, they could never be subjected to strict discipline or reduced to that slavery under their superiors which was requisite to procure the mandates issued from Rome a ready and zealous obedience. Celibacy, therefore, began to be extolled as the indispensable duty of priests, and the Pope undertook to make all the clergy throughout the Western world renounce at once the privilege of marriage, a fortunate policy but at the same time an undertaking the most difficult of any, since he had the strongest propensities of human nature to encounter, and found that the same connections with the female sex, which generally encouraged devotion, were here unfavorable to the success of his project. It is no wonder, therefore, that this master-stroke of art should have met with violent contradiction, and that the interests of the hierarchy and the inclination of the priests, being now placed in this singular opposition, should, notwithstanding the continued efforts of Rome, have retarded the execution of that bold scheme during the course of near three centuries. Dunstan was born of noble parents in the west of England, and being educated under his uncle, Aldhelm, then Archbishop of Canterbury, had betaken himself to the ecclesiastical life, and had acquired some character in the court of Edmund. He was, however, represented to that prince as a man of licentious manners, and finding his fortune blasted by these suspicions, his ardent ambition prompted him to repair his indiscretions by running into an opposite extreme. He secluded himself entirely from the world. He framed a cell so small that he could neither stand erect in it, nor stretch out his limbs during his repose, and here he employed himself perpetually, either in devotion or in manual labor. It is probable that his brain became gradually crazed by these solitary occupations, and that his head was filled with chimeras, which, being believed by himself and his stupid votaries, procured him the general character of sanctity among the people. He fancied that the devil, among the frequent visits which he paid him, was one day more earnest than usual in his temptations, till Dunstan, provoked at his importunity, seized him by the nose with a pair of red-hot pincers, as he put his head into the cell, and he held him there till that malignant spirit made the whole neighborhood resound with his bellowings. This notable exploit was seriously credited and extolled by the public. It is transmitted to posterity by one who, considering the age in which he lived, may pass for a writer of some elegance, and it ensured to Dunstan a reputation which no real piety, much less virtue, could, even in the most enlightened period, have ever procured him with the people. Supported by the character obtained in his retreat, Dunstan appeared again in the world, and gained such an ascendant over Edred, who had succeeded to the crown, as made him not only the director of that prince's conscience, but his counsellor in the most momentous affairs of government. He was placed at the head of the treasury, and being thus possessed both of power at court and of credit with the populace, he was enabled to attempt with success the most arduous enterprises. Finding that his advancement had been owing to the opinion of his austerity, he professed himself a partisan of the rigid monastic rules, and after introducing that reformation into the convents of Glastonbury and Abingdon, he endeavored to render it universal in the kingdom. The minds of men were already well prepared for this innovation. The praises of an inviolable chastity had been carried to the highest extravagance by some of the first preachers of Christianity among the Saxons. 
the pleasures of love had been represented as incompatible with Christian perfection, and a total abstinence from all commerce with the sex was deemed such a meritorious penance as was sufficient to atone for the greatest enormities. The consequence seemed natural that those, at least, who officiated at the altar should be cleared of this pollution, and when the doctrine of transubstantiation, which was now creeping in, was once fully established, the reverence to the real body of Christ and the Eucharist bestowed on this argument an additional force and influence. The monks knew how to avail themselves of all these popular topics, and to set off their own character to the best advantage. They affected the greatest austerity of life and manners. They indulged themselves in the highest strains of devotion. They inveighed bitterly against the vices and pretended luxury of the age. They were particularly vehement against the dissolute lives of the secular clergy, their rivals. Every instance of libertinism in any individual of that order was represented as a general corruption, and where other topics of defamation were wanting, their marriage became a sure subject of invective, and their wives received the name of concubine, or other more opprobrious appellation. The secular clergy, on the other hand, who were numerous and rich and possessed of the ecclesiastical dignities, defended themselves with vigor and endeavored to retaliate upon their adversaries. The people were thrown into agitation, and few instances occurred of more violent dissensions, excited by the most material differences in religion, or rather by the most frivolous, since it is a just remark that the more affinity there is between theological parties, the greater commonly is their animosity. The progress of the monks, which was become considerable, was somewhat retarded by the death of Edred, their partisan, who expired after a reign of nine years. He left children, but as they were infants, his nephew, Edwy, son of Edmund, was placed on the throne. Edwy, at the time of his accession, was not above sixteen or seventeen years of age, was possessed of the most amiable figure, and was even endowed, according to authentic accounts, with the most promising virtues. He would have been the favorite of his people had he not unhappily at the commencement of his reign been engaged in a controversy with the monks, whose rage neither the graces of the body nor virtues of the mind could mitigate, and who had pursued his memory with the same unrelenting vengeance which they exercised against his person and dignity during his short and unfortunate reign. There was a beautiful princess of the royal blood called Elgiva, who had made impression on the tender heart of Edwy and as he was of an age when the force of the passions first began to be felt, he had ventured, contrary to the advice of his gravest counsellors and the remonstrances of the more dignified ecclesiastics, to espouse her, though she was within the degrees of affinity prohibited by the canon law. As the austerity affected by the monks made them particularly violent on this occasion, Edwy entertained a strong prepossession against them, and seemed on that account determined not to second their project of expelling the seculars from all the convents, and of possessing themselves of those rich establishments. War was therefore declared between the king and the monks, and the former soon found reason to repent his provoking such dangerous enemies. On the day of his coronation, his nobility were assembled in a great hall and were indulging themselves in that riot and disorder which, from the example of their German ancestors, had become habitual to the English. When Edwy, attracted by softer pleasures, retired into the queen's apartment, and in that privacy gave reins to his fondness towards his wife, which was only moderately checked by the presence of her mother. Dunstan conjectured the reason of the king's retreat, and carrying along with him Odo, Archbishop of Canterbury, over whom he had gained an absolute ascendant, he burst into the apartment, upbraided Edwy with his lasciviousness, probably bestowed on the queen the most opprobrious epithet that can be applied to her sex, and tearing him from her arms, pushed him back in a disgraceful manner into the banquet of the nobles. Edwy, though young and opposed by the prejudices of the people, found an opportunity of taking revenge for this public insult. He questioned Dunstan concerning the administration of the treasury during the reign of his predecessor, and when that minister refused to give any account of money expended, as he affirmed by orders of the late king, he accused him of malversation in his office and banished him the kingdom. But Dunstan's cabal was not inactive during his absence. They filled the public with high panegyrics on his sanctity. They exclaimed against the impiety of the king and queen, and having poisoned the minds of the people by these declamations, they proceeded to still more outrageous acts of violence against the royal authority. 
Archbishop Odo sent into the palace a party of soldiers who seized the queen and having burned her face with the rod-hot iron in order to destroy that fatal beauty which had seduced Edwy, they carried her by force into Ireland, there to remain in perpetual exile. Edwy, finding it vain to resist, was obliged to consent to his divorce, which was pronounced by Odo, and a catastrophe still more dismal awaited the unhappy Algiva. That amiable princess, being cured of her wounds, and having even obliterated the scars with which Odo had hoped to deface her beauty, returned into England, and was flying to the embraces of the king whom she still regarded as her husband, when she fell into the hands of a party whom the primate had sent to intercept her. Nothing but her death could now give security to Odo and the monks, and the most cruel death was requisite to satiate their vengeance. She was hamstringed, and expired a few days after at Gloucester in the most acute torments. The English, blinded with superstition, instead of being shocked with this inhumanity, exclaimed that the misfortunes of Edwy and his consort were just judgment for their dissolute contempt of the ecclesiastical statutes. They even proceeded to rebellion against their sovereign, and having placed Edgar at their head, the younger brother of Edwy, a boy of thirteen years of age, they soon put him in possession of Mercia, Northumberland, East Anglia, and chased Edwy into the southern counties. That it might not be doubtful at whose instigation this revolt was undertaken, Dunstan returned into England and took upon him the government of Edgar and his party. He was first installed in the See of Worcester, then in that of London, and on Odo's death and the violent expulsion of Brithelm, his successor, in that of Canterbury, of all which he long kept possession. Odo is transmitted to us by the monks under the character of a man of piety. Dunstan was even canonized, and is one of those numerous saints of the same stamp who disgrace the Romish calendar. Meanwhile, the unhappy Edwy was excommunicated and pursued with unrelenting vengeance. But his death, which happened soon after, freed his enemies from all future inquietude and gave Edgar peaceable possession of the government. End of section 12. Recording by S.T. Macduff. Section 13 of Part 1 of Volume 1A of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.T. Macduff. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1A, Section 13. This prince, who mounted the throne in such early youth, soon discovered an excellent capacity in the administration of affairs, and his reign is one of the most fortunate that we meet with in the ancient English history. He showed no aversion to war, he made the wisest preparation against invaders, and by his vigor and foresight he was enabled without any danger of suffering insults to indulge his inclination towards peace and to employ himself in supporting and improving the internal government of his kingdom. He maintained a body of disciplined troops, which he quartered in the north, in order to keep the mutinous Northumbrians in subjection, and to repel the inroads of the Scots. He built and supported a powerful navy, and that he might retain the seamen in the practice of their duty and always present a formidable armament to his enemies, he stationed three squadrons off the coast and ordered them to make, from time to time, the circuit of his dominions. The foreign Danes dared not to approach a country which appeared in such a posture of defense. The domestic Danes saw inevitable destruction to be the consequence of their tumults and insurrections. The neighboring sovereigns, the King of Scotland, the Princes of Wales, of the Isle of Man, of the Orkneys, and even of Ireland, were reduced to pay submission to so formidable a monarch. He carried his superiority to a great height, and might have excited a universal combination against him, had not his power been so well established as to deprive his enemies of hopes of shaking it. It is said that, residing once at Chester, and having proposed to go by water to the Abbey of St. John the Baptist, he obliged eight of his tributary princes to row him in a barge upon the Dee. The English historians are fond of mentioning the name of Kenneth the Third, King of Scots, among the number. The Scottish historians either deny the fact or assert that their king, if he ever acknowledged himself a vassal to Edgar, did him homage, not for his crown, but for the dominions which he held in England. 
But the chief means by which Edgar maintained his authority and preserved public peace was the paying of court to Dunstan and the monks, who had at first placed him on the throne, and who, by their pretensions to superior sanctity and purity of manners, had acquired an ascendant over the people. He favored their scheme for dispossessing the secular canons of all the monasteries. He bestowed preferment on none but their partisans. He allowed Dunstan to resign the See of Worcester into the hands of Oswald, one of his creatures, and to place Ethelwald, another of them, in that of Winchester. He consulted these prelates in the administration of all ecclesiastical and even in that of many civil affairs, and though the vigor of his own genius prevented him from being implicitly guided by them, the king and the bishops found such advantages in their mutual agreement that they always acted in concert and united their influence in preserving the peace and tranquility of the kingdom. In order to complete the great work of placing the new order of monks in all the convents, Edgar summoned a general council of the prelates and the heads of the religious orders. He here inveighed against the dissolute lives of the secular clergy, the smallness of their tonsure, which it is probable maintained no longer any resemblance to the crown of thorns, their negligence in attending the exercise of their function, their mixing with the laity in the pleasures of gaming, hunting, dancing, and singing, and their openly living with concubines, by which it is commonly supposed he meant their wives. He then turned himself to Dunstan, the primate, and in the name of King Edred, whom he supposed to look down from heaven with indignation against all those enormities, he thus addressed him, It is you, Dunstan, by whose advice I founded monasteries, built churches, and expended my treasure in the support of religion and religious houses. You were my counselor and assistant in all my schemes. You were the director of my conscience. To you I was obedient in all things. When did you call for supplies, which I refused you? Was my assistance ever wanting to the poor? Did I deny support and establishments to the clergy and the convents? Did I not hearken to your instructions, who told me that these charities were of all others the most grateful to my Maker, and fixed a perpetual fund for the support of religion? And are all our pious endeavors now frustrated by the dissolute lives of the priests? Not that I throw any blame on you. You have reason, besought, inculcated, inveighed, but it now behooves you to use sharper and more vigorous remedies, and conjoining your spiritual authority with the civil power to purge effectually the temple of God from thieves and intruders. It is easy to imagine that this harangue had the desired effect, and that, when the king and prelates thus concurred with popular prejudices, it was not long before the monks prevailed, and established their new discipline in almost all the convents. We may remark that the declamations against the secular clergy are, both here and in all the historians, conveyed in general terms. And as that order of men are commonly restrained by the decency of their character, it is difficult to believe that the complaints against their dissolute manners could be so universally just as is pretended. It is more probable that the monks paid court to the populace by an affected austerity of life, and representing the most innocent liberties taken by the other clergy as great and unpardonable enormities, thereby preparing the way for the increase of their own power and influence. Edgar, however, like a true politician, concurred with the prevailing party, and he even indulged them in pretensions which, though they might, when complied with, engage the monks to support royal authority during his own reign, proved afterwards dangerous to his successors, and gave disturbance to the whole civil power. He seconded the policy of the court of Rome in granting to some monasteries an exemption from episcopal jurisdiction. He allowed the convents, even those of royal foundation, to usurp the election of their own abbot, and he admitted their forgeries of ancient charters, by which, from the pretended grant of former kings, they assumed many privileges and immunities. These merits of Edgar have procured him the highest panegyrics from the monks, and he has transmitted to us, not only under the character of a consummate statesman and an active prince, praises to which beseems to have been justly entitled, but under that of a great saint and a man of virtue. But nothing could more betray both his hypocrisy and inveighing against the licentiousness of the secular clergy, and the interested spirit of his partisans in bestowing such eulogies on his piety, than the usual tenor of his conduct, which was licentious to the highest degree, and violated every law, human and divine. Yet those very monks, who, as we are told by Ingolf, a very ancient historian, had no idea of any moral or religious merit except chastity and obedience, not only connived at his enormities, 
but loaded him with the greatest praises. History, however, has preserved some instances of his amours, from which, as from a specimen, we may form a conjecture of the rest. Edgar broke into a convent, carried off Editha a nun by force, and even committed violence on her person. For this act of sacrilege he was reprimanded by Dunstan, and that he might reconcile himself to the church he was obliged not to separate from his mistress, but to abstain from wearing his crown during seven years, and to deprive himself so long of that vain ornament, a punishment very unequal to that which had been inflicted on the unfortunate Edwy, who, for a marriage which in the strictest sense could only deserve the name of irregular, was expelled his kingdom, saw his queen treated with singular barbarity, was loaded with calumnies, and has been represented to us under the most odious colors. Such is the ascendant which may be attained by hypocrisy and cabal over mankind. There was another mistress of Edgar's with whom he first formed a connection by a kind of accident. Passing one day by Andover, he lodged in the house of a nobleman, whose daughter, being endowed with all the graces of person and behavior, inflamed him at first sight with the highest desire, and he resolved by any expedient to gratify it. As he had not leisure to employ courtship or address for attaining his purpose, he went directly to her mother, declared the violence of his passion, and desired that the young lady might be allowed to pass that very night with him. The mother was a woman of virtue, and determined not to dishonor her daughter and her family by compliance. But being well acquainted with the impetuosity of the king's temper, she thought it would be easier as well as safer to deceive than refuse him. She feigned, therefore, a submission to his will, but secretly ordered a waiting-maid of no disagreeable figure to steal into the king's bed, after all the company should be retired to rest. In the morning before daybreak the damsel, agreeably to the injunctions of her mistress, offered to retire, but Edgar, who had no reserve in his pleasures, and whose love to his bedfellow was rather inflamed by enjoyment, refused his consent, and employed force and entreaties to detain her. Ephleda, for that was the name of the maid, trusting to her own charms and to the love with which she hoped she had now inspired the king, made probably but a faint resistance, and the return of light discovered the deceit to Edgar. He had passed the night so much to his satisfaction that he expressed no displeasure with the old lady on account of her fraud. His love was transferred to Ephleda. She became his favorite mistress and maintained her ascendant over him till his marriage with Elfrida. The circumstances of his marriage with this lady were more singular and more criminal. Elfrida was daughter and heir of Olgar, Earl of Devonshire, and though she had been educated in the country and had never appeared at court, she had filled all England with the reputation of her beauty. Edgar himself, who was indifferent to no accounts of this nature, found his curiosity excited by the frequent panegyrics which he heard of Elfrida, and reflecting on her noble birth, he resolved, if he found her charms answerable to their fame, to obtain possession of her on honorable terms. He communicated his intention to Earl Athelwald, his favorite, but used the precaution, before he made any advances to her parents, to order that nobleman on some pretense to pay them a visit, and to bring him a certain account of the beauty of their daughter. Athelwold, when introduced to the young lady, found general report to have fallen short of the truth, and being actuated by the most vehement love, he determined to sacrifice to this new passion his fidelity to his master, and to the trust reposed in him. He returned to Edgar and told him that the riches alone and high quality of Elfrida had been the ground of the admiration paid her, and that her charms, far from being any wise extraordinary, would have been overlooked in a woman of inferior station. When he had, by this deceit, diverted the king from his purpose, he took an opportunity after some interval of turning again the conversation on Elfrida. He remarked that though the parentage and fortune of the lady had not produced on him, as on others, any illusion with regards to her beauty, he could not forbear reflecting that she would, on the whole, be an advantageous match for him, and might, by her birth and riches, make him sufficient compensation for the homeliness of her person. If the king therefore gave no approbation, he was determined to make proposals in his own behalf to the Earl of Devonshire, and doubted not to obtain his, as well as the young lady's consent to the marriage. Edgar, pleased with an expedient for establishing his favorite's fortune, not only exhorted him to execute his purpose, but forwarded his success by his recommendations to the parents of Elfrida, and Athelwald was soon made happy in the possession of his mistress. Dreading, however, the detection of the artifice, 
he employed every pretense for detaining Elfrida in the country and for keeping her at a distance from Edgar. The violent passion of Athelwold had rendered him blind to the necessary consequences which must attend his conduct, and the advantages which the numerous enemies that always pursue a royal favorite would, by its means, be able to make against him. Edgar was soon informed of the truth. But before he would execute vengeance on Ethelwold's treachery, he resolved to satisfy himself with his own eyes of the certainty and full extent of his guilt. He told him that he intended to pay him a visit in his castle, and be introduced to the acquaintance of his new-married wife. And Athelwold, as he could not refuse the honor, only craved leave to go before him a few hours, that he might better prepare everything for his reception. He then discovered the whole matter to Elfrida, and begged her, if she had any regard either to her own honor or his life, to conceal from Edgar by every circumstance of dress and behavior that fatal beauty which had seduced him from fidelity to his friend, and had betrayed him into so many falsehoods. Elfrida promised compliance, though nothing was farther from her intentions. She deemed herself little beholden to Athelwald for a passion which had deprived her of a crown, and knowing the force of her own charms, she did not despair, even yet, of reaching that dignity of which her husband's artifice had bereaved her. She appeared before the king with all the advantages which the richest attire and the most engaging airs could bestow upon her, and she excited at once in his bosom the highest love towards herself, and the most furious desire of revenge against her husband. He knew, however, how to dissemble on these passions, and seducing Athelwold into a wood, on pretense of hunting, he stabbed him with his own hand, and soon after publicly espoused Elfrida. Before we conclude our account of this reign, we must mention two circumstances which are remarked by historians. The reputation of Edgar allured a great number of foreigners to visit his court, and he gave them encouragement to settle in England. We are told they imported all the vices of their respective countries and contributed to corrupt the simple manners of the natives. But as this simplicity of manners so highly and often so injudiciously extolled did not preserve them from barbarity and treachery, the greatest of all vices, and the most incident to a rude, uncultivated people, we ought perhaps to deem their acquaintance with foreigners rather an advantage as it tended to enlarge their views, and to cure them of those illiberal prejudices and rustic manners to which islanders are often subject. Another remarkable incident of this reign was the extirpation of wolves from England. This advantage was attained by the industrious policy of Edgar. He took great pains in hunting and pursuing those ravenous animals, and when he found that all that escaped him had taken shelter in the mountains and forests of Wales, he changed the tribute of money imposed on the Welsh princes of Athelstan, his predecessor, into an annual tribute of three hundred heads of wolves, which produced such diligence in hunting them that the animal has been no more seen in this island. Edgar died after a reign of sixteen years, and in the thirty-third year of his age. He was succeeded by Edward, whom he had by his first marriage with the daughter of Earl Ordmer. Edward the Martyr the succession of this prince, who was only fifteen years of age at his father's death, did not take place without much difficulty and opposition. Elfrida, his stepmother, had a son, Ethelred, seven years old, whom she attempted to raise to the throne. She affirmed that Edgar's marriage with the mother of Edward was espoused to insuperable objections, and as she had possessed great credit with her husband, she had found means to acquire partisans who seconded all her pretensions. But the title of Edward was supported by many advantages. He was appointed successor by the will of his father. He was approaching to man's estate, and might soon be able to take into his own hands the reins of government. The principal nobility, dreading the imperious temper of Clarida, were adverse to her son's government, which must enlarge her authority, and probably put her in possession of the regency. Above all, Dunstan, whose character of sanctity had given him the highest credit with the people, had espoused the cause of Edward, over whom he had already acquired a great ascendant, and he was determined to execute the will of Edgar in his favor. To cut off all opposite pretensions, Dunstan resolutely anointed and crowned the young prince at Kingston, and the whole kingdom, without further dispute, submitted to him. It was of great importance to Dunstan and the monks to place on the throne a king favorable to their cause. The secular clergy had still partisans in England who wished to support them in the possession of the convents and of the ecclesiastical authority. On the first intelligence of Edgar's death, Alfir, 
duke of mercia expelled the new orders of monks from all the monasteries which lay within his jurisdiction but elfwin duke of east anglia and brithnot duke of the east saxons protected them within their territories and insisted upon the execution of the late laws enacted in their favour in order to settle this controversy there were summoned several synods which according to the practice of those times consisted partly of ecclesiastical members partly of the lay nobility the monks were able to prevail in these assemblies though as it appears contrary to the secret wishes if not the declared inclination of the leading men in the nation they had more invention in forging miracles to support their cause or having been so fortunate as to obtain by their pretended austerities the character of piety their miracles were more credited by the populace in one synod dunstan finding the majority of votes against him rose up and informed the audience that he had that instant received an immediate revelation in behalf of the monks the assembly was so astonished at this intelligence or probably so overawed by the populace that they proceeded no farther in their deliberations in another synod a voice issued from the crucifix and informed the members that the establishment of the monks was founded on the will of heaven and could not be opposed without impiety but the miracle performed in the third synod was still more alarming the floor of the hall in which the assembly met sunk of a sudden and a great number of the members were either bruised or killed by the fall it was remarked that dunstan had that day prevented the king from attending the synod and that the beam on which his own chair stood was the only one that did not sink under the weight of the assembly but these circumstances instead of begetting any suspicion of contrivance were regarded as the surest proof of the immediate interposition of providence in behalf of those favorites of heaven edward lived four years after his ascension and there passed nothing memorable during his reign his death alone was memorable and tragical this young prince was endowed with the most amiable innocence of manners and as his own intentions were always pure he was incapable of entertaining any suspicion against others though his stepmother had opposed his succession and had raised a party in favor of her own son he always showed her marks of regard and even expressed on all occasions the most tender affection towards his brother he was hunting one day in dorsetshire and being led by the chase near corf castle where elfrida resided he took the opportunity of paying her a visit unattended by any of his retinue and he thereby presented her with the opportunity which she had long wished for after he had mounted his horse he desired some liquor to be brought him while he was holding the cup to his head a servant of elfrida approached him and gave him a stab behind the prince finding himself wounded put spurs to his horse but becoming faint by loss of blood he fell from the saddle his foot stuck in the stirrup and he was dragged along by his unruly horse till he expired being tracked by the blood his body was found and was privately interred at Wareham by his servants the youth and the innocence of this prince with his tragical death begat such compassion among the people that they believed miracles to be wrought at his tomb and they gave him the appellation of martyr though his murder had no connection with any religious principle or opinion elfrida built monasteries and performed many penances in order to atone for her guilt but could never by all her hypocrisy or remorses recover the good opinion of the public though so easily deluded in those ignorant ages end of section 13 recording by s t macduff section 14 of volume 1a of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of 1688 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of 1688 by david hume volume 1a section 14 chapter 3 part 1 ethelred the freedom which england had so long enjoyed from the depredations of the danes seems to have proceeded partly from the establishments which that piratical nation had obtained in the north of france and which employed all then superfluous hands to people and maintain them 
partly from the vigour and warlike spirit of a long race of English princes, who preserved the kingdom in a posture of defence by sea and land, and either prevented or repelled every attempt of the invaders. But a new generation of men, being now sprung up in the northern regions, who could no longer disburden themselves on Normandy, the English had reason to dread that the Danes would again visit an island to which they were invited, both by the memory of their past successes, and by the expectation of assistance from their countrymen, who, though long established in the kingdom, were not yet thoroughly incorporated with the natives, nor had entirely forgotten their inveterate habits of war and depredation. And as the remaining prince was a minor, and even when he attained to a man's estate, never discovered either courage or capacity sufficient to govern his own subjects, much less to repel a formidable enemy, the people might justly apprehend the worst calamities from so dangerous a crisis. The Danes, before they durst tempt any important enterprise against England, made an inconsiderable descent by way of trial, and having landed from seven vessels near Southampton, they ravaged the country, enriched themselves by spoil, and departed with impunity. Six years after they made a like attempt in the west, and met with success. The invaders, having now found affairs in a very different situation from that in which they formerly appeared, encouraged their countrymen to assemble a greater force, and to hope for more considerable advantages. They landed in Essex, under the command of two leaders, and having defeated and slain at Malden, Brithnot, duke of that county, who ventured with a small body to attack them, they spread their devastations all over the neighbouring provinces. In this extremity, Ethelred, to whom historians gave the epithet of the unready, instead of rousing his people to defend with courage their honour and their property, hearkened to the advice of Siricius, Archbishop of Canterbury, which was seconded by many of the degenerate nobility, and paying the enemy the sum of ten thousand pounds, he bribed them to depart the kingdom. This shameful expedient was attended with the success which might be expected. The Danes next year appeared off the eastern coast, in hopes of subduing a people who defended themselves by their money, which invited assailants instead of their arms, which repelled them. But the English, sensible of their folly, had in the interval assembled in a great council, and had determined to collect at London a fleet able to give battle to the enemy, though that judicious measure failed of success from the treachery of Ulfric, Duke of Mercia, whose name is infamous in the annals of that age by the calamities which his repeated perfidy brought upon his country. This nobleman had, in 983, succeeded to his father Alfair, in that extensive command, but being deprived of it two years after and banished the kingdom, he was obliged to employ all his intrigue and all his power which was too great for a subject to be restored to his country and reinstated in his authority. Having had experience of the credit and malevolence of his enemies, he thenceforth trusted for security not to his services or to the affections of his fellow citizens, but to the influence which he had obtained over his vassals, and to the public calamities which he thought must in every revolution render his assistance necessary. Having fixed this resolution, he determined to prevent all such successes as might establish the royal authority or render his own situation dependent or precarious. As the English had formed the plan of surrounding and destroying the Danish fleet in harbour, 
he privately informed the enemy of their danger, and when they put to sea in consequence of this intelligence, he deserted to them, with the squadron under his command the night before the engagement, and thereby disappointed all the efforts of his countrymen. Ethelred, enraged at his perfidy, seized his son Alfgar, and ordered his eyes to be put out. But such was the power of Ulfric that he again forced himself into authority, and though he had given this specimen of his character, and received this grievous provocation, it was found necessary to entrust him anew with the government of Mercia. This conduct of the court, which in all its circumstances is so barbarous, weak, and imprudent, both merited and prognosticated the most grievous calamities. The northern invaders, now well acquainted with the defenceless condition of England, made a powerful descent under the command of Swain, king of Denmark, and Olav, king of Norway, and sailing up the Humber spread on all sides their destructive ravages. Lindesey was wade-laced, Banbury was destroyed, and all the Northumbrians, though mostly of Danish descent, were constrained either to join the invaders or to suffer under their depredations. A powerful army was assembled to oppose the Danes, and a general action ensued. But the English were deserted in the battle from the cowardice or treachery of their three leaders, all of them men of Danish race, Freyna, Frithigist, and Godwin, who gave the example of a shameful flight to the troops under their command. Encouraged by this success, and still more by the contempt which it inspired for their enemy, the pirates ventured to attack the centre of the kingdom, and entering the Thames in ninety-four vessels, laid siege to London, and threatened it with total destruction. But the citizens, alarmed at the danger, and firmly united among themselves, made a bolder defence than the cowardice of the nobility and gentry gave the invaders reason to apprehend. And the besiegers, after suffering the greatest hardships, were finally frustrated in their attempt. In order to revenge themselves, they laid waste Essex, Sussex, and Hampshire, and having there procured horses, they were thereby enabled to spread through the more inland counties the fury of their depredations. In this extremity Ethelred and his nobles had recourse to the former expedient, and sending ambassadors to the two northern kings, they promised them subsistence and tribute, on condition they would for the present put an end to their ravages, and soon after depart the kingdom. Swain and Olav agreed to the terms, and peaceably took up their quarters at Southampton, where the sum of sixteen thousand pounds was paid to them. Olav even made a journey to Andover, where Ethelred resided, and he received the right of confirmation from the English bishops, as well as many rich presents from the king. He here promised that he would never more infest the English territories, and he faithfully fulfilled the engagement. This prince receives the appellation of St. Olav from the Church of Rome, and notwithstanding the general presumption which lies either against the understanding or morals of every one who in those ignorant ages was dignified with that title, he seems to have been a man of merit and virtue. Swain, though less scrupulous than Olav, was constrained upon the departure of the Norwegian prince to evacuate also the kingdom with all his followers. This composition brought only a short interval to the miseries of the English. The Danish pirates appeared soon after in the Severn, and having committed spoil in Wales, as well as in Cornwall and Devonshire, they sailed round to the south coast, and entering the Tamar completed the devastation of these two counties. They then returned to the Bristol Channel, 
and penetrating into the country by the Avon, spread themselves over all that neighbourhood, and carried fire and sword even into Dorsetshire. They next changed the seat of war, and after ravaging the Isle of Wight, they entered the Thames and Medway, and laid siege to Rochester, where they defeated the Kentish men in a pitched battle. After this victory the whole province of Kent was made a scene of slaughter, fire, and devastation. The extremity of these miseries forced the English into councils for common defence, both by sea and land, but the weakness of the king, the divisions among the nobility, the treachery of some, the cowardice of others, the want of concert in all, frustrated every endeavour. Their fleets and armies either came too late to attack the enemy, or were repulsed with dishonour, and the people were thus equally ruined by resistance or by submission. The English, therefore, destitute both of prudence and unanimity in council, of courage and conduct in the field, had recourse to the same weak expedient which, by experience, they had already found so ineffectual. They offered the Danes to buy peace by paying them a large sum of money. These ravagers rose continuously in their demands, and now required the payment of twenty-four thousand pounds, to which the English were so mean and imprudent as to submit. The departure of the Danes procured them another short interval of repose, which they enjoyed as if it were to be perpetual, without making any effectual preparations for a more vigorous resistance upon the next return of the enemy. Besides receiving this sum, the Danes were engaged by another motive to depart a kingdom which appeared so little in a situation to resist their efforts. They were invited over by their countrymen in Normandy, who at this time were hard pressed by the arms of Robert, King of France, and who found it difficult to defend the settlement which, with so much advantage to themselves and glory to their nation, they had made in that country. It is probable also that Ethelred, observing the close connections thus maintained among all the Danes, however divided in government or situation, was desirous of forming an alliance with that formidable people. For this purpose, being now a widower, he made his addresses to Emma, sister of Richard the Second, Duke of Normandy, and he soon succeeded in his negotiation. The princess came over this year to England, and was married to Ethelred. In the end of the ninth and beginning of the tenth century, when the north, not yet exhausted by that multitude of people, or rather nations, which she had successively emitted, sent forth a new race, not of conquerors as before, but of pirates and ravagers who infested the countries possessed by her once warlike sons, lived Rollo, a petty prince or chieftain in Denmark, whose valour and abilities soon engaged the attention of his countrymen. He was exposed in his youth to the jealousy of the king of Denmark, who attacked his small but independent principality, and who, being foiled in every assault, had recourse at last to perfidy for effecting his purpose, which he had often attempted in vain by force of arms. He lulled Rollo into security by an insidious peace, and falling suddenly upon him, murdered his brother and his bravest officers, and forced him to fly for safety into Scandinavia. Here, many of his ancient subjects, induced partly by affection to their prince, partly by the oppressions of the Danish monarch, ranged themselves under his standard, and offered to follow him in every enterprise. Rollo, instead of attempting to recover his paternal dominions, 
where he must expect a vigorous resistance from the Danes, determined to pursue an easier but more important undertaking, and to make his fortune in imitation of his countrymen by pillaging the richer and more southern coasts of Europe. He collected a body of troops which, like that of all those ravagers, was composed of Norwegians, Swedes, Frisians, Danes, and adventurers of all nations, who, being accustomed to a roving, unsettled delight, took delight in nothing but war and plunder. His reputation brought him associates from all quarters, and a vision which he pretended to have appeared to him in his sleep, and which, according to his interpretation of it, prognosticated the greatest successes, proved also a powerful incentive with those ignorant and superstitious people. The first attempt made by Rollo was on England, near the end of Alfred's reign, when that great monarch, having settled Guthrum and his followers in East Anglia, and others of those freebooters in Northumberland, and having restored peace to his harassed country, had established the most excellent military, as well as civil institutions among the English. The prudent Dane, finding that no advantages could be gained over such a people governed by such a prince, soon turned his enterprises against France, which he found more exposed to his inroads, and during the reigns of Eudes, a usurper, and of Charles the Simple, a weak prince, he committed the most destructive ravages both on the inland and maritime provinces of that kingdom. The French, having no means of defence against a leader who united all the valour of his countrymen with the policy of more civilised nations, were obliged to submit to the expedient practised by Alfred, and to offer the invaders a settlement in some of those provinces which they had depopulated by their arms. The reason why the Danes, for many years, pursued measures so different from those which had been embraced by the Goths, Vandals, Franks, Burgundians, Lombards, and other northern conquerors, was the great difference in the method of attack which was practised by these several nations, and to which the nature of their respective situations necessarily confined them. The latter tribes, living in an inland country, made incursions by land upon the Roman Empire, and when they entered far into the frontiers, they were obliged to carry along with them their wives and families, whom they had no hopes of soon revisiting, and who could not otherwise participate of their plunder. This circumstance quickly made them think of forcing a settlement in the provinces which they had overrun, and these barbarians, spreading themselves over the country, found an interest in protecting the property and industry of the people whom they had subdued. But the Danes and Norwegians, invited by their maritime situation, and obliged to maintain themselves in their uncultivated country by fishing, had acquired some experience of navigation, and in their military excursions pursued the method practised against the Roman army by the more early Saxons. They made descents in small bodies from their ships, or rather boats, and ravaging the coasts returned with the booty to their families, whom they could not conveniently carry along with them in those hazardous enterprises. But when they increased their armaments, made incursions into the inland countries, and found it safe to remain longer in the midst of the enfeebled enemy, they had been accustomed to crowd their vessels with their wives and children, and having no longer any temptation to return to their own country, they willingly embraced an opportunity of settling in the warm climates and cultivated fields of the south. End of section 14 Section 15 of Volume 1A 
of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of 1688 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of 1688 by david hume volume 1a section 15 chapter 3 part 2 affairs were in this situation with rollo and his followers when charles proposed to relinquish to them part of the province formerly called neustria and to purchase peace on these hard conditions after all the terms were fully settled there appeared only one circumstance shocking to the haughty dane he was required to do homage to charles for this province and to put himself in that humiliating posture imposed on vassals by the rights of the feudal law he long refused to submit to this indignity but being unwilling to lose such important advantages for a mere ceremony he made a sacrifice of his pride to his interest and acknowledged himself in form the vassal of the french monarch charles gave him his daughter gisla in marriage and that he might bind him faster to his interests made him a donation of a considerable territory besides that which he was obliged to surrender to him by his stipulation when some of the french nobles informed him that in return for so generous a present it was expected that he should throw himself at the king's feet and make suitable acknowledgments for his bounty rollo replied that he would rather decline the present and it was with some difficulty they could persuade him to make that compliment by one of his captains the dane commissioned for this purpose full of indignation at the order and despising so unwarlike a prince caught charles by the foot and pretending to carry it to his mouth that he might kiss it overthrew him before all his courtiers the french sensible of their present weakness found it prudent to overlook this insult rollo who was now in the decline of life and was tired of wars and depredations applied himself with mature counsels to the settlement of his new acquired territory which was thenceforth called normandy and he parcelled it out among his captains and followers he followed in this partition the customs of the feudal law which was then universally established in the southern counties of europe and which suited the peculiar circumstances of that age he treated the french subjects who submitted to him with mildness and justice he reclaimed his ancient followers from their ferocious violence he established law and order throughout his state and after a life spent in tumults and ravages he died peaceably in a good old age and left his dominions to his posterity william the first who succeeded him governed the duchy twenty-five years and during that time the normans who were thoroughly intermingled with the french had acquired their language had imitated their manners and had made such progress towards cultivation that on the death of william his son richard through a minor inherited his dominions a sure proof that the normans were already somewhat advanced in civility and that their government could now rest secure on its laws and civil institutions and was not wholly sustained by the abilities of the sovereign richard after a long reign of fifty-four years was succeeded by his son of the same name in the year nine ninety six which was eighty-five years after the first establishment of the normans in france this was the duke who gave his sister emma in marriage to ethelred king of england and who thereby formed connections with a country which his posterity was so soon after destined to subdue 
the Danes had been established during a longer period in England than in France, and, though the similarity of their original language to that of the Saxons invited them to a more early coalition with the natives, they had hitherto found so little example of civilized manners among the English, that they retained all their ancient ferocity, and valued themselves only on their national character of military bravery. The recent, as well as more ancient, achievements of their countrymen tended to support this idea, and the English princes, particularly Athelstan and Edgar, sensible of that superiority, had been accustomed to keep in pay bodies of Danish troops who were quartered about the country, and committed many violences upon the inhabitants. These mercenaries had attained to such a height of luxury, according to the old English writers, that they combed their hair once a day, bathed themselves once a week, changed their clothes frequently, and by all these arts of effeminacy, as well as by their military character, had rendered themselves so agreeable to the fair sex that they debauched the wives and daughters of the English, and dishonoured many families. But what most provoked the inhabitants was, that instead of defending them against invaders, they were ever ready to betray them to the foreign Danes, and to associate themselves with all straggling parties of that nation. The animosity between the inhabitants of English and Danish race had, from these repeated injuries, risen to a great height, when Ethelred, from a policy incident to weak princes, embraced the cruel resolution of massacring the latter throughout all his dominions. Secret orders were dispatched to commence the execution everywhere on the same day, and the festival of St. Bryce, which fell on a Sunday, November the 13th, the day on which the Danes usually bathed themselves, was chosen for that purpose. It is needless to repeat the accounts transmitted concerning the barbarity of this massacre, the rage of the populace, excited by so many injuries, sanctioned by authority, and stimulated by example, distinguished not between innocence and guilt, spared neither sex nor age, and was not satiated without the tortures as well as death of the unhappy victims. Even Gunilda, sister to the King of Denmark, who had married Earl Paling, and had embraced Christianity, was by the advice of Edric, Earl of Wilts, seized and condemned to death by Ethelred, after seeing her husband and children butchered before her face. This unhappy princess foretold in the agonies of despair that her murder would soon be avenged by the total ruin of the English nation. Never was prophecy better fulfilled, and never did barbarous policy prove more fatal to the authors. Swain and his Danes, who wanted but a pretense for invading the English, appeared off the western coast and threatened to take full revenge for the slaughter of their countrymen. Exeter fell first into their hands, from the negligence or treachery of Earl Hugh, a Norman who had been made governor by the interest of Queen Emma. They began to spread their devastations over the country, when the English, sensible to what outrages they must now expect from their barbarous and offended enemy, assembled more early and in greater numbers than usual, and made an appearance of vigorous resistance. But all these preparations were frustrated by the treachery of Duke Alfric, who was entrusted with the command, and who, feigning sickness, refused to lead the army against the Danes, till it was dispirited and at last dissipated by his fatal misconduct. Alfric soon after died, and Edric, a greater traitor than he, who had married the king's daughter, 
and had acquired a total ascendant over him, succeeded Alfric in the government of Mercia and in the command of the English armies. A great famine, proceeding partly from the bad seasons, partly from the decay of agriculture, added to the other miseries of the inhabitants. The country, wasted by the Danes, harassed by the fruitless expeditions of its own forces, was reduced to the utmost desolation, and at last submitted to the infamy of purchasing a precarious peace from the enemy by the payment of thirty thousand pounds. The English endeavoured to employ this interval in making preparations against the return of the Danes, which they had reason soon to expect. A law was made ordering the proprietors of eight hides of land to provide each a horseman and a complete suit of armour, and those of three hundred and ten hides to equip a ship for the defence of the coast. When this navy was assembled, which must have consisted of near eight hundred vessels, all hopes of its success were disappointed by the factions, animosities, and dissensions of the nobility. Edric had impelled his brother Breitric to prefer an accusation of treason against Wolfnoth, governor of Sussex, the father of the famous Earl Godwin, and that nobleman, well acquainted with the malevolence as well as power of his enemy, found no means of safety but in deserting with twenty ships to the Danes. Breitric pursued him with a fleet of eighty sail, but his ships being shattered in a tempest and stranded on the coast, he was suddenly attacked by Wolfnoth, and all his vessels burnt and destroyed. The imbecility of the king was little capable of repairing this misfortune. The treachery of Edric frustrated every plan for future defence, and the English navy, disconcerted, discouraged, and divided, was at last scattered into its several harbours. It is almost impossible, or would be tedious, to relate particularly all the miseries to which the English were henceforth exposed. We hear of nothing but the sacking and burning of towns, the devastation of the open country, the appearance of the enemy in every quarter of the kingdom, their cruel diligence in discovering any corner which had not been ransacked by their former violence, the broken and disjointed narration of the ancient historians is here well adapted to the nature of the war which was conducted by such sudden inroads as would have been dangerous even to a united and well-governed kingdom but proved fatal where nothing but a general consternation and mutual diffidence and dissension prevailed the governors of one province refused to march to the assistance of another, and were at last terrified from assembling their forces for the defence of their own province. General councils were summoned, but either no resolution was taken, or none was carried into execution, and the only expedient in which the English agreed was the base and imprudent one of buying a new peace from the Danes by the payment of forty-eight thousand pounds. This measure did not bring them even that short interval of repose which they had expected from it. The Danes, disregarding all engagements, continued their devastations and hostilities, levied a new contribution of eight thousand pounds on the county of Kent alone, murdered the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had refused to countenance this exaction, and the English nobility found no other resource than that of submitting everywhere to the Danish monarch, swearing allegiance to him, and delivering him hostages for their fidelity. Ethelred, equally afraid of the violence of the enemy, and the treachery of his own subjects, fled into Normandy, whither he had sent before him Queen Emma and her two sons, Alfred and Edward. Richard received his unhappy guests with the generosity that does honour to his memory. The king, 
had not been above six weeks in Normandy when he heard of the death of Swain, who expired at Gainsborough before he had time to establish himself in his new acquired dominions. The English prelates and nobility, taking advantage of this event, sent over a deputation to Normandy inviting Ethelred to return to them, expressing a desire of being again governed by their native prince, and intimating their hopes that, being now tutored by experience, he would avoid all those errors which had been attended with such misfortunes to himself and to his people. But the misconduct of Ethelred was incurable, and on his resuming the government he discovered the same incapacity, indolence, cowardice, and credulity, which had so often exposed him to the insults of his enemies. His son-in-law, Edric, notwithstanding his repeated treasons, retained such influence at court as to instil into the king jealousies of Sigifert and Morcar, two of the chief nobles of Mercia. Edric allured them to his house, where he murdered them, while Ethelred participated in the infamy of the action by confiscating their estates and thrusting into a convent the widow of Sigivert. She was a woman of singular beauty and merit, and in a visit which was paid her during her confinement by Prince Edmund, the king's eldest son, she inspired him with so violent an affection that he released her from the convent and soon after married her without the consent of his father. Meanwhile the English found in Canute, the son and successor of Swain, an enemy no less terrible than the prince from whom death had so lately delivered them. He ravaged the eastern coast with merciless fury, and put ashore all the English hostages at Sandwich, after having cut off their hands and noses. He was obliged by the necessity of his affairs to make a voyage to Denmark, but returning soon after he continued his depredations along the southern coast. He even broke into the counties of Dorset, Wilts, and Somerset, where an army was assembling against him under the command of Prince Edmund and Duke Edric. The latter still continued his perfidious machinations, and after endeavouring in vain to get the prince into his power, he found means to disperse the army, and he then openly deserted to Canute with forty vessels. Notwithstanding this misfortune, Edward was not disconcerted, but assembling all the force of England, was in a condition to give battle to the enemy. The king had had such frequent experience of perfidy among his subjects, that he had lost all confidence in them. He remained at London pretending sickness, but really from apprehensions that they intended to buy their peace by delivering him into the hands of his enemies. The army called aloud for their sovereign to march at their head against the Danes, and on his refusal to take the field, they were so discouraged that those vast preparations became ineffectual for the defence of the kingdom. Edmund, deprived of all regular supplies to maintain his soldiers, was obliged to commit equal ravages with those which were practised by the Danes, and after making some fruitless expeditions into the north, which had submitted entirely to Canute's power, he retired to London, determined there to maintain to the last extremity the small remains of English liberty. He here found everything in confusion by the death of the king, who expired after an unhappy and inglorious reign of thirty-five years. He left two sons by his first marriage, Edmund, who succeeded him, and Edwy, whom Canute afterwards murdered his two sons by the second marriage, Anred and Edward, were, immediately upon Ethelred's death, conveyed into Normandy by Queen Emma. 
End of section 15。section 16 of volume 1a of history of England from the invasion of Julius Caesar to the revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1a, Section 16. Chapter 3, Part 3. Edmund Ironside. This prince, who received the name of Ironside from his hardy valour, possessed courage and ability sufficient to have prevented his country from sinking into those calamities, but not to raise it from that abyss of misery into which it had already fallen. Among the other misfortunes of the English, treachery and disaffection had crept in among the nobility and prelates, and Edmund found no better expedient for stopping the further progress of these fatal evils than to lead his army instantly into the field and to employ them against the common enemy. After meeting with some success at Gillingham, he prepared himself to decide, in one general engagement, the fate of his crown, and at Scoriston in the county of Gloucester he offered battle to the enemy, who were commanded by Canute and Edric. Fortune, in the beginning of the day, declared for him, but Edric, having cut off the head of one Osmer, whose countenance resembled that of Edmund, fixed it on a spear, carried it through the ranks in triumph, and called aloud to the English that it was time to fly, for behold the head of their sovereign. And though Edmund, observing the consternation of the troops, took off his helmet and showed himself to them, the utmost he could gain by his activity and valour was to leave the victory undecided. Edric now took a surer method to ruin him, by pretending to desert to him, and as Edmund was well acquainted with his power, and probably knew no other of the chief nobility in whom he could repose more confidence, he was obliged, notwithstanding the repeated perfidy of the man, to give him a considerable command in the army. A battle soon after ensued at Assington in Essex, where Edric, flying in the beginning of the day, occasioned the total defeat of the English, followed by a great slaughter of the nobility. The indefatigable Edmund, however, had still resources. Assembling a new army at Gloucester, he was again in condition to dispute the field. When the Danish and English nobility equally harassed with those convulsions obliged their kings to come to a compromise, and to divide the kingdom between them by treaty. Canute reserved to himself the northern division, consisting of Mercia, East Anglia, and Northumberland, which he had entirely subdued. The southern parts were left to Edmund. The prince survived the treaty about a month. He was murdered at Oxford by two of his chamberlains, accomplices of Edric, who thereby made way for the succession of Canute the Dane to the crown of England. Canute The English, who had been unable to defend their country and maintain their independency, under so active and brave a prince as Edmund, could after his death expect nothing but total subjection from Canute, who, active and brave himself, and at the head of a great force, was ready to take advantage of the minority of Edwin and Edward, the two sons of Edmund. Yet this conqueror, who was commonly so little scrupulous, showed himself anxious to cover his injustice under plausible pretenses. Before he seized the dominions of the English princes, he summoned a general assembly of the states in order to fix the succession of the kingdom. He here suborned some nobles to depose that, 
In the Treaty of Gloucester it had been verbally agreed either to name Canute in case of Edmund's death, successor to his dominions, or tutor his children. For historians vary in this particular, and that evidence supported by the great power of Canute determined the states immediately to put the Danish monarch in possession of the government. Canute, jealous of the two princes, but sensible that he should render himself extremely odious if he ordered them to be dispatched in England, sent them abroad to his ally, the King of Sweden, whom he desired as soon as they arrived in his court to free him by their death from any further anxiety. The Swedish monarch was too generous to comply with the request, but being afraid of drawing on himself a quarrel with Canute, by protecting the young princes, he sent them to Solomon, king of Hungary, to be educated in his court. The elder, Edwin, was afterwards married to the sister of the king of Hungary, but the English prince dying without issue, Solomon gave his sister-in-law, Agatha, daughter of the Emperor Henry the Second, in marriage to Edward, the younger brother, and she bore him Edgar, Atheling, Margaret, afterwards Queen of Scotland, and Christina, who retired into a convent. Canute, though he had reached the great point of his ambition in obtaining possession of the English crown, was obliged at first to make great sacrifices to it, and to gratify the chief of the nobility by bestowing upon them the most extensive governments and jurisdictions. He created Thurkill, Earl or Duke of East Anglia, for these titles were then nearly of the same import, Eric of Northumberland and Edric of Mercia, reserving only to himself the administration of Wessex, but seizing afterwards a favourable opportunity. He expelled Thurkill and Eric from their governments, and banished them the kingdom. He put to death many of the English nobility, on whose fidelity he could not rely, and whom he hated on account of their disloyalty to their native prince. And even the traitor Edric, having had the assurance to reproach him with his services, was condemned to be executed, and his body to be thrown in the Thames, a suitable reward for his multiplied acts of perfidy and rebellion. Canute also found himself obliged in the beginning of his reign to load the people with heavy taxes in order to reward his Danish followers. He extracted from them at one time the sum of seventy-two thousand pounds, besides eleven thousand pounds which he levied on London alone. He was probably willing from political motives to mulk severely that city on account of the affection which it had borne to Edmund, and the resistance which it had made to the Danish power in two obstinate sieges. But these rigours were imputed to necessity, and Canute, like a wise prince, was determined that the English, now deprived of all their dangerous leaders, should be reconciled to the Danish yoke by the justice and impartiality of his administration. He sent back to Denmark as many of his followers as he could safely spare. He restored the Saxon customs in a general assembly of the states. He made no distinction between Danes and English in the distribution of justice, and he took care by a strict execution of law, to protect the lives and properties of all his people. The Danes were gradually incorporated with his new objects, and both were glad to obtain a little respite from these multiplied calamities from which the one, no less than the other, had in their fierce contest for power experienced such fatal consequences. The removal of Edmund's children into so distant a country as Hungary was, next to their death, regarded by Canute as the greatest security to his government. He had no further anxiety, except with regard to Alfred and Edward, who were protected and supported by their uncle Richard, Duke of Normandy, 
Richard even fitted out a great armament in order to restore the English princes to the throne of their ancestors, and, though the navy was dispersed by a storm, Canute saw the danger to which he was exposed from the enmity of so warlike a people as the Normans. In order to acquire the friendship of the duke, he paid his addresses to Queen Emma, sister of that prince, and promised that he would leave the children whom he should have by that marriage in possession of the crown of England. Richard complied with his demand and sent over Emma to England, where she was soon after married to Canute. The English, though they disapproved of her espousing the mortal enemy of her former husband and his family, were pleased to find at court a sovereign to whom they were accustomed, and who had already formed connections with them, and thus Canute, besides securing by this marriage the alliance of Normandy, gradually acquired by the same means the confidence of his own subjects. The Norman prince did not long survive the marriage of Emma, and he left the inheritance of the duchy to his eldest son of the same name, who dying a year after him without children, was succeeded by his brother Robert, a man of valour and abilities. Canute, having settled his power in England beyond all danger of a revolution, made a voyage to Denmark in order to resist the attacks of the King of Sweden, and he carried along with him a great body of the English, under the command of Earl Godwin. This nobleman had here an opportunity of performing a service, by which he both reconciled the king's mind to the English nation, and gathering to himself the friendship of his sovereign, laid the foundation of that immense fortune which he acquired to his family. He was stationed next the Swedish camp, and observing a favourable opportunity which he was obliged suddenly to seize, he attacked the enemy in the night, drove them from their trenches, threw them into disorder, pursued his advantage, and obtained a decisive victory over them. Next morning Canute, seeing the English camp entirely abandoned, imagined that those disaffected troops had deserted to the enemy. He was agreeably surprised to find that they were at that time engaged in pursuit of the discomfited Swedes. He was so pleased with this success and with the manner of obtaining it that he bestowed his daughter in marriage upon Godwin, and treated him ever after with entire confidence and regard. In another voyage, which he made afterwards to Denmark, Canute attacked Norway, and, expelling the just but unwarlike Olaus, kept possession of his kingdom till the death of that prince. He had now, by his conquests and valour, attained the utmost height of grandeur, having leisure from wars and intrigues. He felt the unsatisfactory nature of all human enjoyments, and equally weary of the glories and turmoils of this life, he began to cast his view towards that future existence, which is so natural for the human mind, whether satiated by prosperity or disgusted with adversity, to make the object of its attention. Unfortunately, the spirit which prevailed in that age gave a wrong direction to his devotion. Instead of making compensation to those whom he had injured by his former acts of violence, he employed himself entirely in those exercises of piety which the monks represented as the most meritorious. He built churches, he endowed monasteries, he enriched the ecclesiastics, and he bestowed revenues for the support of chantries at Assington and other places, where he appointed prayers to be said for the souls of those who had there fallen in battle against him. He even undertook a pilgrimage to Rome, where he resided a considerable time, besides obtaining from the Pope some privileges for the English school erected there, he engaged all the princes, through whose dominions he was obliged to pass, to desist from those heavy impositions and tolls 
which they were accustomed to exact from the English pilgrims. By this spirit of devotion, no less than by his equitable and politic administration, he gained, in a good measure, the affections of his subjects. Canute, the greatest and most powerful monarch of his time, sovereign of Denmark and Norway, as well as of England, could not fail of meeting with adulation from his courtiers, a tribute which is liberally paid even to the meanest and weakest princes. Some of his flatterers breaking out one day in admiration of his grandeur exclaimed that everything was possible for him, upon which the monarch, it is said, ordered his chair to be set on the seashore while the tide was rising, and as the waters approached, he commanded them to retire, and to obey the voice of him who was lord of the ocean. He feigned to sit some time in expectation of their submission, but when the sea still advanced towards him, and began to wash him with its billows, he turned to his courtiers and remarked to them, that every creature in the universe was feeble and impotent, and that power resided with one being alone, in whose hands were all the elements of nature, who could say to the ocean, Thus far shalt thou go, and no farther, and who could level with his nod the most towering piles of human pride and ambition. The only memorable action which Canute performed after his return from Rome was an expedition against Malcolm, King of Scotland. During the reign of Ethelred, a tax of a shilling a hide had been imposed on all the lands of England. It was commonly called Danegelt, because the revenue bar had been employed either in buying peace with the Danes or in making preparations against the inroads of that hostile nation. The monarch had required that the same tax be paid by Cumberland, which was held by the Scots. But Malcolm, a warlike prince, told him that as he was always able to repulse the Danes by his own power, he would neither submit to buy peace of his enemies, nor pay others for resisting them. Ethelred, offended at this reply, which contained a secret reproach on his own conduct, undertook an expedition against Cumberland. But though he committed ravages upon the country, he could never bring Malcolm to a temper more humble or submissive. Canute, after his accession, summoned the Scottish king to acknowledge himself a vassal for Cumberland to the crown of England. But Malcolm refused compliance on pretense that he owed homage to those princes only who inherited that kingdom by right of blood. Canute was not of a temper to bear this insult, and the King of Scotland soon found that the sceptre was in very different hands from those of the feeble and irresolute Ethelred. Upon Canute's appearing on the frontiers with a formidable army, Malcolm agreed that his grandson and heir Duncan, whom he put in possession of Cumberland, should make the submissions required, and that the heirs of Scotland should always acknowledge themselves vassals to England for that province. Canute passed four years in peace after this enterprise, and he died at Shaftesbury, leaving three sons, Swain, Harold, and Harder Canute. Swain, whom he had by his first marriage with Alfwen, daughter of the Earl of Hampshire, was crowned in Norway, Hardicanute, whom Emma had borne him, was in possession of Denmark. Harold, who was of the same marriage with Swain, was at that time in England. Harold Harefoot Though Canute, in his treaty with Richard, Duke of Normandy, had stipulated that his children by Emma should succeed to the crown of England, he had either considered himself as released from that engagement by the death of Richard, or esteemed it dangerous to leave an unsettled and newly conquered kingdom in the hands of so young a prince as Hardicanute. He therefore appointed by his will Harold successor to the crown. 
this prince was besides present to maintain his claim he was favoured by all the danes and he got immediately possession of his father's treasures which might be equally useful whether he found it necessary to proceed by force or intrigue in ensuring his succession on the other hand hardicanute had the suffrages of the english who on account of his being from among them of queen emma regarded him as their countryman he was favoured by the articles of treaty with the duke of normandy and above all his party was espoused by earl godwin the most powerful nobleman in the kingdom especially in the province of wessex the chief seat of the ancient english affairs were likely to terminate in a civil war when by the interposition of the nobility of both parties a compromise was made and it was agreed that harold should enjoy together with london all the provinces north of the thames while the possession of the south should remain to hardicanute and till that prince should appear and take possession of his dominions emma fixed her residence at winchester and established her authority over her son's share of the partition meanwhile robert duke of normandy died in a pilgrimage to the holy land and being succeeded by a son yet a minor the two english princes alfred and edward who found no longer any countenance or protection in that country gladly embraced the opportunity of paying a visit with a numerous retinue to their mother emma who seemed to be placed in a state of so much power and splendour at winchester but the face of affairs soon wore a melancholy aspect earl godwin had been gained by the arts of harold who promised to espouse the daughter of that nobleman and while the treaty was yet a secret these two tyrants laid a plan for the destruction of the english princes alfred was invited to london by harold with many professions of friendship but when he had reached guildford he was set upon by godwin's vassals about six hundred of his train were murdered in the most cruel manner he himself was taken prisoner his eyes were put out and he was conducted to the monastery of Ely, where he died soon after. Edward and Emma, apprised of the fate which was awaiting them, fled beyond sea, the former into Normandy, the latter into Flanders, while Harold, triumphing in his bloody policy, took possession without resistance of all the dominions assigned to his brother. This is the only memorable action performed during a reign of four years by this prince, who gave so bad a specimen of his character, and whose bodily accomplishments alone are known to us by his appellation of Harefoot, which he acquired from his agility in running and walking. He died on the 14th of April, 1039, little regretted or esteemed by his subjects and left the succession open to his brother hardicanute end of section sixteen section seventeen of volume one a of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1A, Section 17. Chapter 3, Part 4. Hardicanute. Hardicanute, or Canute the Hardy, that is, the robust, for he is chiefly known by his bodily accomplishments. Though by remaining so long in Denmark, he had been deprived of his share in the partition of the kingdom, had not abandoned his pretensions, and he had determined before Harold's death to recover by arms what he had lost, either by his own negligence or by the necessity of his affairs. On pretense of paying a visit to the Queen Dowager in Flanders, 
he had assembled a fleet of sixty sail, and was preparing to make a descent on England, when intelligence of his brother's death induced him to sail immediately to London, where he was received in triumph and acknowledged king without opposition. The first act of Hardicanute's government afforded his subjects a bad prognostic of his future conduct. He was so enraged at Harold for depriving him of his share of the kingdom, and for the cruel treatment of his brother Alfred, that in an impotent desire of revenge against the dead, he ordered the body to be dug up and to be thrown into the Thames, and when it was found by some fishermen and buried in London, he ordered it again to be dug up and to be thrown again into the river, but it was fished up a second time, and then interred with great secrecy. Godwin, equally servile and insolent, submitted to be his instrument in this unnatural and brutal action. That nobleman knew that he was universally believed to have been an accomplice in the barbarity exercised on Alfred, and that he was on that account obnoxious to Hardicanute, and perhaps he hoped by displaying this rage against Harold's memory to justify himself from having had any participation in his counsels. But Prince Edward, being invited over by the king, immediately on his appearance preferred an accusation against Godwin for the murder of Alfred, and demanded justice for that crime. Godwin, in order to appease the king, made him a magnificent present of a galley with a gilt stern, rowed by fourscore men, who wore each of them a gold bracelet on his arm, weighing sixteen ounces, and were armed and clothed in the most sumptuous manner. Hardicanute, pleased with the splendor of this spectacle, quickly forgot his brother's murder, and on Godwin's swearing that he was innocent of the crime, he allowed him to be acquitted. Though Hardicanute, before his accession, had been called over by the vows of the English, he soon lost the affections of the nation by his misconduct. But nothing appeared more grievous to them than his renewing the imposition of Danegelt, and obliging the nation to pay a great sum of money to the fleet which brought him from Denmark. The discontents ran high in many places. In Worcester the populace rose, and put to death two of the collectors. The king, enraged at this opposition, swore vengeance against the city, and ordered three noblemen, Godwin, Duke of Wessex, Seward, Duke of Northumberland, and Leofric, Duke of Mercia, to execute his menaces with the utmost rigour. They were obliged to set fire to the city and deliver it up to be plundered by their soldiers, but they saved the lives of the inhabitants, whom they confined in a small island of the Severn called Beverley, till by their intercession they were able to appease the king and obtain the pardon of the supplicants. This violent government was of short duration. Hardicanute died in two years after his accession, at the nuptials of a Danish lord, which he had honoured with his presence. His usual habits of intemperance were so well known, that notwithstanding his robust constitution, his sudden death gave as little surprise as it did sorrow to his subjects. Edward the Confessor the English, on the death of Hardicanute, saw a favourable opportunity for recovering their liberty, and for shaking off the Danish yoke, under which they had so long laboured. Swain, king of Norway, the eldest son of Canute, was absent, and as the two last kings had died without issue, none of that race presented himself nor any whom the Danes could support as successor to the throne. 
Prince Edward was fortunately at court on his brother's demise, and though the descendants of Edmund Ironside were the true heirs of the Saxon family, yet their absence in so remote a country as Hungary appeared a sufficient reason for their exclusion to a people like the English, so little accustomed to observe a regular order in the succession of their monarchs. All delays might be dangerous, and the present occasion must hastily be embraced, while the Danes, without concert, without a leader, astonished at the present incident, and anxious only for their personal safety, durst not oppose the united voice of the nation. But this concurrence of circumstances in favour of Edward might have failed of its effect had his succession been opposed by Godwin, whose power, alliances, and abilities gave him a great influence at all times, especially amidst those sudden opportunities which always attend a revolution of government, and which, either seized or neglected, commonly prove decisive. There were opposite reasons which divided men's hopes and fears with regard to Godwin's conduct. On the one hand, the credit of that nobleman lay chiefly in Wessex, which was almost entirely inhabited by English. It was therefore presumed that he would second the wishes of that people in restoring the Saxon line, and in humbling the Danes, from whom he, as well as they, had reason to dread, as they had already felt the most grievous oppressions. On the other hand, there subsisted a declared animosity between Edward and Godwin, on account of Alfred's murder, of which the latter had publicly been accused by the prince, and which he might believe so deep an offence as could never, on account of any subsequent merits, be sincerely pardoned. But their common friends here interposed, and representing the necessity of their good correspondence, obliged them to lay aside all jealousy and rancour, and concur in restoring liberty to their native country. Godwin only stipulated that Edward, as a pledge of his sincere reconciliation, should promise to marry his daughter Editha, and having fortified himself by this alliance, he summoned a general council at Gillingham, and prepared every measure for securing the succession to Edward. The English were unanimous and zealous in their resolutions. The Danes were divided and dispirited. Any small opposition which appeared in this assembly was browbeaten and suppressed, and Edward was crowned king, with every demonstration of duty and affection. The triumph of the English upon this signal and decisive advantage was at first attended with some insult and violence against the Danes, but the king, by the mildness of his character, soon reconciled the latter to his administration, and the distinction between the two nations gradually disappeared. The Danes were interspersed with the English in most of the provinces. They spoke nearly the same language. They differed little in their manners and laws. Domestic dissensions in Denmark prevented for some years any powerful invasion from thence which might awaken past animosities. And as the Norman conquest, which ensued soon after, reduced both nations to equal subjection, there is no further mention in history of any difference between them. The joy, however, of their present deliverance made such impression on the minds of the English that they instituted an annual festival for celebrating that great event, and it was observed in some countries even to the time of Spellman. The popularity which Edward enjoyed on his accession was not destroyed by the first act of his administration his resuming all the grants of his immediate predecessors, an attempt which is commonly attended with the most dangerous consequences. 
The poverty of the crown convinced the nation that this act of violence was become absolutely necessary, and as the loss fell chiefly on the Danes, who had obtained large grants from the late kings, their countrymen, on account of their services in subduing the kingdom, the English were rather pleased to see them reduced to their primitive poverty. The king's severity also towards his mother, the queen dowager, though exposed to some more censure, met not with very general disapprobation. He had hitherto lived on indifferent terms with that princess. He accused her of neglecting him and his brother during their adverse fortune. He remarked that, as the superior qualities of Canute and his better treatment of her had made her entirely different to the memory of Ethelred. She also gave the preference to her children of the second bed, and always regarded Hardicanute as her favourite. The same reasons had probably made her unpopular in England, and though her benefactions to the monks obtained her the favour of that order, the nation was not, in general, displeased to see her stripped by Edward of immense treasures which she had amassed. He confined her, during the remainder of her life, in a monastery at Winchester, but carried his rigour against her no farther. The stories of his accusing her of a participation in her son Alfred's murder, and of a criminal correspondence with the Bishop of Winchester, and also of her justifying herself by treading barefoot without receiving any hurt over nine burning ploughshares, were the inventions of the monkish historians, and were propagated and believed from the silly wonder of posterity. The English flattered themselves that by the accession of Edward they were delivered forever from the dominion of foreigners, but they soon found that this evil was not entirely removed. The king had been educated in Normandy, and had contracted many intimacies with the natives of that country, as well as an affection for their manners. The court of England was soon filled with Normans, who being distinguished both by the favour of Edward, and by a degree of cultivation superior to that which was attained by the English in those ages, soon rendered their language, customs, and laws fashionable in the kingdom. The study of the French tongue became general among the people. The courtiers affected to imitate that nation in their dress, equipage, and entertainments. Even the lawyers employed a foreign language in their deeds and papers. But above all, the church felt the influence and dominion of those strangers, Ulf and William, two Normans who had formerly been the king's chaplains, were created bishops of Dorchester and London. Robert, a Norman also, was promoted to the see of Canterbury, and always enjoyed the highest favour of his master, of which his abilities rendered him not unworthy. And though the king's prudence, or his want of authority, made him confer almost all the civil and military employments on the natives, the ecclesiastical preferments fell often to the share of the Normans, and as the latters possessed Edward's confidence, they had secretly a great influence on public affairs, and excited the jealousy of the English, particularly of Earl Godwin. This powerful nobleman, besides being duke or earl of wessex had the counties of kent and sussex annexed to his government his eldest son swain possessed the same authority in the counties of oxford barks gloucester and hereford and harold his second son was duke of east anglia and at the same time governor of essex the great authority of this family was supported by immense possessions and powerful alliances, and the abilities as well as ambition of Godwin himself contributed to render it still more dangerous. 
a prince of greater capacity and vigour than Edward, would have found it difficult to support the dignity of the crown under such circumstances, and as the haughty temper of Godwin made him often forget the respect due to his prince Edward's animosity against him, was grounded on personal as well as political considerations, on recent as well as more ancient injuries. The king, in pursuance of his engagements, had indeed married Editha, the daughter of Godwin, but this alliance became a fresh source of enmity between them. Edward's hatred of the father was transferred to that princess, and Editha, though possessed of many amiable accomplishments, could never acquire the confidence and affection of her husband. It is even pretended that during the whole course of her life he abstained from all commerce of love with her, and such was the absurd admiration paid to an inviolable chastity during those ages that his conduct in this particular is highly celebrated by the monkish historians and greatly contributed to his acquiring the title of saint and confessor. The most popular pretense on which Godwin could ground his disaffection to the king and his administration was to complain of the influence of the Normans in the government, and a declared opposition had thence arisen between him and these favourites. It was not long before this animosity broke out into action. Eustace, Count of Boulogne, having paid a visit to the king, passed by Dover in his return. One of his train, being refused entrance to a lodging which had been assigned him, attempted to make his way by force, and in the contest he wounded the master of the house. The inhabitants revenged this insult by the death of the stranger. The count and his train took arms and murdered the wounded townsman. A tumult ensued. Near twenty persons were killed on each side, and Eustace, being overpowered by numbers, was obliged to save his life by flight from the fury of the populace. He hurried immediately to court, and complained of the usage he had met with. The king entered zealously into the quarrel, and was highly displeased that a stranger of such distinction, whom he had invited over to his court, should, without any just cause, as he believed, have felt so sensibly the insolence and animosity of his people. He gave orders to Godwin, in whose government Dover lay, to repair immediately to the place and punish the inhabitants for the crime. But Godwin, who desired rather to encourage than express the popular discontents against foreigners, refused obedience, and endeavoured to throw the whole blame of the riot on the Count of Boulogne and his retinue. Edward, touched in so sensible a point, saw the necessity of exerting the royal authority, and he threatened Godwin, if he persisted in his disobedience, to make him feel the utmost effects of his resentment. The earl, perceiving a rupture to be unavoidable, and pleased to embark in a cause where it was likely he should be supported by his countrymen, made preparations for his own defence, or rather for an attack on Edward. Under pretence of repressing some disorders on the Welsh frontier, he secretly assembled a great army, and was approaching the king, who resided without any military force, and without suspicion, at Gloucester. Edward applied for protection to Seward, Duke of Northumberland, and Leofric, Duke of Mercia, two powerful noblemen, whose jealousy of Godwin's greatness, as well as their duty to the crown, engaged them to defend the king in this extremity. They hastened to him with such of their followers as they could assemble on a sudden, and finding the danger much greater than they had first apprehended, they issued orders for mustering all the forces within their respective governments, 
and for marching them without delay to the defence of the king's person and authority. Edward, meanwhile, endeavoured to gain time by negotiation, while Godwin, who thought the king entirely in his power, and who was willing to save appearances, fell into the snare, and not sensible that he ought to have no further reserve after he had proceeded so far, he lost the favourable opportunity of rendering himself master of the government. The English, though they had no high idea of Edward's vigour and capacity, bore him great affection on account of his humanity, justice, and piety, as well as the long race of their native kings, from whom he was descended, and they hastened from all quarters to defend him from the present danger. His army was now so considerable that he ventured to take the field, and marching to London he summoned a great council to judge the rebellion of Godwin and his sons. These noblemen pretended at first that they were willing to stand their trial, but having in vain endeavoured to make their adherents persist in rebellion, they offered to come to London, provided they might receive hostages for their safety. This proposal being rejected, they were obliged to disband the remains of their forces and have recourse to flight. Baldwin, Earl of Flanders, gave protection to Godwin and his three sons, Gurth, Swain, and Tosti, the latter of whom had married the daughter of that prince. Harold and Leofwin, two others of his sons, took shelter in Ireland. The estates of the father and sons were confiscated. Their governments were given to others. Queen Editha was confined in a monastery at Werewell, and the greatness of this family, once so formidable, seemed now to be totally supplanted and overthrown. But Godwin had fixed his authority on too firm a basis, and he was too strongly supported by alliances both foreign and domestic, not to occasion further disturbances and make new efforts for his re-establishment. The Earl of Flanders permitted him to purchase and hire ships within his harbours, and Godwin, having manned them with his followers, and with freebooters of all nations, put to sea, and attempted to make a descent at Sandwich. The king, informed of his preparations, had equipped a considerable fleet, much superior to that of the enemy, and the earl, hastily before their appearance, made his retreat into the Flemish harbours. The English court, allured by the present security and destitute of all vigorous counsels, allowed the seamen to disband and the fleet to go to decay, while Godwin, expecting this event, kept his men in readiness for action. He put to sea immediately and sailed to the Isle of Wight, where he was joined by Harold with a squadron, which that nobleman had collected in Ireland. He was now master of the sea, and entering every harbour in the southern coast, he seized all the ships, and summoned his followers in those counties which had so long been subject to his government, to assist him in procuring justice to himself, his family, and his country against the tyranny of foreigners. End of section 17section eighteen of volume one a of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume volume one a Section 18, Chapter 3, Part 5 Reinforced by great numbers from all quarters, he entered the Thames, and appearing before London threw everything into confusion. The king alone seemed resolute to defend himself to the last extremity, 
but the interposition of the english nobility many of whom favoured godwin's pretensions made edward hearken to terms of accommodation and the feigned humility of the earl who disclaimed all intentions of offering violence to his sovereign and desired only to justify himself by a fair and open trial paved the way for his more easy admission it was stipulated that he should give hostages for his good behaviour and that the primate and all the foreigners should be banished by this treaty the present danger of a civil war was obviated but the authority of the crown was considerably impaired or rather entirely annihilated edward sensible that he had not power sufficient to secure godwin's hostages in england sent them over to his kinsman the young duke of normandy godwin's death which happened soon after while he was sitting at table with the king prevented him from further establishing the authority which he had acquired and from reducing edward to still greater subjection he was succeeded in the government of wessex sussex kent and essex and in the office of steward of the household a place of great power by his son harold who was actuated by an ambition equal to that of his father and was superior to him in address in insinuation and in virtue by a modest and gentle demeanour he acquired the goodwill of edward at least softened that hatred which the prince had so long borne his family and gaining every day new partisans by his bounty and affability he proceeded in a more silent and therefore a more dangerous manner to the increase of his authority the king who had not sufficient vigour directly to oppose his progress knew of no other expedient than that hazardous one of raising him a rival in the family of leofric duke of mercia whose son algar was invested with the government of east anglia which before the banishment of harold had belonged to the latter nobleman but this policy of balancing opposite parties required a more steady hand to manage it than that of edward and naturally produced faction and even civil broils among nobles of such mighty and independent authority algar was soon after expelled his government by the intrigues and power of harold but being protected by griffith prince of wales who had married his daughter as well as by the power of his father leofric he obliged harold to submit to an accommodation and was reinstated in the government of east anglia this peace was not of long duration harold taking advantage of leofric's death which happened soon after expelled algar anew and banished him the kingdom and though that nobleman made a fresh eruption into east anglia with an army of norwegians and overran the country his death soon freed harold from the pretensions of so dangerous a rival edward the eldest son of algar was indeed advanced to the government of mercia but the balance which the king desired to establish between these potent families was wholly lost and the influence of harold greatly preponderated Ten fifty five the death of seward duke of northumberland made the way still more open to the ambition of that nobleman seward besides his other merits had acquired honour to england by his successful conduct in the only foreign enterprise undertaken during the reign of edward duncan king of scotland was a prince of a gentle disposition but possessed not the genius requisite for governing a country so turbulent and so much infested by the intrigues and animosities of the great macbeth a powerful nobleman and nearly allied to the crown not content with curbing the king's authority carried still farther his pestilent ambition he put his sovereign to death 
chased Malcolm Kenmore, his son and heir, into England, and usurped the crown. Seward, whose daughter was married to Duncan, embraced by Edward's orders the protection of this distressed family. He marched an army into Scotland, and having defeated and killed Macbeth in battle, he restored Malcolm to the throne of his ancestors. This service, added to his former connections with the royal family of Scotland, brought a great accession to the authority of Seward in the north. But as he had lost his eldest son Osborne in the action with Macbeth, it proved in the issue fatal to his family. His second son, Walthof, appeared on his father's death too young to be entrusted with the government of Northumberland, and Harold's influence obtained that dukedom for his own brother, Tosti. There are two circumstances related of Seward, which discover his high sense of honour and his martial disposition. When intelligence was brought him of his son Osborne's death, he was inconsolable, till he heard that the wound was received in the breast, and that he had behaved with great gallantry in the action. When he found his own death approaching, he ordered his servants to clothe him in a complete suit of armour, and sitting erect on the couch, with a spear in his hand, declared that in that posture, the only one worthy of a warrior, he would patiently await the final moment. The king, now worn out with cares and infirmities, felt himself far advanced in the decline of life, and having no issue himself, began to think of appointing a successor to the kingdom. He sent a deputation to Hungary to invite over his nephew Edward, son of his elder brother, and the only remaining heir of the Saxon line. That prince, whose succession to the crown would have been easy and undisputed, came to England with his children, Edgar, surnamed Atheling, Margaret, and Christina. But his death, which happened a few days after his arrival, threw the king into new difficulties. He saw that the great power and ambition of Harold had tempted him to think of obtaining possession of the throne on the first vacancy, and that Edgar, on account of his youth and inexperience, was very unfit to oppose the pretensions of so popular and enterprising a rival. The animosity which he had long borne to Earl Godwin made him averse to the succession of his son, and he could not, without extreme reluctance, think of an increase of grandeur to a family which had risen on the ruins of royal authority, and which, by the murder of Alfred, his brother, had contributed so much to the weakening of the Saxon line. In this uncertainty, he secretly cast his eye towards his kinsman, William, Duke of Normandy, as the only person whose power and reputation and capacity could support any destination which he might make in his favour to the exclusion of Harold and his family. This famous prince was natural son of Robert, Duke of Normandy, by Harlotta, daughter of a tanner in Falaise, and was very early established in that grandeur from which his birth seemed to have set him at so great a distance. When he was but nine years of age, his father had resolved to undertake a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, a fashionable act of devotion which had taken place of the pilgrimages to Rome, and which, as it was attended with more difficulty and danger, and carried those religious adventurers to the first sources of Christianity, appeared to them more meritorious. Before his departure he assembled the states of the duchy, and informing them of his design, he engaged them to swear allegiance to his natural son William, whom, as he had no legitimate issue, 
he intended, in case he should die in the pilgrimage, to leave successor to his dominions. As he was a prudent prince, he could not but foresee the great inconveniences which must attend this journey, and this settlement of his succession, arising from the perpetual turbulency of the great, the claims of other branches of the ducal family, and the power of the French monarch. But all these considerations were surmounted by the prevailing zeal for pilgrimages, and probably the more important they were, the more would Robert exult in sacrificing them to what he imagined to be his religious duty. This prince, as he had apprehended, died in his pilgrimage, and the minority of his son was attended with all those disorders which were almost unavoidable in that situation. The licentious nobles, freed from the awe of sovereign authority, broke out into personal animosities against each other, and made the whole country a scene of war and devastation. Roger, Count of Tony, and Alain, Count of Brittany, advanced claims to the dominion of the state, and Henry, the first king of France, thought the opportunity favorable for reducing the power of a vassal who had originally acquired his settlement in so violent and invidious a manner, and who had long appeared formidable to his sovereign. The regency established by Robert encountered great difficulties in supporting the government under his complication of dangers, and the young prince, when he came to maturity, found himself reduced to a very low condition. But the great qualities which he soon displayed in the field and in the cabinet gave encouragement to his friends, and struck a terror into his enemies. He opposed himself on all sides against his rebellious subjects, and against foreign invaders, and by his valour and conduct prevailed in every action. He obliged the French king to grant him peace on reasonable terms. He expelled all pretenders to the sovereignty, and he reduced his turbulent barons to pay submission to his authority and to suspend their mutual animosities. The natural severity of his temper appeared in a rigorous administration of justice, and having found the happy effects of this plan of government, without which the laws in those ages became totally impotent, he regarded it as a fixed maxim that in an inflexible conduct was the first duty of a sovereign. The tranquillity which he had established in his dominions had given William leisure to pay a visit to the King of England during the time of Godwin's banishment, and he was received in a manner suitable to the great reputation which he had acquired, to the relation by which he was connected with Edward, and to the obligations which that prince owed to his family. On the return of Godwin and the expulsion of the Norman favourites, Robert, Archbishop of Canterbury, had, before his departure, persuaded Edward to think of adopting William as his successor, a counsel which was favoured by the king's aversion to Godwin, his prepossessions for the Normans, and his esteem of the duke. That prelate, therefore, received a commission to inform William of the king's intentions in his favour, and he was the first person that opened the mind of the prince to entertain those ambitious hopes. But Edward, irresolute and feeble in his purpose, finding that the English would more easily acquiesce in the restoration of the Saxon line, and in the meantime invited his brother's descendants from Hungary, with a view of having them recognized heirs to the crown. The death of his nephew, and the inexperience and unpromising qualities of young Edgar, made him resume his former intentions in favor of the Duke of Normandy, though his aversion to hazardous enterprises engaged him to postpone the execution, and even to keep his purpose secret from all his ministers. Harold, meanwhile proceeded after a more open manner in increasing his popularity, in establishing his power, 
and in preparing the way for his advancement on the first vacancy, an event which, from the age and infirmities of the king, appeared not very distant. But there was still an obstacle which it was requisite for him previously to overcome. Earl Godwin, when restored to his power and fortune, had given hostages for his good behaviour, and among the rest one son and one grandson, whom Edward, for greater security, as has been related, had consigned to the custody of the Duke of Normandy. Harold, though not aware of the Duke's being his competitor, was uneasy that such near relations should be detained prisoners in a foreign country, and he was afraid lest William should, in favour of Edgar, retain these pledges as a check on the ambition of any other pretender. He represented, therefore, to the king his unfeigned submission to royal authority, his steady duty to the prince, and the little necessity there was, after such a uniform trial of his obedience, to detain any longer those hostages who had been required on the first composing of civil discords. By these topics, enforced by his great power, he exhorted the king's consent to release them, and in order to effect his purpose, he immediately proceeded, with a numerous retinue, on his journey to Normandy. A tempest drove him on to the territory of Guy, Count of Ponthieu, who, being informed of his quality, immediately detained him prisoner, and demanded an exorbitant sum for his ransom. Harold found means to convey intelligence of his situation to the Duke of Normandy, and represented that, while he was proceeding to his court in execution of a commission from the King of England, he had met with this harsh treatment from the mercenary disposition of the Count of Ponthieu. William was immediately sensible of the importance of the incident. He foresaw that, if he could once gain Harold, either by favours or menaces, his way to the throne of England would be open, and Edward would meet with no further obstacle in executing the favourable intentions which he had entertained in his behalf. He sent, therefore, a messenger to Guy, in order to demand the liberty of his prisoner, and that nobleman, not daring to refuse so great a prince, put Harold into the hands of the Norman, who conducted him to Royal. William received him with every demonstration of respect and friendship, and after showing himself disposed to comply with his desire in delivering up the hostages, he took an opportunity of disclosing to him the great secret of his pretensions to the crown of England, and of the will which Edward intended to make in his favour. He desired the assistance of Harold in perfecting that design. He made professions of the utmost gratitude in return for so great an obligation. He promised that the present grandeur of Harold's family, which supported itself with difficulty under the jealousy and hatred of Edward, should receive new increase from a successor, who would be so greatly beholden to him for his advancement. Harold was surprised at this declaration of the Duke, but being sensible that he should never recover his own liberty, much less that of his brother and nephew if he refused the demand, he feigned a compliance with William, renounced all hopes of the crown for himself, and professed his sincere intention of supporting the will of Edward, and seconding the pretensions of the Duke of Normandy. William, to bind him faster to his interests, besides offering him one of his daughters in marriage, required him to take an oath that he would fulfil his promises, and in order to render the oath more obligatory, he employed an artifice well suited to the ignorance and superstition of the age. He secretly conveyed under the altar, on which Harold agreed to swear, the relics of some of the most revered martyrs, and when Harold had taken the oath, he showed him the relics, and admonished him to observe religiously an engagement which had been ratified by so tremendous a sanction. 
the English nobleman was astonished, but dissembling his concern he renewed the same professions, and was dismissed with all the marks of mutual confidence by the Duke of Normandy. When Harold found himself at liberty, his ambition suggested casuistry sufficient to justify to him the violation of an oath which had been extorted from him by fear, and which, if fulfilled, might be attended with the subjection of his native country to a foreign power. He continued still to practice every art of popularity, to increase the number of his partisans, to reconcile the minds of the English to the idea of his succession, to revive their hatred of the Normans, and by an ostentation of his power and influence, to deter the timorous Edward from executing his intended destination in favour of William. Fortune, about this time, threw two incidents in his way, by which he was enabled to acquire general favour and to increase the character which he had already attained of virtue and abilities. The Welsh, though a less formidable enemy than the Danes, had long been accustomed to infest the western borders, and after committing spoil on the low countries, they usually made a hasty retreat into their mountains, where they were sheltered from the pursuit of their enemies, and were ready to seize the first favourable opportunity of renewing their depredations. Griffith, the reigning prince, had greatly distinguished himself in those incursions, and his name had become so terrible to the English that Harold found he could do nothing more acceptable to the public and more honourable for himself than the suppressing of so dangerous an enemy he formed the plan of an expedition against Wales, and having prepared some light-armed foot to pursue the natives in their fastnesses, some cavalry to scour the open country, and a squadron of ships to attack the sea-coast, he employed at once all these forces against the Welsh, prosecuted his advantages with vigour, made no intermission in his assaults, and at last reduced the enemy to such distress that in order to prevent their total destruction they made a sacrifice of their prince, whose head they cut off and sent to Harold, and they were content to receive as their sovereigns two Welsh noblemen appointed by Edward to rule over them. The other incident was no less honourable to Harold. Tosti, brother of this nobleman, who had been created Duke of Northumberland, being of a violent, tyrannical temper, had acted with such cruelty and injustice that the inhabitants rose in rebellion and chased him from his government. Morcar and Edwin, two brothers, who possessed great power in these parts, and who were grandsons of the great Duke Leofric, concurred in the insurrection, and the former, being elected duke, advanced with an army to oppose Harold, who was commissioned by the king to reduce and chastise the Northumbrians. Before the armies came to action, Morcar, well acquainted with the generous disposition of the English commander, endeavoured to justify his own conduct. He represented to Harold that Tosti had behaved in a manner unworthy of the station to which he was advanced, and no one, not even a brother, could support such tyranny without participating in some degree of the infamy attending it, that the Northumbrians, accustomed to a legal administration and regarding it as their birthright, were willing to submit to the king but required a governor who would pay regard to their rights and privileges, that they had been taught by their ancestors that death was preferable to servitude, and had taken the field determined to perish rather than suffer a renewal of those indignities to which they had so long been exposed, and they trusted that Harold, on reflection, would not defend in another that violent conduct from which he himself in his own government had always kept at so great a distance. 
Thus vigorous remonstrance was accompanied with such a detail of facts so well supported that Harold found it prudent to abandon his brother's cause, and returning to Edward he persuaded him to pardon the Northumbrians and to confirm Morcar in the government. He even married the sister of that nobleman, and by his interest procured Edwin, the younger brother, to be elected into the government of Mercia. Tosti, in a rage, departed the kingdom, and took shelter in Flanders with Earl Baldwin, his father-in-law. By this marriage, Harold broke all measures with the Duke of Normandy, and William clearly perceived that he could no longer rely on the oaths and promises which he had extorted from him. But the English nobleman was now in such a situation that he deemed it no longer necessary to dissemble. He had, in his conduct toward the Northumbrians, given such a specimen of his moderation as had gained him the affections of all his countrymen. He saw that almost all England was engaged in his interests, while he himself possessed the government of Wessex, Morcar that of Northumberland, and Edwin that of Mercia. He now openly aspired to the succession, and insisted that since it was necessary, by the confession of all, to set aside the royal family on account of the imbecility of Edgar, the sole surviving heir, that there was no one so capable of filling the throne as a nobleman of great power, of mature age, of long experience, of approved courage and abilities, who, being a native of the kingdom, would effectually secure it against the dominion and tyranny of foreigners. Edward, broken with age and infirmities, saw the difficulties too great for him to encounter, and though his inveterate prepossessions kept him from seconding the pretensions of Harold, he took but feeble and irresolute steps for securing the succession to the Duke of Normandy. While he continued in this uncertainty, he was surprised by sickness, which brought him to his grave on the 5th of January, 1066, in the 65th year of his age and 25th of his reign. This prince, to whom the monks gave the title of saint and confessor, was the last of the Saxon line that ruled in England. Though his reign was peaceable and fortunate, he owed his prosperity less to his own abilities than to the conjunctures of the times. The Danes, employed in other enterprises, attempted not those incursions which had been so troublesome to all his predecessors, and fatal to some of them. The facility of his disposition made him acquiesce under the government of Godwin and his son Harold, and the abilities as well as the power of these noblemen enabled them, while they were entrusted with authority, to preserve domestic peace and tranquillity. The most commendable circumstance of Edward's government was his attention to the administration of justice, and his compiling for that purpose a body of laws which he collected from the laws of Ethelbert, Ina, and Alfred. This compilation, though now lost, for the laws that pass under Edward's name were composed afterwards, was long the subject of affection to the English nation. Edward the Confessor was the first that touched for the king's evil. The opinion of his sanctity procured belief to this cure among the people, his successors regarded it as a part of their state and grandeur to uphold the same opinion. It has been continued down to our time, and the practice was first dropped by the present royal family, who observed that it could no longer give amazement even to the populace, and was attended with ridicule in the eyes of all men of understanding. End of section 18《Section 19 of Volume 1a of History of England. 
from the invasion of Julius Caesar to the revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the invasion of Julius Caesar to the revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1A, Section 19. Chapter 3, Part 6. Harold, 1066. Harold had so well prepared matters before the death of Edward that he immediately stepped into the vacant throne, and his accession was attended with as little opposition and disturbance as if he had succeeded by the most undoubted hereditary title. The citizens of London were his zealous partisans. The bishop and clergy had adopted his cause, and all the powerful nobility connected with him by alliance or friendship willingly seconded his pretensions. The title of Edgar Atheling was scarcely mentioned, much less the claim of the Duke of Normandy, and Harold, assembling his partisans, received the crown from their hands without waiting for the free deliberations of the states, or regularly submitting the question to their determination. If any were averse to this measure, they were obliged to conceal their sentiments, and the new prince, taking a general silence for consent, and founding his title on the supposed suffrages of the people, which appeared unanimous, was, on the day immediately succeeding Edward's death, crowned and anointed king by Aldred, Archbishop of York. The whole nation seemed joyfully to acquiesce in his elevation. The first symptoms of danger which the king discovered came from abroad, and from his own brother Tosti, who had submitted to a voluntary banishment in Flanders. Enraged at the successful ambition of Harold, to which he himself had fallen a victim, he filled the court of Baldwin with complaints of the injustice which he had suffered. He engaged the interest of that family against his brother. He endeavoured to form intrigues with some of the discontented nobles in England. He sent his emissaries to Norway in order to rouse to arms the freebooters of that kingdom, and to excite their hopes of reaping advantage from the unsettled state of affairs on the usurpation of the new king, and that he might render the combination more formidable, he made a journey to Normandy in expectation that the duke, who had married Matilda, another daughter of Baldwin, would, in revenge of his own wrongs as well as those of Tosti, second by his counsels and forces the projected invasion of England. The Duke of Normandy when he first received intelligence of Harold's intrigues and accessions, had been moved to the highest pitch of indignation. But that he might give the better colour to his pretensions, he sent an embassy to England, upbraiding that prince with his breach of faith, and summoning him to resign immediately possession of the kingdom. Harold replied to the Norman ambassadors, that the oath with which he was reproached had been extorted by the well-grounded fear of violence, and could never for that reason be regarded as obligatory, that he had had no commission either from the late king or from the states of England, who alone could dispose of the crown, to make any tender of the succession to the Duke of Normandy, and if he, a private person, had assumed so much authority and had even voluntarily sworn to support the duke's pretensions that the oath was unlawful, and it was his duty to seize the first opportunity of breaking it, that he had obtained the crown by the unanimous suffrages of the people, and should prove himself totally unworthy of their favour. Did he not strenuously maintain those national liberties with whose protection they had entrusted him, and that the duke, if he made any attempt by force of arms, 
should experience the power of a united nation conducted by a prince who sensible of the obligations imposed on him by his royal dignity was determined that the same moment should put a period to his life and to his government this answer was no other than william expected and he had previously fixed his resolution of making an attempt upon england consulting only his courage his resentment and his ambition he overlooked all the difficulties inseparable from an attack on a great kingdom by such inferior force and he saw only the circumstances which would facilitate his enterprise he considered that england ever since the accession of canute had enjoyed profound tranquillity during a period of near fifty years and it would require time for its soldiers enervated by long peace to learn discipline and its generals experience he knew that it was entirely unprovided with fortified towns by which it could prolong the war but must venture its whole fortune in one decisive action against a veteran enemy who being once master of the field would be in a condition to overrun the kingdom he saw that harold though he had given proofs of vigour and bravery had newly mounted a throne which he had acquired by faction from which he had excluded a very ancient royal family and which was likely to totter under him by its own instability much more if shaken by any violent external impulse and he hoped that the very circumstance of his crossing the sea quitting his own country and leaving himself no hopes of retreat as it would astonish the enemy by the boldness of the enterprise would inspirit his soldiers by despair and rouse them to sustain the reputation of the norman arms the normans as they had long been distinguished by valour among all the european nations had at this time attained to the highest pitch of military glory besides acquiring by arms such a noble territory in france besides defending it against continual attempts of the french monarch and all its neighbours besides exerting many acts of vigour under their present sovereign they had about this very time revived their ancient fame by the most hazardous exploits and the most wonderful successes in the other extremity of europe a few norman adventurers in italy had acquired such an ascendant not only over the italians and greeks but the germans and saracens that they expelled those foreigners procured to themselves ample establishments and laid the foundation of the opulent kingdom of naples and sicily these enterprises of men who were all of them vassals in normandy many of them banished for faction and rebellion excited the ambition of the haughty william who disdained after such examples of fortune and valour to be deterred from making an attack on a neighbouring country where he could be supported by the whole force of his principality the situation also of europe inspired william with hopes that besides his brave normans he might employ against england the flower of the military force which was dispersed in all the neighbouring states france germany and the low countries by the progress of the feudal institutions were divided and subdivided into many principalities and baronies and the possessors enjoying the civil jurisdiction within themselves as well as the right of arms acted in many respects as independent sovereigns and maintained their properties and privileges less by the authority of laws than by their own force and valour a military spirit had universally diffused itself throughout europe and the several leaders whose minds were elevated by their princely situation greedily embraced the most hazardous enterprises 
and being accustomed to nothing from their infancy but recitals of the success attending wars and battles, they were prompted by a natural ambition to imitate those adventures which they heard so much celebrated and which were so much exaggerated by the credulity of the age. United, however loosely, by their duty to one superior lord, and by their connections with the great body of the community to which they belonged, they desired to spread their fame each beyond his own district and in all assemblies, whether instituted for civil deliberations, for military expeditions, or merely for show and entertainment, to outshine each other by the reputation of strength and prowess. Hence their genius for chivalry, hence their impatience of peace and tranquillity, and hence their readiness to embark in any dangerous enterprise, how little soever interested in its failure or success. William, by his power, his courage, and his abilities, had long maintained a preeminence among those haughty chieftains and every one who desired to signalize himself by his address in military exercises or his valor in action had been ambitious of acquiring a reputation in the court and in the armies of normandy entertained with that hospitality and courtesy which distinguished the age they had formed attachments with the prince and greedily attended to the prospects of the signal glory and elevation which he promised them in return for their concurrence in an expedition against England. The more grandeur there appeared in the attempt, the more it suited their romantic spirit. The fame of the intended invasion was already diffused everywhere. Multitudes crowded to tender to the duke their service with that of their vassals and retainers, and William found less difficulty in completing his levies than in choosing the most veteran forces and in rejecting the offers of those who were impatient to acquire fame under so renowned a leader. Besides these advantages which William owed to his personal valour and good conduct, he was indebted to fortune for procuring him some assistance and also for removing many obstacles which it was natural for him to expect, in an undertaking in which all his neighbours were so deeply interested. Conan, Count of Brittany, was his mortal enemy. In order to throw a damp upon the Duke's enterprise, he chose this conjuncture for reviving his claim to Normandy itself, and he required that, in case of William's success against England, the possession of that duchy should devolve to him. But Conan died suddenly after making this demand, and Hole, his successor, instead of adopting the malignity, or, more properly speaking, the prudence of his predecessor, zealously seconded the duke's views and sent his eldest son, Alain Fergant, to serve under him with a body of five thousand Bretons. The counts of Anjou and of Flanders encouraged their subjects to engage in the expedition, and even the court of France, though it might justly fear the aggrandizement of so dangerous a vassal, pursued not its interests on this occasion with sufficient vigor and resolution. Philip I, the reigning monarch, was a minor, and William, having communicated his project to the council, having desired assistance and offered to do homage, in case of his success for the crown of England, was indeed openly ordered to lay aside all thoughts of the enterprise, but the Earl of Flanders, his father-in-law, being at the head of the regency, favoured underhand his levies, and secretly encouraged the adventurous nobility to enlist under the standard of the Duke of Normandy. The Emperor, Henry the Fourth, 
besides openly giving all his vassals permission to embark in this expedition, which so much engaged the attention of Europe, promised his protection to the Duchy of Normandy during the absence of the prince, and thereby enabled him to employ his whole force in the invasion of England. But the most important ally that William gained by his negotiations was the Pope, who had a mighty influence over the ancient barons, no less devout in their religious principles than valorous in their military enterprises. The Roman pontiff, after an insensible progress during several ages of darkness and ignorance, began now to lift his head openly above all the princes of Europe, to assume the office of a mediator, or even an arbiter in the quarrels of the greatest monarchs, to interpose in all secular affairs, and lo, obtrude his dictates as sovereign laws on his obsequious disciples. It was a sufficient motive to Alexander the Second, the reigning Pope, for embracing William's quarrel, that he alone had made an appeal to his tribunal, and rendered him umpire of the dispute between him and Harold. But there were other advantages which that pontiff foresaw must result from the conquest of England by the Norman arms. That kingdom, though at first converted by Romish missionaries, though it had afterwards advanced some farther steps towards subjection to Rome, maintained still a considerable independence in its ecclesiastical administration, and forming a world within itself entirely separated from the rest of Europe. It had hitherto proved inaccessible to those exorbitant claims which supported the grandeur of the papacy, Alexander therefore hoped that the French and Norman barons, if successful in their enterprise, might import into that country a more devoted reference to the Holy See, and bring the English churches to a nearer conformity with those of the continent. He declared immediately in favour of William's claim, pronounced Harold a perjured usurper, denounced excommunication against him and his adherents, and the more to encourage the Duke of Normandy in his enterprise, he sent him a consecrated banner and a ring with one of St. Peter's hair in it. Thus were all the ambition and violence of that invasion covered over safely with the broad mantle of religion. End of section 19